Dreamscape presents Vic, a shot caller's novel by Bella Rora, narrated by Samantha Brentmore and Lance Greenfield. Prologue Nastasia, age 15. Come on, don't walk away from me. His amused holler echoed through the schoolyard. Ah, oh, jeez. I held my books tightly to my chest and tried like hell to avoid the human form of halitosis that was following me. When he grabbed at my arm to stop me, it took everything I had inside me to not throw my books down, then throw down, because you did not touch Aliakov without permission, especially if you wanted to breathe through the designated holes you had and not the ones my brothers would put in you. I bet the inside of my cheek hard enough to draw blood and counted to ten, hoping the anger simmering inside me would calm itself before it boiled over. I tried to be nice. Mason, there's nothing to talk about. You asked me out, and I told you that although I was flattered, I'm not allowed to date. He looked like a wounded kitten in a letterman. I'm sorry, I can't go out with you. Clean cut. Blonde, blue-eyed, and with a gleaming smile that hid the kind of asshole this guy actually was, Mason pursed his lips and gave me a perfectly pathetic pair of puppy dog eyes. Give me a chance, Natalia. Nice. The guy couldn't even get my name right. I'm sure when your parents meet me, they'll change their minds. I'm a good guy. Oh, please. I almost said it out loud. Crowed it, actually. His long eyelashes fluttered in an attempt to look cute, but oddly made me nauseous. I gave him one more chance to back down gracefully. Mason, please, I don't want any trouble. And if my brothers find out about this, there will be trouble. For you. That all-American smile told me he was stupider than he looked. Babe, I won't tell if you don't. Ugh. What a douche. Well, he'd actually done it. He pushed too hard. All I could do at this point was push back. Dropping my sweet girl facade, I took a step toward him and uttered, Do you know who my father is? For the first time since he began targeting me, he looked unsure. Uh, yeah. He knew who my father was. Rumors had circulated about the mob princess. They knew who I was, who we were. Do you really want to do this, Mason? Are you ready for this life? The seriousness in my tone was no joke. Do you know what a dying man looks like? What a gunshot wound to the head and the mess it makes on a carpet looks like? I wasn't lying when I revealed, I do. Mason leaned away from me, his pride stopping him from taking the full step back, but his response was quiet. I just wanted to take you to the movies. I blew out a breath, showing him just how stupid he sounded. We both knew what he wanted, and holding my hand in the theater wasn't it. No, babe, you wanted to fuck me and report back to your buddies. He looked stunned by my brash words. You wanted another notch on your bedpost, and I would make a very nice notch. I agree, but I looked him up and down. You and I are never going to happen, Mason. Not ever. My eyes lowered. And if you keep harassing me, I will have no choice but to tell my brothers about the guy at school who won't fucking leave me alone. I wouldn't do it, but he didn't know that. For a second, Mason looked spooked. He swallowed hard, his voice quieter than usual. I just wanted to. I know, I cut him off. But the answer is no. You understand that, don't you, Mason? I, uh... He nodded, avoiding my gaze. Yep. A strong arm came around my shoulders, and my heart did that weird stuttering thing it did whenever I was close enough to smell his cologne. I didn't take my eyes off the jock, and from the way Mason's gaze was flittering back and forth between us, I knew the pair of us were a sight, holding our pose, the image of unwitting danger. 
you good? Victor Nikulin asked in deathly quiet. Mason's eyes lowered to Vic's forearm. Kaos. The bold black chaos tattoo was out on display, worn proudly but also as a warning to those like my dear friend Mason. I took pity on the guy. Yeah, Mason was just leaving. I blinked prettily. Goodbye, Mason. And off Mason fucked. We watched him saunter away, and when he was out of sight, I twisted slightly to look at Vic. What are you doing here? What a fucking dweeb, he uttered, still looking in the direction Mason went. Do you like that guy? My nose bunched in disgust. God, no. Good, he said, taking my books and holding them by his side. His arm slipped down from my shoulders to snake around my waist. You'd think they'd get the point by now, but they just can't help themselves. They always want to touch an untouchable. I glanced down at his large hand splayed across my hip. Says the guy touching an untouchable. He didn't deign to look at me, but his lips broke into a wide smile, showcasing his gleaming white teeth and dimples. My head swam with how beautiful this man was. I don't count. I wished things were different. So many times I prayed to every god imaginable that this stunningly handsome man would look at me as more than just his best friend's little sister. Someone to protect, someone to guard and shield. But he didn't. And I was just another teenage girl craving a person I could never have. Maybe one day things would be different. Maybe one day he would see me as a woman and not some girl he needed to keep an eye on. Alas, I was just a family friend to him, nothing more. And I was sure that when he touched me, he felt no more than platonic friendship when my every nerve ending was set on fire by a simple glance of his fingertips. I didn't ask for much in life. Sure, I had everything I needed, so I never had to ask for a single thing. But if the gods were listening, I hoped they heard my prayer. I only wanted one thing for Vic to look at me with the need of a man who wanted something he couldn't have. Me. He wasn't wrong, though. He didn't count. Because my father trusted him. And for the secret fact that I was head over heels in love with Victor Nikulin. Nastasia. Age 16. He was punishing me. Of course he didn't outright come out and say it, but I had a deep, unwavering feeling he was indeed attempting to reprimand me. I could never ask, though, because what if he wasn't? I wasn't so full of myself that I believed Vic's every movement revolved around me. I watched him with her. It was torture, but I couldn't tear my eyes off them. I wasn't spying, we just all happened to be at the same place at the same time. And I couldn't look away. Why couldn't I look away? It was a Friday night, and, as per usual, the upper echelon of New Providence High School student body made our way over to our current hotspot, Joe's, for a slice. If I was being honest, not many of us actually ate. It was just an excuse to slide into booths with cute boys and nurse a soda while wishing we were at home in our ratty sweats and mismatched socks. My excuse was that I was expected to be there. What was Vic's excuse when he was not? The only flickering thought in my mind was that he wanted me to see him. The minute I walked into the decently sized restaurant, Annika came flying at me. With an excited squeal, she hugged me tight, and her musical laughter washed over me. Can you believe we won? I'm sure she didn't expect any more than what I gave her. I waved an invisible flag and muttered sarcastically, Go team! She rolled her eyes at me. Where's your team spirit, Nastasia? I glanced down at her cheerleading uniform and smiled. Don't fret. You've got enough for both of us, Ani. My gaze flitted over to a booth, and the moment I saw him, my stomach nodded. Annika locked onto my line of sight and rolled her eyes. So, yeah, my brother's here. I could see that, but I was more interested in who he was with. Chastity Davis. My not liking the girl had nothing to do with her. 
and I had to give credit where credit was due. She was smart, she was kind, and fuck me, she was beautiful. Chastity was a senior, and Vic had graduated the year before. He had never mentioned her, so I was a little stumped at the sudden need to go out on a very public date, a week after I... Sleeping over at Melissa's house tonight. I found focus once more. Sorry, what? I'm sleeping over at Melissa's house tonight. Without a second thought, Annika asked, Wanna come? Here was the thing. Annika was sweet. She always had been. She and I were very different people, but we always came back to each other. I wasn't sure whether it was because our families were friends or the fact that we both knew what it was like to see our fathers covered in blood and not their own. Annika and I had a connection that seemed unbreakable. We had a love for each other that didn't judge, and over the years that connection turned solid. There wasn't anything I wouldn't do for her, except sleep at Melissa Foreman's house. I don't think so, Ani. My hesitation was clear. Her face fell, and I hated that it made me feel bad. Annika wore her heart on her sleeve. Are you sure? Her parents won't mind, I swear. I was sure. I'm not feeling it tonight. Inhaling deeply, I let out my breath slowly, then shook my head. I think I'm going to go. Those pretty blue eyes widened, and she reached out to squeeze my hand. Don't go. You just got here. Who's going? Annika and I both turned toward the sound of the voice, and when I saw who stood there, my mouth parted slightly. Santino Ricci. He was a senior, he was gorgeous, and he didn't talk to anyone, like anyone. He had the reputation of being a dreadful snob, but the dreadful snob was talking to us right now. I inwardly narrowed my eyes. Why? Not you, I hope. He looked directly at me. Those perpetually hooded eyes searched me lazily. The level of confidence he had was off the charts. Normally, I would steer clear, but Annika beat me to it. Nastasia isn't having a good time. Maybe you could... With a bump of her hip, she sent me flying in his direction. Entertain her? I slammed into his front. My forearms pressed up against his firm chest, and reflexively he caught me, one hand coming to my shoulder, while the other held me easily at the lower back. Annika, the big fat liar, crooned. Oh my god, Naz, are you okay? I'm such a klutz. Eyes wide, I blinked up at him. He smiled down at me. Nastasia, that's a nice name. I, Jesus, he was dreamy. Yeah. His lip twitched. I'm Tino. I stared at his lips and showed my level of intelligence when it came to handsome men, breathing out. I know. His eyes crinkled and he forced down a chuckle. You want to share a slice with me, Bella? I was already nodding. Unfortunately, someone else answered for me. No, she doesn't, because we're leaving. Tino still held me close as Vic strode toward us. It took me a moment for what he said to register, and when it did, my brow bunched. Like hell, I wasn't going anywhere. I'd like to stay. Vic took the two steps forward to meet me. Taking my hand, he gently pulled on it. We're going. No, I'm not. Yes, we are. I don't want to go. Vic chuckled caustically. You think I want to leave a date to take you home, Nastasia? His gaze narrowed. Because I don't. I don't know why he did it, but what he said it was cruel. But when Daddy calls, I deliver. And he wants his baby home, now. That's why I get paid the way I do mercenary rates. Like I was nothing to him, as if he didn't even like me, as though I was nothing more than a thorn in his side, a burden. My cheeks heated and I mourned. For a second, I thought about lashing out. Unfortunately, that would show Vic just how much his words wounded me. So I said nothing. 
Mortified, I stepped out of Tino's hold and dipped my chin. I've got to go. Sorry. Vic tugged on my fingers, but I snatched them back, tucking my hands into the sleeves of my sweater. I didn't want him to touch me right now. Annika glared at him before she stepped forward and hugged me tight. Call me. As she walked past her brother, she muttered, You're a dick. Vic escorted me outside and into his car. We didn't talk the entire car ride. It was only when the vehicle stopped that I looked around. This wasn't my house. My brow lowered in confusion. Where are we? It looked like a park. You kissed me. Oh, shit. Okay. We were doing this? Now? Right now? You kissed me, Naz. Yes, I had. Sinking into the seat, I covered my face with my hands. My words came out muffled. I'm sorry. I wasn't, though. What I did was shoot my shot. It didn't work out exactly the way I hoped, but at least I was brave enough to have done it. Why the fuck would you do that? He followed up by yelling. Why? I dropped my hands from my face, looked straight ahead, and revealed a quiet... Because I wanted to. Like you wanted to kiss Tino Ricci tonight. Is that your thing now? Putting your lips on any fucking guy because you want to? Oh, wow. I did not deserve this. And now I was pissed. My eyes flashed and I scoffed. Better than trying to fuck some chick called Chastity, Vic. That's none of your business. And what I do with any freaking guy is none of your business. It is my business. He boomed, and for a split second he looked unhinged. You are my business. My heart kick-started. Nope. I opened the door, slid out, and walked away. I heard the car door opened, and the sounds of gravel shuffling at my back told me he was catching up. Where are you going? He asked on a sigh. I sneered. Anywhere away from you. He caught the back of my sweater and held me still as he moved to stand in front of me. Looking maddened and confused, he opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out. He tried again and again until finally he crossed his arms over his chest and said, This can't happen, Nastasia. If he had taken a baseball bat to my temple, it would have hurt less. It took me a while, but I replied, I know. My response had him straightening, his arms falling to his sides and his breathing steadied. Good. Okay. Good. What? Did he expect a fight? Well, he wouldn't get one. I was done. Officially done. Our eyes locked and we held each other's gaze a long time before Vic swallowed and blew out a short breath. Come on. And that was that. Whatever fantasy I had about Victor Nikulin would remain just that. Fictional. He walked me back to the car and opened the door for me. But just before I moved to step in, he threw the door shut with a slam. Perplexed, I spun to face him. The moment I did, he crowded me, stepped forward, and using his body to hold me captive, caging me between two strong arms by either side of my head. My pulse increased as Vic's eyes pleaded with mine. He shook his head. This can't happen. I swallowed hard and nodded in agreement. His breathing turned heavy. It can't happen. What was going on here? The tension was thick enough to cut with a knife. My lips pulsed as his hooded gaze landed on them. I didn't know much, but I knew in that moment that Vic was utterly at war with himself, and I could have sworn he wanted to kiss me. Vic? I breathed out, my lips parting slightly. It can't, baby. 
Those whispered words said one thing, but as he dipped his face and hesitated a hair's breadth away from my mouth, his actions said another. We stayed that way for a while. The intensity of his gaze and the feeling of his warm, minty breath on my lips more than I could take. He wasn't going to make the first move. Call it a moment's madness. Call it sheer stupidity. Either way, my shaking hands rested on Vic's stomach, and I slowly slid them up his torso until they rested on his shoulders. He watched me intently, and when he licked his bottom lip, I couldn't wait any longer. I had already waited a lifetime. Perhaps he would regret what was about to happen. Right now, I was so caught up in him that I didn't have the room in me to care. And so I stood on my tiptoes, my eyes on him, and ever so gently, I tilted my head to place a single hot kiss to Victor Nikulin's full mouth. A week ago, I kissed him hard and fast. I caught him by surprise. It was a sneak attack, impulsive and childish, in the hallway by my room. It was dangerous. A mistake. Now, the moment our lips met, it was warm and inviting. This kiss felt like a promise, and I knew, I just knew, I would never feel this way about another man so long as I lived. I pulled back long enough to witness his composure break. One arm slid around me while the other rose up my back until his warm, large hand cradled my nape, holding me close while he ate at my lips as though he'd been poisoned and I was his only hope of survival, my lips the antidote. We kissed and nipped at each other's mouths, and when our tongues finally touched, I died a silent death. We should not have been doing this, and knowing that made me all the more desperate to have it. Who knows how long passed? Minutes? Hours? It felt like an eternity. But when we finally pulled away from one another, lips swollen, panting quietly into the night, I was sure we were both thinking an identical thought. Oh, Lord. We're in trouble. Chapter One Nastasia I was going to fuck a bitch up and have fun doing it. The bitch in question? Victor Nikulin, my ex-boyfriend, my ex-best friend, my ex-everything. But why, Nastasia? He seems like a decent guy, a caring friend, a god in the sack, someone you can tell your innermost secrets to, and Lord above, that smile? Why must you fuck him up? Because breaking up was never easy. And although I did my best to remain civil for the sake of our friends and closely connected families, Vic was being difficult. Look, I'll admit I cried for a while. Okay, I cried for a long freaking while. I mourned and grieved and lamented and all that shit. But then I woke up one day and chose to be a mature and accepting person. On that very same day, Vic woke up and chose violence. It took months of unease until I finally snapped, but when it happened, everything I had been feeling came out of my mouth like buckshot out of a gun. It had been 103 days since our official breakup, not that I was counting, and for a while, it was awkward. That awkwardness turned to anger, and because there was clearly something wrong with me, seeing Vic angry did something odd. The kind of thing that made you bite your lip and squeeze your legs together tightly? Now when we fought, it got intense. Vic knew this. He played on it. And dear Lord, sometimes I played right back. My eldest brother, Sasha, decided to host a business meeting under the guise of dinner at his house. If you could call the three-story monstrosity a house. To talk about upcoming events and new ideas for the club. Attendance was not optional. When Sasha requested you, you came. That was just how things were. Was it all a little kingpin of him? Yeah. Did he secretly love to wield that kind of power? Have you met the guy? Of course he did. Business was booming, 
Bleeding Hearts, once a sleazy strip club, now a classy burlesque joint, had one hell of a transformation in the past year. And although it was Sasha's baby, we were involved in one way or another. After all, we all worked there, and like a well-oiled machine, each of us were a cog in the engine, making it run. To see the business fail was not an option. Our family prided itself on going legit, and unless we wanted to take a step back into a seedy underworld where people did nothing more than sell weapons, violence, drugs, and women, we had no backup. It had to work. My front door opened, then shut. Oh my God. I heard a feminine voice mutter, and when fast footsteps came rushing up the steps, my brow furrowed. Even more so when she panted out, It's okay. It's fine. We're okay. The hell? Stepping back from the vanity in my bathroom, I heard the footsteps get closer and closer. And when she stepped into view, wide-eyed and looking terrified, I moved toward my sister-in-law, Mina, with a feeling of deep panic sitting heavy in my gut. Shit. Something was wrong. I didn't even notice the white bag she was holding until she freaking threw it at me. I caught it clumsily, making the contents jostle. And when I all but blustered, what's wrong? She stood there, chewing on her thumbnail, murmuring under her breath. Her long brown hair was tied in a low ponytail, and I looked over her yoga pants, black tee, wearing one sock and slides. She looked a mess. Then suddenly she regained focus and said, Out! When her brown doe eyes landed on mine, she put her hands to my arms and gently pushed me backward until I was just outside the open door. Out! For a tiny thing, she was remarkably strong. The door slammed in my face and I just stood there, confused as hell, mouth agape. Firstly, excuse the shit out of me? This was my house, damn it. She had some nerve pushing me around in my own home. But when I heard her whine through the door, my anger left as quickly as it came. I wrapped my fingers around the doorknob and slowly tried to open it. Mina, are you okay? I jiggled it. Shorty? There were three of us in the family. Sasha, the eldest who took over the role of patriarch when her father died. Lev, the middle sibling, whose quirks made him both infuriating and endearing as hell. Lastly came me, the youngest, the girl who grew up with mobsters and criminals and thought nothing of it, because although it wasn't normal, it was normal for me. When you're a teenager and your brothers are members of a subsidiary of the Russian Bratva, well, you could imagine how colorful life must have been. On the day our father died, Sasha had been expected to take over control of chaos. It seemed like the natural course of events, and Sasha never did things half-assed. He was in, which meant we were in. I had seen shit, heard shit, and taken part in shit that no teenager should have ever been part of. And it didn't take long for Sasha to come to the same conclusion. It took some convincing, but Sasha talked himself out of the role, and soon enough, without a proper leader, chaos was falling apart. Bratva soon heard of the mismanagement and bickering between its firms, and the motherland came calling. And when Bratva tells you to stand down and disband, that's what you do. Now any Russian firms out there were acting on their own. They no longer had the backing of the big guns. And although I had a feeling Sasha sometimes missed that life, I knew he did what he did for me, because family was everything. The door to the bathroom shot open, and Mina, anxious as a gazelle drinking from the waterhole, stood there holding a plastic cup filled with a light yellow liquid. I spotted the rectangular box in her other hand, and my brows bunched. Her voice shook as she begged quietly, Help? It took me about ten seconds for it to all click. My brows rose and I let out a humble, Mina, I know, uh, she nodded with tears in her eyes. I tried to speak, but nothing came out. She nodded again. I know! Uh, higher in pitch this time. I found my voice and asked gently, Are you sure? She let out a watery laugh. Um, 
Reaching for the white bag, she turned it upside down, and the contents fell to the white-tiled floor of my bathroom. Nine different brands of pregnancy tests told me she wasn't sure. Okay, I said calmly. I'm scared, the little woman croaked out, and God damn it, it broke my heart. Look, I tried to reason with her. This is not an issue. You're married, you're in love, you're not some teenager who did it with the quarterback under the bleachers, got knocked up, and is now being sent away to live with her grandma. But Mina wasn't listening to me. She moved to sit cross-legged on the cold floor, opening each box and taking out one test, and when her fingers began to shake too much, she started to rip open the cardboard with her teeth. My brows rose. Oh, yeah, this was fine. Breathing shakily, she tried to read the instructions and talked to herself. How do I do this? It depends. Some of them you dip in and wait, and others you put a couple of drops into the little hole. She stilled, then blinked up at me. You've done this before. My eyes widened a moment, and all I said was, Yeah. Two men. In my entire life, I had only ever been with two men. One to whom I was briefly engaged, and we used a condom each and every time. The other was Vic who had my head swimming with nothing more than a glance of his fingers down my spine. He hadn't used a condom with me since I was 19 years old, so, yes, I knew how to use a pregnancy test. I helped her. I told her she didn't need to use all nine, but she just kept handing them to me, and before we knew it, the counter of my bathroom sink was covered in white plastic sticks. We waited a full three minutes, and we did this in complete silence. One look at Mina told me that nothing I said would distract her from what was going on inside of her head. And when the timer went off and I began to check the tests, relief fell over my expression. I looked over at her and smiled kindly. See? All good, little bit. I held up a test. You're not pregnant. Her face blank, she took the test from my hand and stared at it. She then stood and looked over all the others, her face remaining passive. But when she sat on the closed toilet lid, her bottom lip started to tremble. Oh, sweet girl. You had a scare. It's stressful, I said in way of understanding. You don't get it, was her soggy reply. I choked down the scoff, threatening to rush up my throat. I do. I really do. But... It's okay, Mina. She shook her head and blinked away tears. It's not okay. It is, I reassured her with a squeeze to the knee. Mina looked down at the floor, her face crumbling, and her hands came up to cover her eyes as she began to cry. No, not cry. She was sobbing. Body-racking sobs. My brow furrowed in perplexity. Hey, I crooned, moving to squat down in front of her. What's going on? She continued to cry, and when she removed her hands, she rolled her red eyes, shrugged, and let out a laugh that held no humor. Her voice shook. I don't know. And then it hit me. I spoke slowly. Did you want it to be positive? Her eyes closed and she dipped her chin, nodding as she began to weep again. Well, shit. My arms went around her and I held her tightly as she cried openly. I began to feel her loss on a personal level, and when my own eyes began to sting, I sighed softly, then asked, Why didn't you tell me? She spoke into my shoulder, miserable. We're not trying but I haven't been feeling well, and it made sense that I might be, and I was scared, but once I thought about it, then I was kind of happy about it, and thinking about how nice it would be for Liddy to have a brother or sister, I started planning where the nursery might go, and wondering who the baby might look like, and now... She took in a deep breath and let it out shakily. It's over, before it began... 
They squeezed her gently, rubbing her back. Her incoherent babbling should not have made sense, but it did, and it was heartbreaking. I pulled back, taking hold of her hand and swiping away a stray tear trailing my cheek. Look, I told her, if you want it, this is going to happen for you. Now just wasn't the time, okay? Mina started to calm. I guess. If you want a baby, you need to talk to Lev. Get off birth control and start trying? Like, really trying? You get what I mean. She snuffled out a small laugh, and I smiled widely, then swallowed down the sickness in my throat at the thought of my brother shooting his boys into Mina. But that was how it was done. Go home and seduce my brother. Enjoy the process. I sobered quickly. It'll happen, Mina. I just know it. I helped her wash her face, gave her another comforting squeeze, then sent her on her way, leaving me to clean up. As I disposed of the used pregnancy tests and wiped down the sink, I smiled at the thought of another niece or nephew to spoil. I'd have to get that from Lev and Mina, because, let's be honest, Sasha wasn't going to give me that. It wasn't that he was a man whore or that he had commitment issues. Actually, it was the exact opposite. I hadn't seen Sasha with a woman in years, which didn't mean much. I was sure he still got some. He was just uber discreet about it. And unless he was willing to introduce us to a woman, he sure as shit wasn't going to have a baby with her. So when I arrived at Sasha's later that night and saw the cars parked out front, I knew I was likely the last to arrive, as per usual. I let myself in and heard Sasha say, You live down the path, Nastasia. Must you always be tardy? That confirmed it. He stood wearing a scowl with both hands on his hips like a disappointed father, looking like one too in his dark gray suit and impatient stance. I removed my coat and placed it in the hall closet, then walked toward him wearing a wide smile. Nice to see you too, brother. When I got close enough, I stood on my tiptoes and kissed his cheek briefly. He continued to glare at me, his golden eyes darkening slightly. I rolled my eyes and walked past him. Relax, God, I'm here now. Let's eat. Following the sounds of conversation into the living room, I entered the room and stopped in my tracks. There you are, said Mina. Nastasia, must you always be late? Mina's hungry. That was Lev. Annika was next. Hey, honey. Then Cora. About time you got here, bitch. But my eyes were fixed. Vic moved to sit up the moment he heard my name. My three-year-old niece Lydia hanging upside down in his muscly arms, giggling, her curly pigtails dangling from her head. And my uterus awoke. Fuck me with a jackhammer. Please, God, I beg you, have mercy. It was hard enough seeing the dark-haired, blue-eyed, built man be his beautiful, tattooed self. But playing with a child? Ugh! My heart stood no chance against that. Not at all. Naz, was all he said. His whiskey-smooth voice may as well have been whispered into my ear as goosebumps lined my arms. His intense gaze caressed me from across the room. I felt him everywhere. This wasn't new. This was how things were with us. We had an extreme effect on one another. The best thing we could do for the sake of everyone around us was simply get along, and for a while we did just that. But lately, Vic had been itching for an argument. How could I tell? Because he was doing everything possible to push my buttons. He made no effort to hide it either. If he wasn't questioning my every decision, he was blatantly flirting with the dancers at Bleeding Hearts or making crude jokes to get a rise out of me. I knew he was hurt, so I kept it together. But my God, my patience had worn thin. In short, Vic was punishing me. Again. From behind me, with the king of all size, Sasha announced, Let's eat. 
The conversation was moved to the dining room, and once everyone was seated, Sasha got right to it. I should have been listening, but I wasn't. I was too focused on the man sitting opposite me, who looked to be undressing me with his eyes. I swallowed hard and squirmed in my seat, staring down at my untouched plate. When I chanced a look at him again, his eyes dipped to my throat, and the way his lips tipped up at one corner told me he noticed. God, he looked amazing, in black fitted jeans, a light gray Henley, and the white Lacoste Courtmaster sneakers I'd bought him just because I thought they'd look good on him. Spoiler alert, they did. With his dark hair cut into a low fade with texture on the top, my hands clenched into fists under the table as I itched to run my fingers through it. I could almost feel his neatly trimmed stubble scraping along my inner thigh. A shudder swept over me. I picked up my fork and held it in distraction, and Jesus wept. My eyes landed on the cupid's bow of his full mouth. It was sweet torture just looking at him. As the tip of his tongue came out to wet his bottom lip, my fork fell from my hand and onto my plate with a clatter. Then everyone was staring at me. What do you think about that, Nastasia? Vic asked, blinking slowly, knowing full well I hadn't been listening. Uh, what? Was my very smart, very croaky response. About what Sasha said. He prompted his fingertips playing with the condensation on his glass. My eyes narrowed slightly. I think it's great. You could at least pretend to listen. Vic's smile did not reach his eyes. But then, I know how flighty you are. Flighty? My stomach clenched painfully. This bitch. Well, I guess we were doing this. Are you sure you understood what was said? My blood went from quiet simmer to a vicious boil. Sasha does use big words. I know that confuses you sometimes. Guys, Mina pleaded but was quickly cut off. Cora sighed at the same time. Can we not? Are you getting what you need from this conversation? Vic lifted his glass and sipped from it. Maybe there's another conversation out there that you'd be getting more from. I know how when you're done with conversing with me, you like to run into a little French conversation. Annika gasped lightly. Holy shit. He went there. I was officially pissed and leaned in slightly. What is that supposed to mean? You're a smart girl. You can figure it out. Standing up so roughly that my chair warbled loudly, I pointed at him and spoke through gritted teeth. Kitchen, now! The footfalls behind me told me he was following, and when I stalked into the next room and opened the door to the walk-in pantry, I all but shoved him in there and shut the door behind us. I can't believe you! I whisper hissed, and when I spun around to face him, I probed. What is your goddamn problem? Vic crossed his arms over his chest, looking bored. Don't you dare, don't you dare look so unaffected. Not when we both knew better. I hated that. My expression pleading, I spoke softly. I'm trying here, Vic. I'm really trying. Do you think this is easy for me? My feet moved as I began to pace. I see you at work. I see you at home. Somehow, you're always where I am. And let me tell you, having you act like an ass doesn't help. If I'm being completely honest, it hurts. But he was unmoved. This was what you wanted, Naz. He muttered, uninterested. I never said I'd pretend to be happy about it. Was he serious? No, I never wanted this. Can't we just get along for everyone else's sake? Get along. His eyes darkened as he took a step toward me, then another. Is that what you want? 
Why did he have to be so handsome? Why did he push up his sleeves like that, giving me an indecent view of his lightly veined forearms? Damn it. He knew how much I liked that. Also, why did everything have to end in an argument? I was so tired of arguing. Not that I minded how our arguments ended, because they all ended the same way. The second I realized what we were doing, I gasped, and my eyes widened. The frown was ripped from my face, and I quickly glued on a huge smile that I did not feel. A rushed whisper shot out of my mouth. No, 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 no. But when he attempted to speak, I pressed my finger to his lips, squishing them lightly as I shushed him. My voice took on a gentle, serene tone. Inside voices. We're staying calm. We aren't arguing. Everything's good. We're happy. We're smiling. And we're two adults just having a conversation. That's all. A strained laugh left me. We're having a good time. Vic watched me closely and from the way his brow furrowed, I could tell he was confused by the sudden change in direction. Why are you acting so weird? I'm not. My smile wavered, but only slightly. You are. I shook my head and my cheeks ached. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to avoid conflict. Why? His heavy brow narrowed with suspicion. You never have before. My brain-to-mouth filter stammered, and the honest-to-God truth was worse than any lie I could have come up with. Because if we fight, we'll kiss, and if we kiss, there is a strong possibility that you'll end up with your hand in my panties. If that happens, I'm going to come and want you to mount me like a mutt stealing away with a thoroughbred, and that's the situation I'm trying to avoid here. And there it was. I was so weary of fighting that I didn't even have the grace to blush. Of all the things he expected to hear, I could tell it wasn't the candid confession he just got. I know this because he lost a lot of the tension he wore in his shoulders and returned a smart ass. Why? Sounds like a good time, had by all. It did. My sob was purely internal. It really did. My faux smile fell. I don't want to fight. I tried to sound composed, but my voice shook. But we're so much better when we fight. His hulking build came closer and closer, walking me backward until my ass hit the wall. A thrum of awareness went through me, and my heart stuttered. Remember? Uh-oh. I was trapped. Icy blue eyes held me prisoner as he explained in perfect calm. I don't want that. My gut sank. You don't want us to get along? I did not know how to unpack that. The way he ran his thumb over his lips, leisurely, without hurry, had me wishing for a taste. No. He shook his head and I felt I might cry until he said, I want your passion. I want my savage girl. I want you. In my car. In my bed. By my side. I want to be inside your head while I'm thrusting inside your body. It felt like I had taken a solid hit to the solar plexus as he went on, ruining me with every word more than a decade together and you think I'm just gonna let you go on your merry way because you're having doubts not a chance my kitty purred well shit what was I supposed to say to that Vic reached up focusing on the place by my temple pushing a stray hair behind my ear we were happy once and we're gonna be happy again I'm good with giving you time, so I'll be doing that. But this thing that's happening right now, it's not a permanent situation. 
He paused. It's always been you and me, Naz. He was right. It had been. Somewhere deep inside me, I felt something crack when he said the words we had been saying to each other since the very beginning. Forever. And always. My mouth dry, I uttered quietly. Don't do this. Why couldn't he just let it go? Let me go. Vic licked his lips, looked me dead in the eye, and broke my heart. You've been my girl since I was a boy, and I'll be damned if we're not holding hands on the day we meet our maker. Any fight I had left me with those quietly spoken words. And fuck me, I wanted to cry. If it were possible for a heart to swoon dead away, mine just had. I found it hard to breathe. My knees almost gave out. With a groan, I dug the heels of my palms into my eyes. You can't say that kind of stuff to me, Vic. I lowered my hands and looked up at him, imploring. If you keep saying things like that, I'll never get over you. Good. He moved so quickly I didn't have time to react, and when he lowered his lips to mine, I'm ashamed to say I lost control. We kissed like we fought, mean, rough, and grasping for control. Never breaking contact, I forced him back into a shelf, and the groceries on it shifted with a thud. His arms snaked around me as he ate at my mouth, one at my back, the other squeezing my ass hard, and it hurt so good. His tongue stroked mine and my hips bucked. Vic growled into my mouth, and moaning, I reached up and gripped the front of his shirt, both pushing him away and pulling him closer to me. He picked me up and pinned me against the wall. I hit the back of my head and winced. Ow! Sorry. He panted into my mouth, then kissed me so deep, so desperately that I swore for a single moment our souls merged. The noises of clanging and banging and crashing sounded around us, and I found I didn't care if we were making a scene. My legs wrapped around him of their own accord, and his forearm hefted me higher, holding me up. Having been in this position so many times during the course of my life, I guess it was second nature. My panties were soaked through, and I might have been embarrassed had it not been for the thick, raging erection pressing up against my core. I didn't notice the change, but it was clear our kissing had grown softer, a gentler quality taking over, until the slow, wet kisses reminded me of Sunday morning lovemaking, leisurely and full of feeling. Tilting his hips, he rocked against me at the very same time his tongue dipped into my mouth, and I saw stars nearly coming on the spot. And then it happened. What are you doing, Nas? The intrusive thought soured my mood and doused ice-cold water over my straining libido. Sad and already mourning the loss of his mouth, I allowed him to kiss me a few seconds longer before I spoke against his lips. Stop. Reluctantly, his kisses slowed, then came to a halt with a heavy sigh. And when he put his forehead to my shoulder... Panting, I unconsciously reached up to stroke the back of his neck. I loved this man. I loved him in a way no other could replicate. But unless he was willing to give me all of him, I couldn't do this. I deserved more. He lifted his head and his hooded gaze went to my swollen lips. As he opened his mouth to speak, a knock came from outside the pantry. Uh, guys, it was Mina. It kind of sounded like two raccoons fighting in a trash can from out here. She paused. Is everything okay? Vic slowly let me down, studying my face, as if trying to memorize every inch of it. My feet touched the floor and I released the front of his Henley, smoothing my fingers over the now scrunched material. When he stepped back, I wobbled on the spot, feeling awfully bereft of the warmth of his body. We watched each other closely, 
and when my expression fell, Vix turned sullen. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing, simply brushing my fingers against his as I swept past him and opened the door to the pantry. Mina took one look at me, and her brows rose to her damn hairline. Oh, great. I like that good, huh? My cheeks heating, I ran a hand over my hair and refused to look at her. So, I'm just gonna go. Uh-huh, she muttered distractedly, inspecting me without shame. And just because I wanted to avoid a situation, I slunk out the back door, just as Mina said. Wow, Vic, just wow. I didn't wait to hear his response. I just needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. I was moister than an oyster, horny as hell, and I needed to do something about it. Call it self-care. Chapter 2 Nastasia I woke up in the morning with the strangest feeling I dreamed it all. I mean, I knew I hadn't. I wore the evidence right there on my skin. The marks on my back from being thrown up against a wall, the slight beard rash on my chin, along with semi-swollen lips that were more than enough to convict. It happened, all right. Confirmed twice over when I checked the text Vic sent me at 11 p.m. Vic. We good? It was the first time we'd connected via phone in almost two months. I wondered if I should text back or not. Opening the line of communication was a dangerous thing for us. We could go from zero to a hundred real quick. If history was ever to repeat itself, a single text could change everything. My body felt light, having found my release for the second time that night, and I panted, throwing down my vibrator before checking my phone. My stomach tightened as I stared at the open screen, and because I was mildly satiated, I ran my legs over my silk sheets, savoring the feel of them as I texted back. Me. Of course. His response was immediate. Vic. Good. I should not have engaged. But hell, I was only human. Like an addict, I was already itching to text him back. But if I had proven anything to myself over the last few months, it was that I was stronger than I gave myself credit for, even if that strength was costing me my happiness momentarily. A heavy sadness went through me as I placed my phone on the nightstand and attempted to sleep, but it was difficult. A mile a minute, my brain ran with thoughts, and while I tried to calm, unsurprisingly, they had the opposite effect. The thought of him alone in his bed with nothing but me on his mind had my body turning restless. My mind took me back to the pantry scene, and sweet Jesus, the harsh angles of his face had my legs squeezing together tightly, a dull throb below my belly, cheekbones sharp enough to cut through diamond, a strong jaw that just begged to be nibbled. There was something endearing about that slightly crooked nose, one that had clearly taken a hit a time or two in the past. The heaviness of his brow gave him an air of being perpetually pissed off, but his sapphire-like eyes seemed to soften that part of him. His stance was one of cool conviction, almost an air of nobility to his gait. And those lips... Ugh, full and lush and inviting, with a thin scar running through the left side of them. I had kissed that scar a thousand times, and I ached to kiss it a thousand more. Vic exposed a nerve I buried deep inside me. Worst of all, he unlocked the box I had buried even deeper than those feelings, where a single ember of hope still burned so when I received another message ten minutes later, my stomach nodded in anticipation. Vic. Not gonna apologize, because I don't regret it. I read it once, and again, then closed my eyes and groaned quietly, mock crying. With a sigh, I blew out a breath and muttered, Of course you don't, you beautiful bastard. 
There was such a defiant, bold response that I couldn't help the smile that tipped my lips. The reply was purely Vic, brazen and insolent. My smile stretched wider. He was a fighter. Always had been. It was something that was ingrained in his very being. A memory came out of nowhere, taking me back to the night that had changed everything. Nastasia, age 17. The music blared, and every time the bass hit, I felt it everywhere. My heart pounded along to the beat, and I closed my eyes, swaying away to the song, feeling light and breezy. Not surprising, as I was six beers in. Sounds of laughter, singing, and conversation surrounded us. Teens took up space on the sofa, passing along the one blunt they managed to get their hands on. Girls and guys danced too close to each other, alcohol lowering their every inhibition. Girls sat on the laps of their boyfriends with a sweet smile, as if we all couldn't see hands sliding under skirts and moving in a way that promised pleasure. And Annika stood by my side, sipping from her red cup, looking miserable. She looked miserable a lot lately, but every time I brought it up, she would try her best to convince me she was fine. I left it alone, knowing she would tell me when she was ready. Look, I was not the type to attend high school house parties, but Annika was a cheerleader, so a handful of times a year, I would make an effort to show my friend that I accepted that side of her and do my best to mingle with her preppy friends, even though they secretly made me want to barf. Talk about shallow waters. The like girls was what I called them, because they, like, spoke like this. It was only 9 p.m., and I wasn't sure how much longer I'd last. The only way to get through these parties was to drink enough to get blitzed, and I was already halfway to fucked up. It was easy to tell, because I was actually having fun. Lucky for me, Annika actually cared about her mind and body, and she never drank more than a single beer, leaving me free to let loose, knowing she would be watching me closely. She was a good friend. Annika sighed, scanning the room with a pout. I'm so bored. I was before, but now I was not. Dancing on the spot to a beat only I seemed to hear, I moved my hips slowly, turning to face her. I hated to see her so glum. I was going to fix that. The only reason I offered what I did was because I was happily buzzed. Let's dance. Really? Annika's face lit up. I did not dance at parties. Ever. She, of course, knew better than to give me a moment to think about it. Putting down her drink so fast it spilled, she took my hand. Let's go! The blatant change in her demeanor made it worth it, though. I smiled as she led me to the center of the crowd, and she moved so fluidly to the music that I quietly understood why Annika did what she did. Dance was simply a part of who she was, an extension of her soul. When we were five, I was making mud pies and secretly sniffing markers. Annika wanted to be a ballerina. She twirled and stretched and begged her mother to learn how to French braid so she could wear the most intricate of ballet buns. She stood on the tips of her toes, and even at that age, she was committed. Meanwhile, I had no commitments to anything. I went to almost every performance of hers, and Annika was amazing. She had the ability to make you feel things with her effortless movement. I never understood why she quit. But she always did some type of dance. She moved on to jazz, then contemporary, and when her school workload started to rise, she settled for cheerleading. It wasn't dance exactly, but she enjoyed it, and that was all that mattered. Annika's friends joined us on the dance floor, and I was shocked to find that I actually didn't mind their company. When the song ended, we retreated back to our corner with the girls in tow. A brunette with a huge smile who seemed to bounce on the spot when she talked, Carla Martinez, gasped, gripping my arm tight enough to sting. Oh my God, he's here. Yo, I frowned, gently pulling her vice-like grip off of me. Hands off the merchandise, lady. The cute blonde standing next to Annika peered over my head to see behind me, then smirked. Faith Lewis made a show, raising a single brow. 
Like, I think you know him, Nastasia. My heart stuttered, and I spun around quickly, any appearance of cool officially gone. Oh. My stomach sank in disappointment. It wasn't the person I wanted it to be, but when he jerked his chin in my direction, a slow smile tugged at my lips, and I lifted my hand in a demure greeting. He strode toward me with three friends in tow, and the moment he got near enough, his face dipped close to mine, and he kissed my cheek in a move that secretly stunned me. I put a quick hand to my stomach to ease the flutter. This was strange. I wasn't used to this. Guys were normally too scared to come within walking distance of me, and with my brothers burning holes into them with a simple stare, I didn't even blame them. The familiarity in which he treated me was new. After a quick thought, I decided I liked it. Okay, so he wasn't Vic, but he still kept my belly warm and my cheeks flushed, and until the moment Vic would realize the gift he had in me, I was a free agent. I begged myself to play it cool, but my fingers came up to brush the place he kissed me. The moment he caught the move, his eyes crinkled in the corners. I should have been embarrassed, and maybe it was the beer, but I just couldn't find the will to care. Instead, I craned my neck up to look at him. Tino? Santino Ricci took a small step closer. Beautiful Naz. Annika's eyes looked like they might just pop right out of her head, and I could have imagined it, but I swear she, Carla, and Faith grouped together and squeed very, very quietly. This caught the attention of the guys hovering behind him. One of them took a long look at Annika, and a slow grin formed. How you doing? He was tall, well-dressed, and looked at her like he was a hungry lion, and she was the only bunny rabbit he wanted to eat. Annika looked like she might choke on her own tongue. When she attempted to respond, all she managed to do was let out a little squeak. Oh, God, Annie. She, like me, was not used to guys being so forward. All the boys at school knew we were off limits, thanks to our brothers, which, understandably, left us a little awkward around guys our age. Seclusion was the price you paid for being a mob princess. Embarrassed, she blushed prettily, then dipped her chin to hide her smile. Good. Distracted by the handsome man in front of me, I ignored them and grinned. Aren't you a little old to be attending high school parties? Damn girl, you're mean. His smile was sly as he placed a hand over his heart, rubbing a make-believe ache. Maybe I should just leave you to it. No. My hand shot out to his before I could stop myself. He looked down at my hand in his for a moment, then squeezed it gently. Now I was mortified. That did not stop my beer-loosened tongue from saying, Don't go. Crap, Naz. Annika grabbed my arm. Yeah? I uttered vaguely as I stared up into Tino's handsome face. But the hand on my arm tugged at me. Her tone was sharper this time. Naz! I spun on her, annoyed, and snapped. What? She looked past me to the open doorway and responded evenly. Your brothers are here. What the shit? Fuck. I was almost too scared to look. Licking my lips, I feigned confidence I did not have as I turned in their direction, then immediately wished I hadn't. Lev stared down at the masculine hand holding mine while Sasha's piercing gaze met my eyes squarely. When Lev's hands fisted by his sides, my stomach flip-flopped. Oh, no. I did not need my quirky brother to have a moment. Not now. Please, God, not now. It was bad enough having the reputation our family had. I was already labeled a misfit. My social status, or lack thereof, did not need this. Thankfully, when Lev moved to stalk toward Tino, Sasha stopped him, speaking directly into his ear. Lev immediately calmed, losing the raging fire in his eyes, and my heartbeat steadied, thankful for Sasha's interjection. Strangely, my brothers didn't start for me. Instead, they moved off to the side, keeping a distance while watching me with an eagle's eye. In a weird way, I was grateful. 
I didn't know what they were doing here, but it seemed they weren't going to embarrass me in front of the entire senior class. Reminding me of the warm hand clasping mine, Tino spoke into my ear. Your brothers? I faced him. Yeah. Tino didn't take his eyes off of them. Are we good? My shrug was light. I think so. I mean, you're not a bloody heap at my feet, so I guess. Just as Tino smiled and tugged at my hand to pull me closer, Annika cussed, hiding her drink, and I internally sighed. Without even looking, I felt his penetrating gaze all over me. And when Tino peered over my head, puffing out a long breath, I smiled sadly. We looked at each other woefully, knowing we would never have our chance. Tino merely shook his head, then spoke through an exhale. Maybe in another lifetime. When a strong hand slipped into my free one, grasping it tightly, I found myself slipping out of Tino's hold and holding onto the intruders like a lifeline. This wasn't a choice. There was no choosing. No one could ever compete with the man radiating waves of anger and clutching at my hand like he owned me. Because he did. Tino didn't bother to hide his glare. Victor? But Vic didn't bother with niceties. Grab your shit, Ani. We're leaving. Like me, Annika knew better than to argue in front of a crowd. With a huff of complaint, she pushed off the wall, gave her friends a small wave, and shot the guy she was talking to a dejected smile. With complete grace and elegance, she all but glided past me, and while she got away to safety, I was stuck here with the jerk who equally made me want to kill for him while also wanting to kill him. The space around us changed. I knew something was coming. There was a tension in the air that felt suffocating, and it was building. I just didn't know what it was building to. That was when Vic opened his mouth. There was a rough quality to his voice. If you know what's good for you, Richie, you'll stay away from Naz. Ah, there it was. I wished Tino was the type to back down. Alas, he was not. Or what, Vic? Oh, no. No. A tiny part of me wanted to go over to Tino and slap my hand over his mouth. I would have if I didn't know how weak it would make him appear. Vic took a threatening step forward, releasing my hand, and the words shot out of his mouth like bullets from a gun. Or I'll put you down like the diseased animal you are. He pulled up his shirt, and it didn't take a genius to know that Vic had shown him his piece. Don't fuck with me, boy. You got hundreds of girls out here. My anger spiked. Yeah, I was mad. But sometimes when Vic spoke, he said things that made my insides do funny things. His voice low and full of menace, Vic declared. You can't have her. She belongs to me. Simultaneously, my nipples tightened painfully as my core began to pulse. Fuck me sideways. Ugh, why did that turn me on? What was wrong with me? I was a freak. Also, why was the air so thick in here? My fingers came up to pull at the collar of my blouse. I was struggling to breathe in this bitch. When I saw Tino struggle to keep his mouth shut, I saved him from doing something very stupid and stepped forward to slip my hand into Vic's, holding it tightly while my other hand circled his wrist, pulling gently. Come on. But Vic wasn't ready to leave. He looked Tino up and down, his darkened gaze holding a promise of violence if we didn't get out of there soon. Vic. I pressed my body into his arm, and when I regained his focus, he looked down at me. I'm ready to go now. His expression softened, and he spoke quietly. Okay, baby. Let's go. I was a teenage girl, in the arms of a beast, and I'll be honest, 
as Vic walked me through the house with his hand gripping mine, peering at the people around us, daring them to say a fucking word. My chest expanded with an unnamed emotion that felt a little like pride. This was new and exciting. I really shouldn't have, but I liked this feeling. My brothers provided a protective barrier around Annika as we made an exit, and when we approached our respective cars, Vic released my hand and shot Annika a look. She appeared puzzled for a moment, but then lightly rolled her eyes and said almost robotically, Are you still going to sleep over, Naz? Which had never been the plan. Uh, before I could say a single word, Vic pressed a button unlocking the car. Get in. My heart stopped, then started again with a boom. I hesitated because my brothers weren't dumb. They had to know what was going on. Vic wasn't even making an attempt to hide it. Imagine my stunned surprise when Sasha said, Call me when you want to come home. I... But I was once again rudely cut off by Vic. No need. I have to come down for the meet tomorrow. I'll drop her off then. Vic rounded the car and helped me in, shutting the door behind me, and for a moment, Ani and I were alone in the car. You didn't have to do that. My voice was barely a whisper. Ani just looked out the window. You make him happy, Naz. The words made my heart grow four whole sizes. But the way she said it made me feel awful. I tried not to take it personally. Of course she felt weird about my odd non-relationship with her brother. It was a big secret to carry. But she did that for us without a word of complaint. My insides felt jumpy when we arrived at the house. And while Ani let herself in through the front door, Vic took my hand and led me to the private entrance to his room at the side of the house. He placed me in front of him, reaching past me to unlock the door and my heartbeat began to quicken. I was nervous. What was my problem? I'd been in the converted basement bedroom many times before. But you've never slept there? There was an energy vibrating around us, and as I led him down the steps on wobbling feet and into his space, my eyes were immediately drawn to the king-sized bed to the left. I instantly wondered how it would feel to have his weight on me, to feel his bare skin on mine. His room had a quietly masculine theme to it. The simple furniture was all dark woods, the sheets of his bed were black silk, and the plush sofa to the right was gunmetal gray. Vic placed his keys and piece into the first drawer of the nightstand. Then he was in front of me. He looked me over and huffed out a soft breath. You drive me crazy. You know that? The unmissable annoyance in his tone had me fighting a smile. My brows rose. I never half-ass anything. You know that. Vic's eyes lit with amusement. What a pair we were. Quite suddenly, his expression turned serious and he reached up to brush his knuckles lightly over my lips. Do you? I closed my eyes, pressing a gentle kiss to the passing caress. Do I what? Do you belong to me? My eyes opened leisurely to find his intense gaze on me, unblinking. God, he was killing me. A single look, and I was slayed. I could see it in his eyes. There was an urgency worn openly. He needed a response. He needed to hear the words. Ever obliging, I stepped into the warmth of his body and tilted my head up to peer into his eyes. Forever and always. Yes, I was a teenager, but I also knew my own heart. I meant what I said. There could only be forever with Vic. One strong arm snaked around me as the other came up to rest at my nape. His fingers tangled in my hair, and I gasped lightly as he gently tugged my head to the side, 
exposing my neck to him. He moved at a leisurely pace, planting slow, hot kisses under the right side of my jaw, and I forgot how to breathe. Vic just had a way about him. The way he touched me made me feel worshipped, revered, as if he were kneeling at the altar of a goddess. Every kiss was a sinner's prayer. The returning brush of my lips absolved him. Abruptly, all the sensations flowing through me felt like an assault. My lungs tight, I took in a deep, shaking breath as my hands reached up to grasp at the front of his shirt, desperately needing the support. Kiss me, I breathed. Vic looked at me then in the way I had always wanted him to. Like a man who wanted a woman more than he wanted his next breath. He dipped his face and held it close, his lips hovering a hair's breadth from mine. And I begged. Please. The words glanced his lips and he closed the connection. As his lips met mine, I smiled into the kiss my soul creaking then cracking before breaking wide open. My body yielded and it was a disaster. One kiss from this man and my heart was no longer mine alone. His arm tightened around me, pulling me impossibly close as he tilted his head before claiming my mouth deeply, hungrily. It was one of those moments, life-altering. I knew I would never be the same. Feelings of warmth and safety washed over me, the taste of him addictive. These were no sweet kisses. They were pure, raw emotion in physical form. I may have not been the smartest person, but I knew a kiss from Santino Ricci would pale in comparison. He could never do for me what Victor Nikulin did. No other man could. Vic noiselessly spun me and began walking. I permitted myself to be led, and when he lowered me to the bed, I found that what little reservations I had vanished. I didn't need to wave a white flag to surrender myself to him completely. His deft hands pulled at my blouse, then tugged at my jeans, leaving me in my black bra and unmatching purple panties. He did not undress himself as carefully as he had me. His black tee was ripped up and over his head, revealing a broad chest and tight stomach. When he kicked his shoes off, they flew in different directions, landing with a dull thud. I felt the insane urge to laugh as he struggled to undo his belt and throw off his jeans. But the moment my eyes raked over his strong, fit body, the mirth I felt was replaced with desire raking over me like licks of fire teasing my skin. Vic crawled over me wearing nothing but his dark gray boxers, and they did nothing to hide his want. His eyes smiled as he lowered his face to mine. I lifted myself to meet him halfway, our mouths melding together in a dance I wasn't sure I knew the steps to. But with Vic guiding me, I was a quick study. Soon enough, what little we wore ended up on the floor, and when Vic kissed his way down my body— to kiss me where I'd never been kissed before. My body flinched and jerked at all the new sensations. It was nice until I unexpectedly felt like my entire body was about to spontaneously combust. And when I reached a peak higher than I'd ever climbed before, I gripped the back of his head and pushed his mouth deeper into me, whimpering quietly. No, 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 no. The electricity inside me built higher and higher, humming loudly until the voltage was too much to handle. A fuse blew and something inside of me exploded. My body shaking, my mouth opened in a silent scream as my eyes rolled into the back of my head. Holy shit! As I came down from a high I had never experienced, my heart raced and a long, weak moan escaped me as my body continued to jerk every few seconds. It felt like being electrocuted in the best damn way. Licking my lips, I still felt my heart pounding through my chest and waited for my breathing to return to normal. Weak as a kitten, my body turned lax. 
After Vic wiped his cheeks across my inner thighs, he crawled over and trapped me between his solid arms, searching my face. Okay, baby. Limp as a wet noodle, I shot him a feeble smile. Yeah. But it felt incomplete. He ran gentle fingers across my jaw, but stilled when I said, I want to have sex. His expression was almost comical. I had never seen a man look like he had both won the lottery, but was also scared of the winnings. Are you sure? When he didn't make me beg, I loved him all the more. Of course I was. I wanted nothing but honesty between us. My hand came up, and I cupped his lightly stubbled cheek. I don't want anyone else. He hesitated only a moment, but when his body covered mine, I felt like I'd won the lottery too, and Vic and I shared the prize. He was gentle, and we went slow. It was everything I ever wanted, and to share this act with Victor Nikulin made it perfect. It hurt. Oh, God, it hurt. But I was so distracted by the scent of him, the feel of him, those intense kisses, that it hurt only momentarily before it started to feel good. Really good. And as his pace picked up, I lifted my hips in a way that felt natural, meeting him thrust for thrust. In awe, I watched his face contort, and when he lost control, his body rigid, pulling out and thrusting into the tight grip of his fist, releasing onto my stomach, I felt more powerful than I ever had in my entire being. It was beautiful, real. Sure, it didn't last very long, but it held a promise of better things to come. This experience was one I would cherish forever. Vic did everything right. I allowed him to clean me up, and when he was done, he lay back down and pulled me to his side, gently stroking my back. Admittedly, what he said afterward wasn't very romantic, but still pleased me. He tilted my chin and kissed me softly. I'll have to buy condoms. With that statement, he had not only admitted he wasn't sleeping with any other girls, but he also acknowledged we would be doing this again. He didn't know it, but his non-flowery words were exactly what I needed to hear. Happy as a clam, I tucked my face into the side of his chest and whispered, I love you, Vic. The way he stilled frightened me a moment. He rolled us both over until he was once again towering over me. He then asked me very, very quietly. What did you just say? Oh, Nastasia, what have you done? There was no use in pretending. Swallowing hard, I responded and equally quiet. I love you. For a split second, Vic's face turned pained. His eyes snapped shut, and his forehead fell to my chest. The longer the silence spanned, the more anxious I became. I had to do something. So I did the only thing I could think to do at that point. My arms wound around him in a gentle embrace. I feathered my fingertips up and down his back, watching in fascination as he broke out in goose flesh. Feeling emboldened at his reaction to me, I ran my fingers through his hair, and I could feel his lips moving in the valley between my breasts. At first, I thought it a kiss. But when his breath warmed the skin there, I realized he was quietly speaking into my flesh. When he suddenly lifted his head and sleepily blinked down at me, I smiled softly and my heart puffed up in response. He lowered his mouth to mine, and my lips parted beneath his. The kiss grew and deepened, and when he lifted my legs to wrap around him, I felt his thick, hard length prodding at me. My brows rose, and I whispered, Again? Against his mouth. Vic pulled back a moment, 
to look at me through hooded eyes and simply stated, We've got all night, baby. Oh, I liked the sound of that. When he made to kiss me again, I got a little excited and moved to meet him, but our teeth clashed. He winced, then chuckled, and I laughed softly in return. My nose began to tingle, and I wasn't so sure it was from the hard knock it had just taken. My throat thick with emotion, a simple mantra circled my mind. I love you. I love you. Oh, God. I love you. We made love desperately, clumsily, and yet it was matchless. I found every moment of it as sweet and endearing as the man rocking into me, bringing me closer to rapture with every touch. Present Look, I know the kiss we shared in the pantry was good, but it couldn't happen again. Oh, yeah? Yes. The wispy blonde spared me a friendly smile. Nastasia, come on through. She opened the door to the small room and gestured to the bed. Go ahead and get undressed. I'll be back in a minute. If the super hot kiss didn't affect you at all, then what are we doing here? Ugh, shut up, brain. I'm so sick of your shit. I undressed quickly, put on the disposable panties, and waited quietly, contemplating every little thing that led to this very moment. The lady returned, wearing gloves. Her brows lifted as she asked, And we're getting a Brazilian today. My brain cackled at me. Tramp. I forced out a super friendly, Yeah! Hoping the woman waxing me couldn't tell I was going through an existential crisis. Fighting to remain quiet as she waxed away my dignity, I held it together until she patted my hip and asked a non-judgmental, Want your bottom done too, hun? My brain crossed its arms over its chest, lifted a thin brow, and tapped its foot in question. I started to nod as my mouth pursed in shame. Yup. The word shook, and it was embarrassingly noticeable. As I pulled my knees to my chest and spread my cheeks for the woman, the realization hit me with the force of a brick to the head. Oh, God. I wanted sex, and I wanted it with a man who drove me insane. Yeah, my cooch wanted Vic real bad. I internally wept. I am a tramp. Chapter 3 Nastasia It was only 9 a.m., but as I got out of my car and walked up the wide steps, the front door opened and the man who stood there looked so sleep-worn, so disgruntled, wearing nothing but a pair of navy boxers, that I couldn't help but stop in my tracks. I reached up and made a show of sliding my sunglasses off, taking in his body like the spectacle it was. If it weren't for the jagged scars on his face, he'd be a perfect ten. Damn. A lusty, teasing smile stretched at my lips. Okay, all right. I kind of get what Cora sees in your ugly mug. I mean, if we put a bag over your head, I let the rest of the sentence fade away. Alessio rolled his eyes, leaving me at the door. I laughed out loud, shut the door behind me, and jogged to keep up. Following him down the hall and into the dining room, the second they saw me, a round of greetings sounded. My girl said Uncle Laredo, putting down the newspaper he was reading to give me his full attention. A strange feeling passed through me. It always did whenever I saw him. It was as though I was transported back into the body of my eight-year-old self, and a tiny sliver of awkwardness reared its ugly head. Genuinely happy to see him, I approached with a smile and leaned down to kiss his cheek. Good morning, Uncle. We'd been estranged for too long spent too much time apart. I missed him terribly during that time. Now I came to visit once a week in an attempt to bridge the gap. Laredo Scarfo was not the most handsome man in the world, but he had something about him. The way he spoke, the way he held himself. He was charismatic. You look beautiful, he uttered in a paternal way, 
his eyes smiling. Doesn't she look beautiful, boys? Nicholas Van Eden nodded enthusiastically, speaking around his food. Like an angel. I had a special kind of love for the South African. He was quite honestly the sweetest man I'd ever met. And while he let me know on many occasions that he would treat me like a princess should I ever wish to date him, it was precisely why we would not have made a good match. I wasn't the kind of woman who needed to be doted on to appreciate a man. As I passed him, I placed both my hands on his shoulders and kissed the top of his head. Roman Vlasic, half Italian stallion, half Croatian sensation, shot me a smile that dripped of sex. Morning, Lutka. Where's my kiss? When I passed him, he tried to grab at me, and I slapped his hand away, training narrowed eyes on him. What? He asked, the very image of innocence. He was a sleaze, which was why I was not going to give him an inch, because, Lord, he'd take a mile. And with a face like that, I'd be tempted to let him. I pointed an unwavering finger at him. Hands to yourself, Rome. He blew me an exaggerated kiss, and if I were any other woman, I would have thrown myself into his arms right then and there. But it was the gorgeous little guy at the end of the table that was, by far, my favorite of all my uncle's adopted sons. Davi Lobo, extremely sweet, but extremely short, had a smile that could cause a coronary, and although he didn't exude the kind of seductive pull that others did, he had other qualities that made up for it. As I sat beside him, he turned in his chair, giving me his complete attention, took both my hands in his, and pressed butter-soft kisses to my knuckles. And that was why women all over New York were half in love with him. They fell the full way down whenever he listened intently to whatever you were saying, his steady gaze on your lips, without actually understanding a lick of it. He was getting better, though. And so I asked, How's your English coming along? When he made a face, I chuckled. He spoke rapid-fire Portuguese, and when I made a face identical to the one he made just a moment earlier, he stopped and smiled, letting out a heavily accented, Bitter, a little. Then he put up both hands and made a gesture like waves in an ocean. Slowly. That's great. I laid a hand on his arm and said, Slow is good. There was one man missing, but I was not about to ask about him. There was history there, and I didn't want to bring any unwanted attention toward it. It was better that Philippe wasn't here. Whenever we found ourselves together, there was an intense longing shadowing his gaze, one that I feared would never escape him. It wasn't fair for him. My heart belonged to another. To what do we owe the pleasure, Nastasia? My uncle asked kindly. Uncle Laredo still wasn't used to me coming over unannounced, and after all the bad blood between our families, I was pretty sure he was waiting for the ball to drop. He just couldn't seem to understand that being in his presence gave me a familial connection I thought I'd lost. Helping myself to a piece of toast on Davi's plate, I nibbled on it and uttered guardedly, I didn't think I needed a reason. Comprehending his folly, Laredo sat up straight, his newspaper forgotten, and said with absolute conviction, You are welcome here, sweetheart, always, at all hours, no matter what. Now if that didn't make my little heart sing. Good, I grinned at him from across the table, and when he winked at me, a feeling of warmth settled in my chest. The man seated to my left did what he always did, trying his best to bleed into his surroundings. Alessio sipped at his espresso, when he felt my eyes on him, he looked up and lifted his brow. What? My smile was deceptively serene. My words did not match the sentiment. When are you going to stop screwing around and call her? He sighed loudly, then said, How about you mind your fucking business, Naz? I let out an unladylike, pfft, and blinked at him. Do you even know me? I laughed quietly. It's just not what I do. His jaw tightened a moment, but then he smiled darkly, the scars on his face stretching. Tell me, how were things with Vic? Oh, touchy, touchy. Touché, I muttered, taking the coffee right out of his hands and claiming it as my own, sipping loudly, then finishing with a satisfied, ah. 
he looked at me like he might just strangle me, and a bubble of laughter stole up my throat. Aw, oh, don't get pissy. You know I love you. My lips pursed. Like you? I sipped at the strong, smooth coffee. Okay, tolerate you. When Mina found out she had a brother, she sure as shit didn't expect it to be the ever-ornery Scarface Scarfo. And yes, it took them a while to bond, but now they loved each other just as much as I loved my own siblings. It was nice. I liked that they had roots with each other, roots that ran deep. It was a bond that no other could replicate. At first, Alessio refused to claim Mina. It didn't help matters when Mina discovered that Sasha was the man who put those scars on her brother's face. My eldest brother didn't often do stupid shit, but sleeping with Alessio's trampy wife definitely made the top of the list. Yep, it was a shit show. Anyone with half a brain could see that the scars were a trauma Alessio would never be able to see past. Kind of hard when the reminder was worn so blatantly on his face. It didn't matter that his packaging was torn. Cora took one look at the broody jerk and she wanted him. One shared evening, one tender kiss. That was all it took. Corinna Alkaev was in love. And, like the asshole he was, Alessio refused to call her. I wasn't a complete imbecile, though. Deep down, I knew Alessio felt unworthy. It didn't matter that Cora wore her heart on her sleeve. Hell, she could have cut the damn thing out and placed the bloody beating muscle directly into his hands. Alessio would still have trouble accepting that somebody who looked like him could draw the attention of someone who looked like her. Did I love this choice of man for Cora? No, but I couldn't really talk. My taste in men wasn't exactly Michelin star quality. There was nothing I wanted more than for Cora to be happy. And because true friends supported each other, if Cora decided that Alessio was the person to bring her that, then I would help where I could. It was a slow process, but I was working on him. There was only one way I could approach this. I had to be subtle, discreet. So I plucked my phone out of my back pocket, my fingers running over the screen. Next to me, Alessio's phone began to chime. He picked it up and opened the message. The image of Cora had him tightening his fingers around his phone. The fuck is this? He asked tightly. My fingers kept moving over my phone. Alessio's phone continued to chime. One after another, I sent photos of Cora to the idiot who refused to admit he felt the same way she did. Naz, he warned, his eyes narrowing dangerously. His fingers squeezed his cell so firmly, I thought he might break the damn thing. His phone continued to ping. I just kept on sending images and told him frankly, I want you to look at her. Look at that face. Now, don't get me wrong, I have no idea what she sees in you, babe, but she wants you, so I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to show you what you're missing out on, because that woman would make you the happiest man in the entire fucking universe. But you're too much of a pussy to claim her. And you know what, Scarfo? One day, she's going to find a man who doesn't push her away every time she reaches out. No. That man will be brave enough to take her hand and pierce his own heart if it would only make her happy. His jaw tight, he stared down at the table. When his cheek ticked, I shrugged and laid it down. It could be you, but it might not be. She's not going to wait around forever. Sending one last file, I watched his eyes train on the video of Cora biting into a cupcake. Her voice sounded, Take the photo! Then me. I'm trying. What is up with your phone? She scowled. Nothing's wrong with my phone. You're just an idiot. Wait, it's doing something. My laughter broke through. Oh, shit. It's in video mode. Cora threw her head back, bursting into laughter. Her shoulders shook, and she attempted to cover her vanilla buttercream-covered lips, letting out an amused, How embarrassing! I zoomed in on her face and teased. Oh, yeah, lick it up, baby. When I said what I said next, I had a feeling she might not have appreciated my sending this to the man himself. Come on, sweet thing. Pretend you just finished with Alessio. Lick up that cream. Alessio's entire body tightened as Cora gave bedroom eyes to the camera 
and made a production of cleaning her lips with her little pink tongue, ending on her tinkling laughter. Standing so quickly that the heavy mahogany chair flew backward, Alessio turned and stalked out of the room, his phone firmly gripped in his hand. See? Subtle. Like running your nails down a chalkboard. I could not have been the only one who peeped the growing tent in his boxers. And just because I was feeling bitchy and was sick of his moody ass, I yelled out after him, You wouldn't have to jerk off if you just called her. Uncle Laredo let out a surprised, Nastasia. Thoroughly reprimanded, I shrunk in on myself and pouted. Sorry, Unc, but it's true. By my side, Davi Lobo nudged my arm, then rolled his eyes. Men, huh? I almost snorted. God, he was adorable. All I could do was grin right back at him and quietly voice my agreement. Men. Letting people down was a sore spot for me. With the rest of my day free, I decided to visit a friend who I had greatly neglected. The more I thought about it, I had let my breakup with Vic affect my friendship with her. I hadn't been to visit in quite a while, and I felt that guilt weighing down on me. My stomach tangled as I recognized the last time I'd been to her house had been just before I ended things with her brother. Really? Had it been that long? Regrettably, yes. Okay, so I hadn't been to visit in months. So, yeah, I was a terrible friend, I guess. I mean, we still talked over the phone at least a couple times a week and saw each other at work, but my heart was heavy with the realization that I hadn't been there for her lately. What made it worse was that Annika had been a constant for me during my life, always ready to drop what she was doing if and when I needed her. Lately, our friendship was a one-way street, leaning heavily in my favor. That was not good enough. I was taking a step forward to fix that and pulled into the driveway of the beautiful big Victorian house that brought back too many memories to count. During my childhood, if I wasn't at my own house, I was here. In our younger years, playing with dolls, moving on to watching romantic comedies, in high school, talking about boys until the early hours of the morning, and eventually, as young adults, sleeping off a hangover until midday. A feeling of contentment washed over me as I walked up to the front door and rang the bell. The moment the mature woman answered, I smiled sweetly and said, Hi, Mama. Dropping the tea towel she was wiping her hands on, she let out a happy cry before drawing me into her arms. I went willingly, and as she wrapped me up, I chuckled while she berated me in her heavy Russian accent. You don't love us anymore, do you? You don't visit for so long, and now I am an old lady. What have you been eating? You are too little, Nastasia. She pulled back long enough to cup my cheek and smile at me before her face turned irritated. You stay away for too long. You won't do that again, will you? I loved Dorothea Nikulin. She was the mother I wished for, and although I loved my own mother in my own way... She was nothing like Dorothea. This woman gave you all of her, every warm emotion, every kind smile. Once tall and slim, Dorothea was now all soft curves as she embraced her aging body. With light copper hair that was once flaming red and beautiful blue eyes, she was so softly spoken that it was no wonder Annika turned out the way she had. She was a carbon copy of her mother. She pulled me into the house and called out in muddled English, Yuri, come see who it is. The house hadn't changed at all. The shiny floorboards were covered in plush burgundy rugs, all with intricate patterns that screamed Russia. The furniture was a mix of dark woods, all expensive, all hand-carved and lovely. The crystal chandelier in the hall remained, twinkling delicately as soft-colored sunlight streamed through the stained-glass windows. Every mantle held knick-knacks, Imperial eggs, Matryoshka dolls, golden painted photo frames. It was as though they brought the motherland with them when they moved here. Some would call it tacky. Personally, I loved it. She all but dragged me into the kitchen, and when she spotted her pot about to boil over, she threw her hands up and let out a quiet exclamation before rushing over to it and turning it down. Oh, damn, I knew that smell. With my mouth watering, I asked, you're cooking Golubsti? 
the gorgeous matriarch smirked knowingly. Lunch is ready. Tell Anika she'll be happy to see you. I knew this house like the back of my hand, and when I got to Anika's bedroom, I lifted my hand to knock, but the door shot open. A tall woman with dark copper hair and a frowning mouth blocked the doorway. She looked surprised at my presence, and when I tell you she pasted on a smile that rivaled the Cheshire cat, she did just that. She had a husky, heavily accented voice. I know you. Yeah, she was vaguely familiar. Maybe. Nastasia. Her face softened then. I haven't seen you in a long time. Years. Maybe you remember me. Ksenia. Oh my God, I did know her. How could I not? My reservations left me as I smiled in response. Oh, wow. Hi. She held out her hands and I greeted her properly. We kissed cheeks three times in the proper Russian fashion. If I were honest, I'd admit she had always given me the heebie-jeebies. There was just something so intense about Annika's aunt. But then she would be. As a bratva wife, I expected it sort of came with the territory. Compared to the firms that once existed here in America, they were a different breed in Russia. Hardcore. I could tell Ksenia had seen some shit. Are you visiting? I asked politely. Her face fell and she released my hands. The move is permanent, I'm afraid. My husband died six months ago. My sons have all passed on. I have no grandchildren. With nothing to keep me in Russia, I decided to be closer to my sister. Well, shit. I'm so sorry. That was rough. She forced a smile. It's okay. My family is here now, and although I don't have much, I claim my sister's children as my own. It is time for a new beginning. I'm sure she hadn't meant it to be, but the last statement came out foreboding and dark. With an almost regal nod, she said, I will leave you to visit with my niece. She left us to it, and closing the door behind me, I approached cautiously. Annika stood in the center of a room, and while she did her best to appear happy to see me, her smile fell short. She tugged at the long sleeves of her tee, pulling the material over her fingers, looking somewhat childlike. Hey, I said, almost shyly. Whatever I'd been building up inside her broke like a dam. Her eyes filled with tears, and she lowered her face, a single teardrop trailing her nose and falling to the floor. Damn. A short sigh escaped me. I waited too long. I rushed over and used my arms to cocoon her in light and safety. I'm so sorry, Ani. I shouldn't have stayed away so long. No, it's not that. She sniffled in my ear. Her arms came around me, and when I felt her shaking, my protective instincts took over. I pulled back to search her face. It was pale and drawn. She looked frightened. What's going on? Are you okay? The silence spoke volumes. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand. I can't talk about it. She wanted to. I could feel it. As if doubling down, Annika just shook her head. It doesn't matter. You can't help me. What? Who was this person? I couldn't help her? Come now, of course I could. As my eyes passed over her whole self, I tutted quietly, gently using my thumb to wipe away her tears. My friend was a mess. Yeah, I can. I know just the thing. She knew me well enough to not have expected anything else but what came out of my mouth. Yeah, Annika endeavored to smile, but it shook. Definitely, I told her. First, we're going to make a stop at the grocery store to get some supplies. Then, we're going to go out for a girls' night. Dinner, drinks, dancing, all the good stuff. You need to pack a bag. I smiled tenderly. We're having a sleepover. Still overly emotional, her voice broke as she attempted to hold it together. I'd really like that. I didn't know what got her so broken up. But when she looked down at herself, she burst into tears again and very nearly wailed. 
Damn it. I need to shower. I did not like this. It was so, not Annika. She was graceful, calm, and collected. I needed to dig deeper, but thought it best to butter her up with dinner and booze first. Don't worry about it. Just pack a bag and we're gone. You can shower at mine. Better yet, I used my biggest bargaining chip. I'll run you a bath and let the jets work out some of that tension. Poor Annika. She sniffled, then whined. Okay. I helped her pack a duffel and walked her down the hall with an arm around her. When we made it to the dining room and the entire family was sitting down for lunch, I stilled at the sight of Vic. My mouth opened and out dashed, What are you doing here? A single dark brow rose. Eating lunch. Uh, right, right. We were at his parents' house. That made sense. My cheeks flushed, but Yuri Nikulin rose from the table, and I stepped into his fatherly embrace. Tall, extremely thin, and all sharp angles, the man's hair was more salt than pepper these days. He smiled as he hugged me, pressing a soft kiss to my brow, then gently pinching my cheek, chuckling. Cheeky girl. He looked to his wife and stated, She stays away too long. Dorothea nodded, parroting her husband. Too long? Yuri tried to lead me to the table. Come, eat. You're too small. Men will think you don't know how to cook and you will never marry. I tell her that she no listen to me, Dorothea added quickly. My expression turned sour. I knew how to cook. Some. Vic grinned down at his plate, and I wanted to pick up a fork and stab him with it. Ksenia scoffed. She will have no problem finding a husband. She is pretty, smart, and she looks like a girl who knows the value of family. She sipped at her wine before training her eyes on me and asking, How are your brothers? A little surprised at the question, I stuttered, G Good? I wasn't aware Ksenia had met them. They didn't spend as much time here as I did. Sasha still hasn't taken a wife? She inquired politely. No, I told her. And that weird feeling hit me again. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what her deal was. When she smiled, there was a darkness to it. I'm sure he'll find a woman when he is good and ready. Her straight nose tilted up slightly as she looked me over. And I'm sure you'll find a nice Russian boy to tame, soon enough. I smiled graciously, but I did not like the way this woman spoke to me. I also couldn't resist saying, He doesn't have to be Russian. Vic's head snapped up, and I stared him in the eye, my smile positively frosty. I find Russian men of this generation don't match the men of my father's time. Vic's grip tightened on his fork, turning his knuckles white. Shocked the shit out of me, but Ksenia began to nod. I know what you mean, and I agree, my child. Be patient. You'll find one. Vic spoke through gritted teeth. Sit down. Eat. I fought a smile at his suddenly tart mood. It was handy to know it got under his skin as much as he did mine. We can't, sorry. I stepped back, revealing a sad-looking Annika. I put my arm around her and smiled. We've been apart too long, and we need a girl's night. Vic took one look at her face and stood, ready to break necks. Ani, what's wrong? And my ovaries released a million eggs all at once. Nah, stupid, sexy, thoughtful Vic, and his caring about his sister. It's all right. Ani smiled softly. I'm all right, but I'm going to spend the night at Nastasia's, if that's okay, Mama. Dorotea and Yuri exchanged a look, and when Yuri nodded, Dorotea smiled widely. Of course, Biba. Thank you for letting me steal away your lovely daughter. With a wink, I teased. I promise not to let her drink too much tonight. Ksenia smiled a Mona Lisa smile. No such thing. We are Russian women. Drink the men under the table and wear the badge of honor proudly. Where are you going? 
inquired Vic, and his thin lips told me he was going to stew on this. Good. Out, was all I said, as I took Annika's hand, said my goodbyes, and took my friend home with me. Chapter 4 Nastasia As we drove back to my house, I called Mina first. She answered, huffing and puffing, then said, Hey. On speaker, I continued to drive and uttered, Hey yourself, short stuff. What are you doing? Ha uh, ha. She hesitated, then spoke quietly. Just what you told me to. Huh? Confusion swept through me. What had I told her to do? You know, she prompted with meaning. I'm, her voice was full of inflection, enjoying the process. Oh, oh, ew, she was porking my brother. Gross. Right, the word was drawn out. I made a face. You think you can pull yourself away long enough to join me and Annika on a girl's night? Bed sheets rustled, and I knew she moved to sit up. Sounding more than a little eager, she immediately said, Where are we going? A scoff shot out of me. I'm not telling you. You'll go right ahead and tell Lev, then the guys will mysteriously show up, and our girl's night will be ruined. A sound of indignance left her. I won't tell, she sulked. Annika smiled, knowing full well Mina couldn't keep a secret, especially when it came to her husband. A soft laugh left me. I'll tell you when you get here, right after I confiscate your phone. She tried to sound pissed. She really did, but I could tell she was excited. Whatever. Sure, it was Wednesday, but midweek may as well have been a weekend for us. Annika and I were the best bar bitches on this side of town, and while Cora usually joined our duo behind the bar at Bleeding Hearts, her studies had taken a priority of late. This meant she had to move down to one night a week, usually a Sunday. Mina, our beloved gypsy, no longer worked for Bleeding Hearts. Having been gifted a hefty share of her father's inheritance by her brother, she didn't have to work to live anymore, so she made the plunge into freelance photography. It had always been her passion, and to see her living her dream was nice. Really nice, actually. People still came in asking for the gypsy, and although Mina acted indifferent about it, I know it made her giddy to leave her mark on the place. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were work nights for most of us girls, so we rarely got to go out and let our hair down. We were more likely to end up hungover on a hump day than any other day of the week. I have to call Cora, be at my place in an hour, and we'll all get ready together. Okay, Mina said, and then there was a slight scuffle. Lev, no, give it back. And then my brother was talking through the speaker. Nastasia, where do you plan on taking my wife this evening? Annika's face softened at the sound of his voice, and my gut squeezed. I knew it couldn't be easy for her. Ani had always loved Lev. I mean, she lost her virginity to him in the hopes that he would fall for her. She fought for him, but in the end, Mina had won his heart. To her credit, she took it well. Sometimes I think she took it a little too well. My face bunched with indignance. None of your flipping beeswax, brother. Nastasia, Lev uttered in warning, and he really should have known by now that the tone he was using was not one that worked on me. I looked to Ani and rolled my eyes, making her laugh. We're not doing anything dangerous, Lev. We're just having a girl's night out. A girl's night out, he said as if he were processing this. On your own, he muttered, without protection. Yep. No. He said instantly, I don't like that. I loved Lev. Loved him so damn much. He was sweet and kind and would do anything for those closest to him. But yes, he had his quirks. He was also stubborn and set in his ways and overprotective to the point of overstepping. When he got that way, dealing with him required a level of patience that I oftentimes did not have. Lev, I began calmly. Are you saying that I would put Mina, my sister-in-law, my family, in a position where something could happen to her? No, 
he said immediately, and it doused the wrath threatening to boil over. Precisely, I said, then added, you know I would only ever take her somewhere I deemed safe, right? Yes, he sighed, and I smiled knowing he was giving in. I knew he'd given in completely when he said, I want her to text me every hour, Nastasia. Okay, I settled, knowing it was the best I'd get with him. Every hour, Lev repeated. I spoke through gritted teeth, doing my best to not snap at him. I heard you, moi brat. I'll drive you, he added, and I actually laughed out loud. God, he was infuriating. But when Ani made a goopy face and placed a hand to her heart, I quickly acknowledged I could have it a lot worse. My tone light, I told him. You'll do no such thing. We are catching a cab there and back, and Mina will text you every hour to let you know she's okay. That's what's happening, Lev. His momentary silence told me he was struggling, but surprisingly, he let it go. All right. Perfect. I grinned widely, then hurried out. I have to call Cora. Love you. Bye. Before he changed his mind. The second I dialed Cora, she answered, sounding cheery. What's up, bitch? Girls' night out, is all I said. She let out a little whoop. Fuck, yeah. I need to get my head out of these books. I'll be over soon. Then she hung up. Well, that was easy. I breathed deeply, feeling light and happy. Turning to face Annika, I put my hand on hers and squeezed. We're gonna have fun tonight. I know. She responded with a delicate smile. Dinner was nice. Nicer than I expected. I wondered how things between Mina and Annika would be, but I shouldn't have worried. When Mina arrived at my place, she took one look at Annika's sorry state, came forward, and hugged her, taking all the care in the world. Are you okay? Mina asked, gently rubbing her back, and I was quietly reminded that Mina was a beautiful person. Annika looked a little awkward, but it was clear she appreciated the gesture, because when she pulled back, she pasted on a grateful smile. I'll be better when we're all drinking. Not a minute later, my front door shot open. I threw my hands up and groused. Does everyone have a key to my house? While a tiny chorus stood there, her blonde hair tied up into a high ponytail, holding a bottle of tequila. Did someone order a night of getting fucked up? So no one's listening to me? I added, annoyed. Nice. Perfect timing. Mina took a bottle out of her hands and shook it at Annika. Pre-dinner drinks coming right up. Then disappeared into the kitchen. Cora approached Annika, standing in front of her a long moment. Her smile lessened and she asked quietly, You all right, Kukla? Annika thought about it. I am, actually, just being away from home. She shivered, hugging herself. Her expression solemn, the response was whisper quiet. I needed a night away. The way she said it made my heart pause. A big red flag waving frantically behind my eyes. My brow lowered. You know, you can stay here with me, I proposed. I kind of got used to having company. And with Cora gone, I hate to admit it, but I get lonely sometimes. Cora slapped a hand to her chest and let out a long, Aww and I flipped her the bird. Asshole. Annika paused a moment, and I knew she wasn't sure whether my offer was sincere. I put my arms out, gesturing at my enormous home. This is a big house for one person. It's big enough for ten people. I then pursed my lips and conceded. Hell, it's big enough for a small cult. Annika remained quiet, but I could see she was considering it. I could almost see her brain doing the calculations. Finally, she said softly, I'll think about it. Thanks, Naz. I hadn't offered out of pity. I wasn't lying. I really would have loved to have her. Satisfied, I replied. You're welcome. At that moment, Mina came out of the kitchen with a tray of pre-filled shot glasses, sliced lime and salt, then sing-songed, Let's do this. She handed us each a shot with a wedge of lime. We all took turns licking our hands and applying salt. 
And no better way to get a party started than to dirty up some nice girls with tequila slammers. What I said was, hell yeah. But the second I smelled the tequila, my mouth watered. And not in a good way. Like most idiot teenagers, I once got blind drunk on it. And now tequila tasted like the time I almost perished in a field with a bunch of jocks laughing at me. However, my father did not raise no weak-ass bitch. Nope. When they took a shot, I took a shot. It felt like battery acid simmering in my stomach, but my smile remained unwavering, and seeing Annika giggle behind her hand made it worth it. I went upstairs and drew a nice hot bath for her in the ensuite attached to my room. The vanilla lavender-scented bubbles smelled divine and sweet. I put towels within reach, lowered the lights, and turned on the jets. When I spotted Annika hesitating in the open doorway, I said, Take your time, okay? We're in no rush. Her slight nod was enough. I left her to it. But just as I went to exit the bathroom, she called out to me. I turned, and what Annika said broke my heart. I don't know what I'd do without you, Ness. She looked devastated, as if she had already lost me. Her voice shook. You're my best friend. I stepped back into the room and took both her hands in mine, dipping slightly to look her dead in the eyes. Forever and always, babe. Annika shook her head. And she was hyperventilating? Maybe. Huh? Was she crazy? Ani, I started. You'd have to do something pretty freaking bad to lose me as a friend. I know was her hushed reply, eyes bright with unshed tears. Wow, she really was a mess. Exactly, I offered reassuringly with a squeeze to her fingers. I held such confidence in her that I added, never gonna happen. Releasing her hands, I pointed at her ominously and ordered, do not get out of there until you're nicely wrinkled. You hear me? Ani's lip tugged up into a strained smile. Yes, ma'am. I joined Mina and Cora, who were in the process of getting ready. Mina slid her yoga pants down before pulling on dark jeans. Naz, what happened? Is she okay? The quiet, curious questions were ones I didn't have an answer to. I pulled my tea up and over my head as I raided my walk-in closet for something to wear. Your guess is as good as mine. Cora, in her panties and bra, slipped into a pretty black-and-white mini-dress. It showed a lot of skin coming mid-thigh. Poor thing. She looked shaken up. She did. I had never seen her act like this before, as though she was scared of her own shadow. I was not an optimist. I tried to be. I really did. But more than anything, I was a realist. I had learned that when something smelled like shit, there was shit nearby. So when I entered the bathroom without warning, uttering, Sorry, babe, just need to grab my... My heart stopped with my words. The sight of Annika's back had my feet glued to the spot. Unable to speak, my eyes took it all in. Mottled bruises lined her spine and shoulders. The marks on her upper arms had faded to a greenish-yellow color, telling me they had been there a while. What the fuck? was all I managed to get out. Annika's face dipped and she exhaled quietly. It's nothing. Come again? I beg your pardon? The sounds of Cora and Mina talking told me they hadn't heard my exclamation. My legs began to work again and then I was moving. With an air of determination, she sat up straight in the bath and spoke. Really, it's nothing. I couldn't help but notice the way she was avoiding my disturbed gaze. I, uh, started dancing again. What? I frowned skeptically. I'm dancing again, she repeated. My eyes narrowed. You never said anything. Well, irritated, she retorted a little sharply. You haven't really been around, Naz. Her shot met its target, and my gut sank. She was right. I hadn't been. 
pushing down the sudden guilt I felt, I slowly let out a doubtful. You're telling me you look like this from... dance? There was no light in her eyes. Yes. She licked her lips and laughed humorlessly. You'd be surprised how hard it is to get back into it when you've taken seven years off. My body isn't as flexible as it used to be. I've fallen down over and over again. I twisted my ankle last week. It was the reason I wore flats to work. Yeah, I wondered about that. The red flag in my mind continued to wave, but I had no real reason to doubt her. My cynical nature had me asking, You'd tell me if you were in trouble, right? Annika blinked a moment before she looked up at me without an ounce of emotion and said, You're the only person I trust. My bullshit meter went off when I noticed she didn't quite answer my question. My love for my friend, however, told me that Annika wouldn't keep secrets. Not from me. Calming slightly, I took another look at her back, and out came a brutally honest, You look like shit, babe. Annika laughed then. A real laugh. Musical, tinkling laughter. And the longer it went on, the tightness in my stomach loosened. Even more so when she looked at me and the warmth had returned to her eyes. I know. I loved Annika. She wasn't just a friend, she was family. And I protected my family. If anyone even attempted to hurt her, I would kill them without hesitation. I worry about you, I disclosed grudgingly. Immediately, she returned, I worry about you? A sharp brow rising with meaning. Yeah, okay, I got the point. We had to communicate better. I blew out a long breath. I've been a shitty friend. No, she shook her head. I should have pushed harder. Made you talk to me. So I guess I wasn't the only one feeling lacking and guilt-ridden. When Annika was finished with her bath, I helped her into a high-necked, tight black dress with long sleeves that hid her bruises. My every instinct yelled at me to keep a closer eye on my friend. And if I found something was wrong, not even God could stop me from getting answers. Annika exited the bathroom, and while Mina whooped, Cora let out a wolf whistle. Like the awesome people they were, they hyped Annika up until she was laughing awkwardly, completely red in the face with nonstop compliments. Once I outfitted myself in the little dusty rose dress that came off the shoulders and into long sleeves, I slipped into nude peep-toe heels and grabbed my matching nude clutch. With a final look in the mirror, I fluffed my hair, the long dark tresses falling down my back in waves, then applied a mauve pink lipstick and we were good to go. It was 8 p.m. when we arrived at a little Italian place none of us had been to before, and one look at the menu had me salivating. It had all my favorites. Carbs, carbs, and more carbs. Our food arrived, and we ate enthusiastically. We talked loudly to be heard over the dinner crowd, laughing with each other. The going consensus was that we all officially loved this restaurant. Another few drinks and easy conversation followed. When I got up to use the restroom, I sneakily took care of the check, much to the annoyance of the girls. Whatever, they'd get over it. Close to 10 p.m., we all hopped in a cab and arrived at our destination soon after. My stomach clenched in excitement as we skipped the line and headed on in. It was the hottest nightclub in New York, and lucky for us, my cousins owned it. Smiling, laughing, and chatting away, we eagerly entered the White Rabbit. Chapter 5 Nastasia the club was packed, and the sea of bodies on the dance floor seemed to move as one in waves along to the thick, sticky beat of the music. Anticipation bubbled up inside me. I knew I wasn't the only one because we all just stood there, smiling down at the throng of patrons. We needed to let loose. Needed it. If we were going to let our hair down anywhere, this was the place. The Alice in Wonderland-themed nightclub had a reputation for being elite, and you could see why. 
The big black and white tiles on the dance floor warped and swayed, twisting, becoming smaller and smaller as it reached the middle, opening up to the illusion of falling down a hole. A rabbit hole, to be precise. There was a colossal statue of the Cheshire Cat to the right that people lined up to take selfies with. Servers in all shapes, sizes, and colors walked around in skimpy costumes holding trays. They were either dressed as Alice, in long blonde wigs, tiny blue pinafore dresses with puffy sleeves, white fishnets, and white pumps, or they were dressed as sexy white rabbits, hair up in a high ponytail with a poofy white tail, long fluffy ears, white stockings, and a black painted nose with whiskers. Pride I had no business feeling swept through me. So sue me. Lyakovs knew how to run a club. I took Annika's hand. She clasped Cora's. Cora entwined her fingers in Mina's, and I led them to the left of the dance floor. I let him know we were coming, and as expected, he was waiting for us at the entrance of the VIP section. Nikolai Lyakov, my cousin and owner of the White Rabbit, smiled widely at the sight of me, and the second I spotted those trademark Lyakov dimples, I picked up my pace, my walk turning into a jog. The moment I was close enough, he opened his arms and I threw myself into them, laughing happily. I didn't care if I seemed eager. I did not get to see my cousins often. We all had businesses to run, and in the case of Nick, he played the role of doting father to a growing family during the day. His gruff chuckle warmed my ear, and he rocked me side to side, then kissed my hair. I closed my eyes, breathing him in. His scent was uniquely Nick, expensive leather and sandalwood. There was something about him. Whether it was his height or build or honey-warm gaze, he had the ability to make you feel safe, untouchable. I wasn't bullshitting my brother. I would never put my friends or family in harm's way. And with Nick watching out for us, the White Rabbit was a safe place. We were protected within these walls. No one was going to mess with ex-members of the firm. Music blaring, Nick pulled back to look me over. His eyes crinkled in the corners. Damn, I still can't believe you went from knobby need to catwalk model. Firstly, oh, how sweet. Secondly, hey! I punched his arm, feigning outrage, but I couldn't stop myself from laughing. I was never knobby need, thank you very much. And from behind Nick came, yeah, you were. I never met someone who had to groan to their knees before. A grinning Max Lyakov, Nick's brother, came into view, and my heart was so full to bursting. With a happy squeak, I jumped and he caught me chuckling. He squeezed me tight, holding the back of my head with a gentle hand. You look good, sweetheart. When Max set me down, I pressed a long, noisy kiss to his cheek, then used my thumb to wipe away the lipstick stain I left there. I missed you guys. Looking around, I asked, Where are your women? It had been a while since I'd seen the girls. Tina, Nick's wife, was the sweetest thing you'd ever met. She reminded me of Annika. Helena, Max's wife, was so darn cute and hilarious. Nat was the fiery redhead married to Asher, Nick and Max's adopted brother. She and I were so alike, it was scary. Then came Lola, the small brunette with a contagious smile. Her husband was Diego, better known as Trick, Nick and Max's cousin from their mom's side. And finally, there was Mimi all-around badass who just happened to prefer a taco over a hot dog. Nick's expression turned soft. They're not here tonight. And when my face fell, he put up his hands in a placating gesture. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. Blame them for becoming moms. Someone's got to wrangle the little tears, agreed Max, who then added with a light chuckle. And I sure as fuck ain't qualified for the job. Yeah, I got it. It sucked, but they were mamas and had different priorities now. Well, I allowed with a smile, at least I got to see you guys. You know you don't need an invitation, Naz, Max chided. Nick quickly agreed. You're welcome to come by whenever you want. Tina and the girls would love to see you. God, they were sweet. Genuinely thankful for the offer, I uttered, I'd really like that. You could definitely tell Nick and Max were brothers. They had the same olive-toned skin, courtesy of their mom, dark hair, and they both bore the Lyakov whiskey-gold eyes. But more than that, 
Their smiles were identical, and while Nick had a single dimple tugging at his cheek, Max had two. Undoubtedly, many a woman found themselves head over heels for these men, and don't get me wrong, I got it. My cousins were kind of gorgeous. And their sisters? <laughs> Whoa, stunners. Max spotted the girls behind me. Oh shit, he said teasingly. There's more of them. Both men greeted the girls with hugs and kisses, leaving them breathless. And for some unknown reason, when Max kissed Mina's cheek and called her baby cuz, her cheeks turned red and she giggled. Loudly. They escorted us upstairs to the exclusive closed-off section of the club, and when a white rabbit approached wearing sheer white tights and heels, whiskers and all, Nick told her, Carrie, these girls are family. Carrie seemed to understand what that meant, because she smiled, then inclined her head. Yes, Mr. Lyakov. I'm sorry to leave you, but I got some shit to take care of. You ladies have a good night, and if you need me for anything, Nick motioned to the tall, blonde bartender. Tell Sheriff, and he'll let me know, okay? Nick and Max said their goodbyes, and the friendly waitress asked, What can I get you to drink? We prattled off our order, and when the woman returned with our glass slipper shots, I took out my wallet. Placing a silken gloved hand over mine, Carrie smiled with meaning. Family doesn't pay, ma'am. We don't? The girls stilled, and then Cora probed. They don't? No, the cute waitress held back a laugh. Immediately, Cora leaned forward and stated, Then I'm gonna need another two rounds of these things. I slapped her arm. No, you don't. I turned to Carrie. No, she doesn't. But the waitress just winked at me, then replied to Cora. Coming right up. We watched her walk away, and I spun to glare at Cora. Knowing she was being a shit, she turned out her hands, the very picture of innocence, and chuckled. What? You're unbelievable, I muttered, and she picked up a glass, shooting it down with a grin and wince. She was lucky I loved her. Taking a quick pick of her, I sent it to a man who didn't deserve her, then placed a glass in front of Mina, then Annika. Drink up, ladies, and don't worry about a damn thing. I'm on duty tonight, and I promise to hold your hair out of your faces while you barf. Cora put a hand to her heart and tutted. And they say chivalry is dead. Annika didn't need further encouragement. With an eager smile, she downed the shot in one gulp, then made a face. I feel better already. Not wanting to be left behind, Mina threw the glass back, winced, then coughed out. Me too. My phone vibrated in my hand. Alessio. Would you fucking stop already? I snickered to myself. Me. No. Heart emoji. Another round of shots was thrown back, and for once I was quite happy to sit back and watch my girls have a great time. I wished we lived in a world where four women dressed the way we were, drinking and having a good time could be guaranteed their safety but too many times had women been blamed for things that happened to them while under the influence, using what they were wearing as an excuse. Tonight, I would be their sentry. So, Annika. Cora got right into it, peering across the booth with mischievous eyes. You got your eye on anyone at the moment? The apples of her cheeks blushed prettily, and when she picked up another shot, I figured she wasn't going to answer that question. But she took the shot like a boss, then slammed the glass down onto the table and wheezed out. There is one guy. Was one guy. My ears perked. That got my attention real quick. Who? Came out of my mouth immediately, and it came out loud. Annika rolled her shoulder, seeming to regret her admission. It's not important. She let out a light laugh, but there was no humor in it. It doesn't matter. I messed up there, waited too long. He doesn't want me anymore. Huh? That was not plausible. Annika was basically the ideal woman. She was loving and gentle. I'd literally seen men fall over themselves just to be awarded a second of her attention. But of course, she remained modest. It was frustrating as shit that she had no idea of her appeal. She was so oblivious at times, it hurt. Mina frowned in confusion. You're smart and pretty and loyal. How could he not want you? 
The moment Annika responded bitterly with, Lev didn't want me. A look of stunned surprise left her, and her mouth gaped. Mina, I... My brain slapped a hand to its mouth to muffle the howling scream that came out. Oh, no. She did not just say that. But Mina, the saint, just waved her off. We're not talking about Lev. We're talking about your elusive beau. You said he doesn't want you anymore. That means he did at one point. She prodded gently. What changed? Yeah. Curiosity had always been my downfall. I turned my entire body to face Annika. What changed? The alcohol had loosened her lips. Her brows bunched and her lips pulled down, her expression full of regret. I said some things to him. Things I thought I meant at the time, but I didn't. I guess I said what I said because I was scared of his intensity, and now there is no second chance. She shrugged, and a watery smile wobbled at her lips. We can't go back. No, it couldn't be over before it began. Annika was sunshine and joy, and she deserved happiness. I refuse to believe there's nothing you can do, I stated, leaning in. Another shot gone, and Annika licked her lips, blinking slowly as the liquor did its thing. Trust me. It's finished. He tried, he fought, and all I did was reject him over and over. And this guy? She looked at each of us. He isn't the type to forgive and forget. Who is he? I asked, curiosity getting the better of me. Annika responded. Someone who finally realized I'm not worthy of him. She looked dismal her fingers playing with an empty shot glass. And he's right. I'm a terrible person. No, Mina said, putting a consoling hand on hers. If you want him, there has to be a way. I'll bet you haven't even tried. The waitress brought eight more shots and placed them on the table. I smiled at her in thanks and watched Cora push another in front of Annika before downing her own. Mina's right. There has to be something you can do. What have you tried? Annika's words began to slur. Oh, yeah, she was hammered. I've tried, she insisted with a finger to her chest. I have. I've tried talking to him. She wore a look of annoyance. But he's so aloof, so damn polite, you know? Like, I know you're mad at me. Just yell at me already so we can kiss and make up. Because I want to kiss him. She turned to look at me, her eyes lightly glazed. I want to kiss him, Naz. Then you're gonna kiss him, I vowed, reaching out to squeeze her fingers. You promise? Ani looked so hopeful that a tender smile stretched at my lips. I promise! but we can't help unless you tell us who it is. Annika was already shaking her head. I can't. It's too much. It would change everything. I didn't understand. Why would it change everything? Unless... My face void of expression, my mind worked a mile a minute. No. She couldn't mean who I thought she meant. She... She couldn't. Could she? And while my brain shot formulas all over as I tried to figure out who this mysterious man was, Cora chimed in. Well, talking isn't going to do the trick, but there is something you could do. She toyed with another shot, her eyes losing focus as she slowly nodded. I think the answer is clear, Ani. It is? Ani asked quietly wide-eyed in anticipation. Of course. Cora grinned then. You're just gonna have to seduce him. Annika blinked. She blinked a long minute before she burst into laughter. Almost hysterically, she exclaimed, I can't do that. And we all grinned at her hilarity. Her laughter slowed, then stopped, and her expression turned serious as she asked conspiratorially, 
Can I do that? I thought about it a second. Fuck it, I said, egging her on. What do you have to lose? Annika scoffed. Only my dignity and self-respect, she muttered irritably. Sex changes things, Mina added. It could go either way. It might ruin things or rekindle what you lost, but her lips pursed. It is the kind of extreme he won't be expecting from you. I think the action speaks volumes. Annika tilted her head, nodding lightly while taking in every opinion. Cora clapped, then laughed. I knew you bitches would be team stealthy sex. She focused on Annika. Look, it's easy, babe. You just need the element of surprise. Even better if you corner him. She waggled her brows at Ani. Maintain eye contact. Take your panties off real slow and throw them at him. The rest is up to him. Trust me, you'll know real quick if he's down or not. Well, I never. I frowned to myself, then realization hit. My eyes widened as a slow grin spread on my face. I swiveled to face Cora full on. You've done this before, haven't you, you little skank? Sure, I acted holier than thou, but the truth was, I wasn't at all surprised. Cora was very free-thinking when it came to sex, and she did not believe that sharing your body with somebody you didn't know very well made the experience a cheap one. Having lost out on intimacy from her family, she found it where she could, and I did not judge her for that. Intimacy was my lifeblood. Cora smiled fox-like, but went on. The next step is to turn your sweet little ass around, bend over like a cat in heat, and wait. Her eyes sparkled, and she licked her lips seductively. Cora's confidence was a treat. The move has yet to fail me. I swear to God. Annika's brow rose, and she pinched her lip absently. Oh, this little fish was intrigued by the bait dangling in front of her nose. She was thinking about it all right. I don't know. Her tone bled with uncertainty. Stop thinking so hard, ordered Cora. Just do it. Her expression softened. How badly do you want this guy? You have no idea, was her breathy reply, and I could basically see all the cogs turning in her mind, until finally a small smile tipped Annika's lips. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Yay! I exclaimed happily, taking her arm and shaking it excitedly, laughing as she groaned, seemingly in regret. You're gonna have hot sex with a hot guy and reel him in with pussy power. Wow, Mina's eyes widened comically. You are braver than I am. Oh, hush, Cora waved Mina's skepticism off then slipped out of the booth. Now we're going downstairs to dance, and Annika is going to practice flirting. No, I'm not, Annika protested, a mild frown on her face, but Cora was already pulling her to her feet. Cora just grinned. Sure you are, babe. Left alone at our table, Mina grinned, then held her hand out to mine. I took it with a smirk. We made our way downstairs, ignoring the blatant and hungry stares of the men we passed along the way. The minute we hit the dance floor, I swayed to the music, hypnotized by the steady beat. It didn't take long before I felt someone press up against my back. At first, I thought it was a mistake, but when I looked back, a frown pulled down my mouth. The tall man winked down at me, dancing close enough to feel my ass against his crotch. Uh, excuse me, sir? Are you lost? My glare was lethal as I turned around, and the single word I spoke sliced harshly, sharp enough to decapitate. No. I had to give it to him. He didn't even flinch. Just put his lips to my ear and said, oh, Come on, you can't dress like that and not want attention. It's the middle of the week and you're at a club. I know what you're looking for. I got it right here. He looked down at my cleavage. Just giving you what you want, baby. My brain flatlined, and white noise enveloped the space between my ears. Fury rose up to engulf me as a whole. 
I was surprised no one could see the hellfire licking and whipping around me. You dirty fucker. The guy obviously had no idea what he put into motion when he grabbed my hips, spun me, and pulled me back into his growing erection. My body turned rigid. I bit the inside of my cheek hard enough to taste blood and silently prayed for patience. Unfortunately, my prayers often went unanswered. It's okay. Take a breath. Calm down. You got this. All at once, my shoulders fell, and my body turned lax. I pasted on a lusty smile and slowly turned to face him again. Peering up at his mouth, licking my bottom lip, I moved closer. The way his smile widened told me he thought he was getting lucky tonight. Oh, you poor, silly man. The distraction clearly worked, because when I rested my hand on the fly of his pants, his lips parted and his eyes lowered again to the valley between my breasts, I guess he misunderstood where this was going, because when I seized his junk, a look of shock took over his face. Then his squeal of agony sounded. I squeezed, digging my nails in, clutching his dick harder. What's the matter? You were rubbing up against me. You want this, right? I blinked up into his face, narrowed my eyes, and uttered innocuously, Just giving you what you're asking for baby. The minute the guy's friends tried to intervene, the girls jumped in, arguing, pointing, and yelling. And I merely looked him in the eye, my grip never wavering. For future reference, when a lady says no, she means it. This is not up for negotiation. Cora put her hands up to block one of his friends, then smirked. What's the matter, gorgeous? Don't like being touched? Maybe you should have worn something less revealing. Doubled over in pain, a string of spit dribbled down his chin as he bellowed, Let go, you crazy bitch! Unblinking, I held him tightly. Apologize, I demanded, bored-like. Mina slapped at one of the guys reaching for me. Get your hands off her! The asshole tried desperately to shake my hand off. I'm sorry, he panted out, then louder. I'm sorry, fuck! Security arrived the moment I released him. Without taking my eyes off the dirt bag, I watched his friends become outraged at the fact that they were the ones getting escorted out. Are you serious? The groper, his red eyes rimmed in wetness, pointed at me and thundered, She's the one who attacked me! An arm came around me, and Annika shocked me by adding a very drunk, very snarky, Oh, honey, you'd be so much prettier if you smiled. Mina, still panting, gaped at her. Cora snuffled out a laugh, and when I swung my head to look at my bestie, I couldn't stop myself from chuckling. What? Annika blinked one eye at a time, wobbling on the spot. He was an asshole. Turned out, a drunk Annika was a sassy Annika. Our night resumed, and instead of having ruined my evening, the incident with the jerk seemed to break the only string of poise I had holding me together— Adrenaline running through me, I laughed more openly than I had in years, and a playful attitude I don't think I ever embodied took over. We danced for what felt like hours. The girls continued to drink, and when we moved to the center of the dance floor, my eyes unconsciously moved toward the entrance. I stilled completely. Uh, what in the freaking shit? God damn it. Annoyed, my lips thinned. Okay, who was it? Which one of these fuckers did it? With pursed lips and a gut full of anger, I scanned my surroundings to find the culprit. My eyes passed over Mina, the most likely perpetrator. She winked at me, swaying to the music, dancing without a care. Hmm, no. When I peered at Cora, she licked her lips invitingly, then blew me a kiss, bopping along to the song. Okay not her. Annika, dancing offbeat to a song only she could hear, didn't even look like she could operate her phone at the moment. Definitely not. And then it hit me with the force of a knee to the gut. My eyes shot upward to the VIP section, and when I saw Nick and Max exchange a chin jerk with the three dark, looming men who just entered the club, my jaw tightened. Bingo. 
putting my hands to my hips, my mouth gaped at their disloyal, traitorous selves, and as though my cousins could feel my gaze burning holes into them, they both looked down at me at the very same time. The second they saw my furious expression, they panicked. While Max ducked out of sight, Nick scrambled, pointed toward a corner of the club, suddenly rambling as if he'd been in conversation the entire time. It took him a minute to realize his brother abandoned him, and when he finally noticed, he did a double-take at the empty spot next to him. My brow rose in question. Knowing he was had, he pinched the bridge of his nose before looking down at me apologetically and mouthing, I'm sorry. Sure you are, you big jerk. Our girls' night was officially over. Chapter 6 Nastasia The car stopped in front of my house and I stumbled my tipsy ass out, making my way around to help Annika out at the very same time Vic did. We reached for the door simultaneously, our fingers brushing, and when I pulled back as though I'd been zapped, his stoic stare landed on me with the weight of a building, and it did not have the desired effect. I think it was meant to be cautionary, but damn, it was kind of sexy. My core clenched with longing, and I was a little pissed at myself, mostly. I was also buzzed in a really mellow way. Astoundingly, the night didn't end when Vic and my brothers got to the White Rabbit. I expected a scene. I didn't get one. I predicted the cold fury of my brothers. That didn't happen. And when the guys simply acknowledged us, then took a seat at the bar, it somehow felt more foreboding than if they just approached us and ordered us home. My brothers, both looking flawless in suits, sat while Vic, dressed in black fitted jeans and a navy shirt unbuttoned one too many buttons, revealing the dove taking flight inked onto his broad chest, simply stood with his back to the bar, his eternally hooded gaze watching us closely. My stomach dipped. I wanted to climb him like a tree and take a bite of his banana. Ugh, unfair. The girls were having a good time, and I was not ready for the night to be over. Surely they could be reasonable. I had my doubts, but I was willing to try for the sake of our girls' night. On edge and anticipating a fight, I tramped over to them, leaving the girls on the dance floor. Three sets of impassive eyes trained on me, and I rushed out and irritated. It wasn't a big deal. I took care of it. Sasha, unfazed by my anger, lifted a brow and spoke evenly. I know. We heard. Whatever I was going to follow up with left my vocabulary. Okay, then. Confusion coded my voice. Then why are you here? Drinks were placed in front of them. Lev responded, We thought you might like an escort home. Aha! I knew it. Hackles rising, I hastily cried, We're not ready to leave yet. And when Lev blinked at me, then responded, All right, we'll wait. My balloon, full to the point of bursting, was let go, air rushing out as my exasperation quelled. Right. Good. I was winning. Why did this feel wrong? Unsure of this entire situation, my shoulders fell and I uttered quiet and hesitant. You didn't have to come. I'm not drinking. I've got this. Vic was having none of my attitude. We didn't have to come. We wanted to. When my insecure expression met his cool one, I paused and he went on. I know you're more than capable of looking after your own ass. The statement was placated in the same way a cool stream of water soothed a mild burn. He looked me up and down, an appreciative hint to his gaze. But I'm happy to watch it too, Kiska. Kiska. Kitten. The grin he ended on made my entire torso turn to jelly. Oh no. He was doing that thing I liked. The thing that made me want to throw myself onto the floor in cow pose and look back at him invitingly. Talking. With his mouth. 
Lord help me, he hadn't shaved, and I liked that too. Internally, I broke down, feigned crying, and stomped my feet like a child throwing a tantrum over a stuffed toy they couldn't have. My eyes dipped to his lips, and for a second, I stopped breathing. I could almost feel his stubble against the delicate skin of my neck. He looked like a snack, and I was damn near starving, in some places more than others. You're just thirsty. Get a grip. Leaning back with an air of confidence, he jerked his chin toward the dance floor, and I wanted to step forward and run my tongue along his sharp jawline. Drink. Dance. We'll be here when you're ready to go. I hesitated. Vic rolled his eyes and huffed out an annoyed breath before reaching for the bar and handing me a bright blue shot. It's okay. I've got you. I've got you. He did. He always had. And that was the problem. I didn't know a life without him. I examined the shot and my heart turned gooey. It was a blue kamikaze. He remembered. Lev's face softened, and as Mina rushed past me with a little squeal of happiness, throwing herself into my brother's waiting arms, I watched their lips connect and my own curled. And there went one of our party. The longer they kissed, the larger my frown grew. Throwing back the shot, I slammed it onto the bar, my front skimming Vic's hard body, before snatching Mina out of Lev's arms. My brother's glare was deadly, but I didn't give a flying, flipping shit. All I said was, no, this is our night. You will not seduce your wife away from us. Do you hear me, Lev? At Lev's unhappy face, Mina stretched for him. I pulled her out of reach. But when Cora stumbled into my back with an, oops, I threw Mina right back into her husband's arms. Mina looked up at my brother with hearts in her eyes and muttered tenderly, hi, baby. Sasha glared. Lev immediately softened, drawing his tipsy wife close. Hello, mouse, was his sickly sweet response, and Mina was lost to him. I clicked my tongue, my heart. Also, stop. Cora slid into the small space by Lev, then leaned over the bar, calling out, I'm thirsty. Whose sausage do I have to suck to get another round over here? Annika stumbled over, and Vic stepped forward to offer his sister his hand. I shouldn't have noticed the way his strong arm flexed, but really, how could I miss it? She gripped it tight, smiling up at him affectionately, and revealed in a loud whisper, I'm drunk, ending with a tinkling laugh. Vic sat her down on a stool, and his lips tipped up in a smile reserved only for his sister. I can see that. With Annika sandwiched safely between Vic and Sasha, Cora placed a shot into my hand, and because I was too busy wondering what color boxers Vic was wearing, I almost downed it without looking. So when Vic glanced over and took the glass out of my hands with a frown, one could say I was a little perturbed. Hey! I started. But just when I opened my mouth to let him know what I thought about his helicopter parenting, he handed the shot back to Cora and when I heard what he said, I was very close to throwing myself at him. Anything but tequila. It makes her pukey. Fruity drinks are mixers. My frozen heart melted a little. Excuse me, sir. Cease and desist. A moment later, another blue kamikaze was handed to me, and as I blinked down at it, I had the insane urge to cry because it was the little things that made Vic special, that made him irreplaceable. He took care of me in a way that made me believe he loved me. But it was just wishful thinking. Annika turned to Sasha, gripped the front of his shirt, and jerked him down to speak directly into his ear. I didn't know what she said, but Sasha's stoic face turned soft, and a smile threatened to show itself. But as quickly as it came, it went and his impassive expression returned with a vengeance. Mina was happy to remain in her husband's arms. Cora retold the story of how I almost emasculated a man in the middle of the dance floor, and she did so with great enthusiasm, 
earning me an appreciative once-over from Vic that made my insides flip-flop. And I just stood there with a warming belly and sadness in my eyes. So, that was that. I officially lost my girls to the three men whose gravity had always pulled people into the atmosphere surrounding them. I should have been mad, but I wasn't. All we had was each other. This little group of ours couldn't afford to get much smaller. I assumed the night was at an end. I could not have been more wrong. Nope. Six shots later, I was caught up with the girls and a cozy thrum vibrated in and around me. My head felt light, my eyes grew heavy, and the longer I peered at the aloof man in the jeans that did nothing to hide his size, the closer I pushed into him. His chin dipped, and although his expression came off as hollow, the heat in his gaze gave him away and warmed my anxious stomach. This thing I was feeling, this sticky, relentless desire. It had to be mutual. It just had to be. I know this because when his heavy brows lowered at the sight of my cleavage as I leaned over the bar to place another order, he pulled me back slightly into him. I felt the front of him press into my spine. The heat of his body had my nipples budding. The fabric of his shirt against the bare skin of my neck was overwhelmingly stimulating. His warm breath heated the shell of my ear. Get any action tonight? A muted grin stretched my mouth. Was he jealous? He sounded jealous. There were so many ways I could respond to that. I could lower my eyes and shake my head submissively. I could be cool and aloof, showing him that I didn't much care for his asking. Or maybe I would tell him I had, just to screw with him. But when I turned leisurely, making sure my body swept against the length of his in a most tantalizing way, I tilted my head to look up at his gorgeous, brooding face and almost choked on my tongue. I found I didn't have the will to mess with him tonight. His open palm touched the curve of my hip, kneading and caressing the flesh through the thin fabric of my dress with a tenderness that made my chest ache and I wanted to rub up against him lazily in the most feline way. His bored scrutiny spoke loudly. He wanted an answer. That much was clear. Of all the things I could have said, that I should have said, I chose the truth. My eyes dropped to his tight grip on my hip. I returned my gaze to him before slowly searching the dark shadows of his face. He looked drained. Not from the person I wanted. A moment passed between us. Heavy. Suffocatingly so. Oh, yeah. His glacial inspection of my pouty mouth had my tongue swelling. It was hard to speak. I breathed out. Yeah. Vic turned to block my body from the others the large hand at my waist rounding slowly to rest on the curve of my ass, his fingertips burning a trail over my skin. Damn near breathless, I blamed what I said on the alcohol. I moved with meaning, placing a gentle hand on his stomach. I toyed with the buttons there and felt his abs twitch in response. Come home with me. I wasn't a complete moron. I knew sex wouldn't solve our problems, but we were both consenting adults, and I was feeling it. Could I have looked for some unnamed Joe and fucked it out? Sure, I could, but I didn't want sex with anyone but Vic. Being intoxicated made me brave enough to admit that. A pain look crossed his face, and then he groaned, and it was a sound so familiar from a time when an identical groan was triggered by my release and how well my body milked him, that I bit my lip and slid a hand down my body to cut myself. His eye flashed, and he gripped my wrist hard, stopping me from reaching my center. Baby, don't. His words were harsh, but his eyes regretful. If you weren't drunk, 
we wouldn't even make it that far. Leaning in, he kept his heated look on me, his voice rough. I'd take you back to my car, sit you down on my cock, and make your ass bounce till you cream. My full lips parted at the explicit scene that flashed in my mind. Oh God, I wanted that. I wanted it so bad. Now, right now, let's go. My expression must have been eager because Vic's lips thinned, and when he shook his head, my insides shriveled, then died of mortification. Not gonna happen. Not tonight. Not tonight? Oh, God, this was the first time he had ever turned me down. Humiliation fell over me like thick black tar. Don't look at me like that, he said, his tone severe but his eyes soft. I'm not going to take advantage of you, Kiska, no matter how badly you want it. This is what you wanted, Naz. Space. Was it? Sure. Only now that I had it, I hated the distance between us. It was cold and lonely in that space I so desired. I felt isolated without him. Deserted. Abandoned. It felt unnatural, just wrong. Like part of my heart left me. Oh, shit. Don't you dare, Naz. My eyes prickled. Don't you dare cry. I stepped back away from him with my arms by my sides and confessed quietly. I feel like I've lost my best friend. Vic's face gentled in a way that made my heart sink deep into my gut. And when he opened his mouth to respond, I waited. His mouth closed. It opened once more, but nothing came out. Yep, that was about the size of it. My eyes sad, I nodded slowly. My nose tingled and I forced a smile. Rejection was an awful feeling, and we both drowned in it, pulling each other under, trying in vain to take in a gasping breath before we expired. Now, as Vic helped a giggling Annika out of the car, I watched in silence as he carefully walked her into the house. Take a step he uttered patiently. And another. There you go. Almost there. I quickly moved to unlock the front door, allowing him entrance. His body filled the open doorway, and a flash memory of him grinning down at me, blocking access to the house until I stepped on my tiptoes, wrapped my arms around his neck, and pulled him down to kiss me, assaulted me. He carefully walked his sister up the stairs, knowing well enough where my room was. Seeing as he had spent a thousand and one nights in there with me, locked away from the world, locked in each other's embrace. I didn't follow. I waited in the hall. He returned and walked right past me. My soul cried out for him, but my mouth refused to relay the emotion, having given too much tonight with zero return. He reached the doorway and faltered, pausing mid-step. Without looking back, his whiskey-smooth voice washed over me like a cooling rain on a summer's day. For what it's worth, I miss you too. It fed me, that little tidbit. A tiny morsel thrown at a starving woman. And as much as it nourished, it poisoned he closed the door behind him and the click of the latch echoed in the open space. I felt so final that I began to cry. With a heavy heart, I looked down at the tiles in the foyer through blurry eyes and sniffled. Poor shit. It took me a minute to get myself under control, but when I finally did, a sigh of resignation left me as I made my way up the stairs. In my room, I found Annika lying on the bed in her dress with her shoes kicked off. The small jerky movements let me know she was still awake. So, being the friend I was, I groaned as I pulled her droopy body up in an attempt to undress her. Up you get. Her head flopped from side to side and she sulked, 
I'm tired. Unzipping her dress, I worked the sleeves down her arms and laughed under my breath. I know you are, Kukla. Let me get you into something more comfortable and you can sleep your little heart out. Okay. She yawned sweetly. I struggled to work a nighty over her head, and when she threw herself back on the bed, I slid her dress down her legs, leaving the nighty pooling around her stomach. Look, it was as good as it was gonna get. With a little swat to her hip, I whispered, You're good to go, babe. Get some sleep. Another yawn. Then she managed to surprise me with a weary sounding, Nastasia, why don't you love Vic anymore? A record scratched in my head. My heart skipped a beat, not only at the bluntness of her question, but at how wrong her assumption was. I peered out into the darkness a moment before I moved to switch on the lamp and found her glazed eyes blinking up at me as she pulled the covers up to her neck. I didn't know what to say. Annika and I had this unwritten rule since we were teenagers that we simply didn't talk about my relationship with her brother. But the fact that she asked suddenly had me desperate to talk about it, or more accurately, to explain myself. Honesty always came easy for me, but right then, the words grated so hard they hurt. You aren't asking the right question, Ani. I pulled myself back against the headboard, hugging my knees tightly. You should be asking why Vic is so scared to commit. She lifted herself up onto her elbow, her mouth pulled down. Her expression accused me of being crazy. Scared to commit? She threw herself back down on the bed, making a sound I can only describe as half laugh, half groan. When she stopped, she let out an incredulous, Vic has been committed to you since forever, Naz. What are you talking about? I knew Ani well enough to know she didn't mean it to sound mocking, but it did. This was hard for me. Talking about it only made me feel small and inferior. But maybe if she knew, she'd let it go. Here goes nothing. My throat thick, I disclosed. When you commit to someone, you don't sleep around. Annika still. She didn't move or say anything for a long moment. And when she found her voice, it was faint but unwavering. Vic has never, will never, would never cheat on you. Oh, Annika. Poor, naive Annika. See? This was why we didn't talk about Vic. And maybe it was the alcohol or the rejection I don't know, but my chest tightened and I felt the cool trail of a tear escaping me. Annika struggled to sit up, watching my face blinking slowly as she fought off the pull of sleep. I'm serious, Naz. I don't know who told you he had, but I'm telling you right now it never happened. I wouldn't lie to you. My lips trembled as I forced out a bitter laugh. Listen, I may not be a genius, but it sure as fuck doesn't take one to know that when a man goes out at 2 a.m., doesn't let you come over to his apartment anymore, and sneaks into your bed at dawn, then something ain't right. How do you explain that? His apartment? She whispered, and it was odd the way she said it. My friend looked down at her hands, hesitating. Next time she spoke, it came out gruff. Oh, God, I'm going to kill him. She licked her lips, avoiding my narrowed gaze. You should talk to him. That was it. That was her grand advice? Talk to him? Just, I don't know, ask whether or not he slept with other women? Ha! <laughs> I'd rather run through a field of poison ivy wearing nothing but a pair of flip-flops. But... I re-ran what she said, replayed it over and over, listened deeply and heard something she wasn't telling. She said it as though she knew something, something I was missing. And a big ball of doubt rested on my shoulders. What are you saying, Ani? 
My suspicions were confirmed when she prompted quietly. It's not for me to explain, Nastasia. Maybe you should have aired your concerns and spoken to Vic about this. What I will say is that in all the time you've known us, in the almost thirteen years you and Vic have been you and Vic, have you ever seen him look at another woman the way he looks at you? Had I? Surely I had. I ran through my memories and... Well, no. I guess I hadn't. Our problems began when he started keeping things from me. Communication had always been our strong suit. But during the last six weeks of our relationship, he started to act strangely. Whenever I would text, he would respond hours later and offer no excuse for the delay. I would call, and he'd quietly tell me he couldn't talk at the moment, that he'd call me back later. Only he never would. He would come over, and it was like he wasn't even here with me. He wasn't present. He was often tired and sulky, then fell asleep in my bed while I silently wondered which girl he spent the night with to cause him such exhaustion. Doubt set in. It set in deep. It ruined us. Annika looked me dead in the eye and said, My brother is a lot of things. Victor is stubborn. He is proud, and let me tell you, I think he's beginning to understand that his pride may have cost him the one thing in life that actually meant something to him. You. Oh, balls. Why did I swiftly get the feeling I didn't have all the facts? I straightened. Talk to me, Annika, if you know something. But she cut me off. I've already said too much. I promised I wouldn't get involved. Her expression apologetic, she admitted. But it's hard, Naz. You're miserable. He is miserable. Please, she beseeched. Don't tell him I said anything. Just, she thought about it. Talk to him. My heart didn't race, but I was hyper aware of the steady, heavy thump in my chest. No, she couldn't do that. That wasn't fair. Because if what she was saying was true, it changed things. And as I lost myself for a while, pondering all she said, I turned to ask her one more question. When I heard her light snuffling and took in her closed eyes. Damn it. Annika's shot found its mark in my heart. And like the hellcat I was, curiosity got the better of me. I was an idiot. It was the only excuse I had for standing off to the side of Vic's apartment door, practicing exactly what I would say. My gut clenched at the possibility of being unwelcome here. What the hell am I doing? My eyes snapped shut and my palm landed against my forehead with a light slap. I felt stupid and desperate and resentful all at once. Shaking my head, I began to pace, licked my lips and let out a barely there... Okay, you can do this. No pain, no gain. My anxious stomach turned, and I swallowed hard, then whispered to myself, Hi. Hello, Vic. Ew, what the hell was that? I cringed, then tried again. Hey, I was just in the neighborhood, and I rolled my eyes. Thought I'd quiz you on who you've been screwing. A humorless chuckle left me before I gripped my tea and flapped the material in an effort to cool my flaming cheeks and neck. Why was talking to Vic so difficult? I could express myself with my body so much better than I could with my mouth. Well, I guess it depended on how. Kissing, licking, and sucking were easy. Words, on the other hand, hard. Once more, I took a deep breath, to calm my nervous stomach and let it out slowly. Hey, I whispered to myself. Can we talk? Yep, that was it. That was the one. Okay, I muttered, taking the few steps over to the door and lifted my clenched fist, knocking before I lost my nerve. A minute later, the lock clicked over, and my gut clenched in anticipation. I hated myself for how eager I was to see him. The door opened, and a short, 
pretty woman in her thirties answered. My face fell right to the ground. Splat. God damn it, Annika. I was going to kill her. This, this right here, was why you didn't show up to a guy's place unannounced. Sometimes your worst fears were brought to life. A look of expectation crossed her, and she drew out the sentence. Can I help you? No one could help me. I threw on a smile I didn't feel and asked politely, Hi, is Vic around? Her face bunched in thought. Vic? She shook her head. Uh, no. I waited for more, but she didn't offer anything else. Feeling a little raw, I bit the inside of my cheek to stop myself from lashing out at a woman who did not deserve it. Do you know when he'll be home? Doll, she started, and I wanted to smack her. I think you're confused. There is no Vic here. What? My ears rang. Uh, pardon me. I don't know what to tell you. She shrugged lightly. Have a nice day. As she moved to close the door on me, my hand shot out as a barrier. Wait. The woman looked down at the offending limb as though she might just cut it off. Through the gap, I quickly asked, How long have you lived here? When did you move in? The woman sighed as she thought about it. I don't know, six months or so? She glanced down at my hand. You can let go now. My fingers fell and she shut the door in my speechless face. A thousand different thoughts ran through my head. Okay, so Annika was trying to tell me something. Alone in the hall, all of which I had practiced was set aside, and it made room for a single hushed question. What the hell is going on here? Chapter 7 Vic I was on fire. My arms burned, my muscles burned, hell, even my lungs burned. But it was good. A welcome distraction. It was better than 90% of the feelings I got thinking about her. Sasha held the bag as I laid into it, gritting my teeth and punching it in a way I knew I could never punch a person, not unless I wanted to end their life. When I lifted my leg and let out a grunt, throwing it into the bag so hard that Sasha lurched, he then quickly regained his balance before admonishing. Easy. No, it wasn't. Nothing was easy. Life was harder than the devil's prick, and if taking out my mood on this fucking punching bag was all I could do to ease the pain for a while, then I would. I kicked it again and again, harder each time, until suddenly I turned my back and tried in vain to get my raging emotions under control. Fuck. Panting, I placed my hands on my hips and lowered my head allowing droplets of sweat to bead and meet at the tip of my nose before falling to the floor. Breathless, I let out a rough... <sighs> Sorry. I mean, I wasn't, but it was only polite to say it. My eyes closed, and all I saw was Nastasia, that little body-hugging dress with the long sleeves, wavy brown hair that smelled like vanilla and peaches her expressive eyes that always betrayed her true feelings, the way her full mouth pouted even when she smiled, tight body, curvy ass, petite tits, mouth-watering. Her uncertain statement echoed through my head. Come home with me. It was official. I had lost my mind. There was no other reasoning to have refused her. It wasn't often that Nass put herself out there like that, but for me, she did. And she did it often, had done it often, starting from the time she was a teenager. I loved that about her. Nass didn't just wear her heart on her sleeve, she wore her mind and mouth on it, too. Jesus. Regret sloshed through me, heavy and thick. Maybe I should have done it, even just to have her for one more night. The thing was, I wasn't down for being a plaything. 
I wasn't a game she could take off the shelf whenever she was bored, no matter how fun playing was. And playing with Nastasia was always fun. She was mine, and I was hers, forever and always. And until she got that through her pretty little head, I would try to give her what she asked for, but I was only human. Space. My lip curled at the word. When in the history of broken relationships had space ever done any good? No. When a person asked for space, it was the beginning of the end, a death sentence. If Nastasia thought I was about to let what we have die out, she was crazy. So, I did what I could to stay in her line of sight. I began to work closer to her, come around more often in the chance of seeing her. And yeah, I got in her face when she allowed it. Not because I was actually angry at her, but because when we argued, the sexual tension was through the roof. And what better way to make her miss me than to remind her of how nicely I hate-fucked her when she begged me for it. It had been a couple of weeks, and I couldn't get that desperate kiss out of my head. Sure, we were both frustrated, and our irritation got the better of us, but that only made it hotter. Her hand cupping my cheek as she punished me, biting my lip, my fingers digging into her ass as we slammed back into the wall. Holy fuck. I fought a groan, and Sasha asked, You good? Nope. How could I be? The woman I planned my life around had suddenly decided I wasn't her forever man. It was the second time she'd done it, too. The first time almost broke me. I wasn't going to let myself be fractured by her uncertainty. I would make her certain, undeniably so. I knew she loved me. You didn't look at someone that way Nass looked at me without loving them. She wore sunshine in her eyes that shone just for me. Her light bled into me, keeping me whole, keeping me sane. She had to love me, because when Nastasia loved, she gave it all. And if she didn't love me any longer, that was it. Any chance of happiness was gone. They said bad things came in threes, and I never believed that until Nass sent me on my way. Talk about a kick in the ass. The hits just kept coming. Blow after blow, I took them. But I didn't know how much more I could take. I was already bloody and broken. Another knock would turn me to dust. But if I was going down, I would fall with my fists swinging. From the time we were a band of unruly kids, pledging ourselves to the firm, we had each other's backs. There was an unwritten rule about such things. You had your brother's back, no matter what. This was the first time I refused to have anyone at my six. Sasha and Lev were my brothers, but this wasn't something I could go to them for. Not because they couldn't help, but because they would insist on helping, and I couldn't allow it. My pride wouldn't let me. This was something I needed to do on my own. While I acknowledged that my ego was a dangerous thing, the need to prove myself to them, to her, was larger than anything. Maybe then, Nastasia would see the potential I really had. Right now, I wasn't husband material. I knew that, and yeah, it stung. She deserved more than I had to offer, but that didn't mean I was willing to let her go. This family... They had already done so much for Annika and me. Their father was more than a family friend. He was a patriarch to all us kids, finding the time to talk to us about our problems and trying to find a solution to them. They gave us jobs, their friendship, and made us part of their family. I owed it to them to sort this shit out without their assistance. I owed it to Anton Lyakov who sat me down at eighteen and gave me his blessing to date his daughter, knowing I would have regardless. It was a hard pill to swallow to recognize you never solved a single problem on your own without the aid of your friends. Our problems were stacking up, so much so that I didn't even notice the toll it was taking on Annika, not until yesterday. It was my time to step up and take responsibility, 
I would not let the women in my life suffer in silence because I couldn't get shit done. Doubt plagued me, but I remained standing tall in the face of uncertainty. It would take more than money problems to bring me to my knees, no matter how large they were. I didn't have a choice. I had to succeed. I was not the type to allow failure, not just for my family's sake, but for my own. If I failed, I didn't know what I was going to do, because being in her presence and not being able to have her was torture, pure agony. She was light in the darkness, a white dove guiding me out of the shadows. I couldn't lose her. I had nothing left. <sighs> yeah. I paused to catch my breath, pulling back the Velcro on one glove. <sighs> I'm good. I picked up the water bottle, unscrewed the top, and put it to my mouth, drinking half the bottle in one go. The cool liquid passed over my dry yet grateful tongue. A heavy clang shook throughout the space. I glanced over and saw Lev slide out from the weight bench before stalking over to us. His chest heaving, he said something I did not expect. Although, to be fair... You never really knew what to expect from Lev. Mina and I are trying for a baby. Sasha and I both stilled in surprise. Lev worked on removing the strap from his elbow and went on. I spoke with Pox about how long the process might take. He isn't sure, being that Mina's body has undergone the stress it has. But I find I'm becoming increasingly anxious about becoming a father again. Holy shit. I blinked shaken my head in an attempt to clear it. I... But Sasha broke in, a deep frown marring his brow. Are you sure you even want another child? He crossed his arms over his chest and all but accused. Was this Mina's idea? Ah, uh, hell, here we go again. Sasha had a hard time trusting people. And although Mina inherited more than enough money to support herself and was now married to Lev... I didn't think he ever really saw past the homeless girl who stole his wallet when his back was turned. Lev paused in thought, then replied, She did bring it up, yes. After much talk about our circumstances, I agree that we're rather fortunate to have the time and money to be able to afford another mouth to feed. With Mina no longer working at the club, photography allows her a freedom most women don't have. Not to mention... The thought of Mina carrying my child gives me a warmth I don't believe I've ever felt before. Whoa, this was huge. I didn't think I'd ever heard Lev talk about his feelings. Mouth agape, I twisted to look at Sasha, and while he basically glared at me, I made a face that exclaimed, Dude! Meeting Mina changed him. I wasn't sure what she'd done to the big guy, but whatever it was, wasn't bad. A grin pulled at my lips. That's great, man. I'm really happy for you guys. Sasha's glare decreased, but only by a small amount. His defensive pose loosened, and his arms fell to his sides as he asked a careful, Why are you anxious? You could say a lot about Sasha Lyakov, but he cared for his siblings. He cared for them equally, but both he and Nastasia had a different kind of patience for Lev. Without the two of them to protect and guide him, Lev would not have been the person he was today. They were his voice when he couldn't speak, his reason when he fell to darkness, and they loved him unconditionally. Lev removed the small towel from around his neck and dabbed at his sweaty face. I suppose because the only experience I have with pregnancy is guarding the little life growing inside of Irina's body while she threatened to terminate it at every turn. He stilled, solemn. It wasn't what everyone told me it would be. I felt exposed and compromised. Irina was not the doting mother she should have been. If that ain't the truth. Irina was a crank-ass junkie bitch. Mina isn't Irina, brother. My brows pulled down at his frank admission. Lev told you how it was, no matter how dark or macabre. You know Mina isn't like that, right? She couldn't hurt a fly. 
Sasha spoke under his breath. No, she'd just steal from it. I blinked at him in disbelief. What an ass. Jesus, would you let that go? I threw an arm out to Lev. Your brother's asking for help here. Lev agreed passively. I know Mina isn't at all like Irina, but... For a man who exuded confidence, he seemed awfully unsure. It seems the experience left a mark. I looked over at Sasha. He looked right back at me. I shrugged lightly, expecting him to say something. His brow did that lazy, unbothered thing it always did when Sasha was in a foul mood. I mouthed, say something, and the fucker rolled his eyes. Oof. Sometimes it was hard not to beat his ass. But the moment I opened my mouth to offer words of encouragement, Sasha let out a deep sigh, reluctantly offering. It'll be different this time around. Lev peered at his brother, desperate for reassurance. How so? Well, firstly, Sasha fought another eye roll, but said, Mina loves you. There you go. I could have kissed the asshole. She isn't obsessed with you like Irina was. So when Mina thinks about her life and the choices she makes, she wonders of the outcomes and how they'll affect you both. Unlike Irina, who acted brashly and without fear of consequence. I see, Lev murmured. God love him, he didn't see. This was one of those things with Lev. You had to spell it out for him. He didn't take cues well. If you wanted to tell him something, you had to be direct. Have a baby, I told him. Hell, have twenty. With Mina at your back, every minute will be a pleasure. Lev smiled then. It was small, but there, it already is. I was glad he had that. I really was. But in some underhanded way, all this talk of wives, love, and growing families made me feel the loss of my woman even more. My mood fell. It'll be great, Lev. You'll see. And if it isn't, surly ass Sasha added with a sly smile, you can always divorce her. Easy, growled Lev. Well, are you fucking kidding me? Shot out of my mouth like bullets out of a gun. His face sober, Sasha uttered a bored. It was a joke. Yeah, sure it was, buddy. I have a meeting with a distributor in an hour. Sasha threw me a set of keys. I caught them midair. Lock up when you're done. He threw his towel around his neck and made to exit the home gym. Before he reached the door, he paused, turned, and said to us both, I may need your assistance with a John. Nice. I was out of practice. It had been a while since someone did a runner. Anyone we know? I asked. It was always good to know before the fact, because friend or foe, I'd have to beat the shit out of him, and I didn't like surprises. Sasha seemed to hesitate. He's one of Laredo's. Well, shit. Sasha's uncle was in the biz. Why the hell would this guy risk his wrath by coming to Sasha for a loan? More importantly, why would Sasha lend him the money? Curiosity had me asking. Does he know? This has nothing to do with him, but... Sasha merely looked at me. He will if this prick fails to make a second payment. Fair enough. Not that it mattered. If this idiot was stupid enough to borrow money from Sasha and think he'd show leniency when the dough wasn't returned, he had another thing coming. Sasha would take payment where he could. A finger, a kneecap, an arm, an eye, it didn't matter. Compensation was always met, in one way or another. No problem, I said with a light nod, because it wasn't. This is what I did. I was muscle for hire and it was one of the rare things I was good at. His returning nod was almost regal. With Sasha gone, I went to the bench Lev vacated and sat down, adjusting the straps on my gloves when Lev uttered a fairly straightforward, It is not often I'm surprised, but I am surprised by you. The hell was he talking about? I looked up from my hands to find him peering down at me. 
Is there a reason you aren't fighting for my sister? My first reaction was to tell him to back the fuck off. But this was Lev, and I knew he didn't mean for it to sound like an allegation. It's complicated, Lev. Yes, he said. Things are often complicated until we find someone who uncomplicates them. My brow lowered. What in the Mr. Miyagi bullshit was this? What he said next smarted. And even for Lev, I believed he meant for it too. I never took you for a coward, Victor. I stood slowly, resting a glare on him, my tone a perfect calm I did not feel. Anger rolled off me in waves. There are things you don't know. Watch your mouth, brother. But Lev did not feel the danger I put out. The definition of cowardice is a lack of bravery. He tilted his head a moment in thought before straightening. I believe the description fits. Lev, I warned, my resolve cracking. Don't push me. And because Lev's mind did not work the same way as most people's, his response was cool and to the point. Mina tells me that sometimes people need a push, not even in the right direction, in any direction, to keep them moving. Because life is motion, and when we stop moving, we never get the time back we lost. A brief pause. You haven't moved in a while. Neither has Nastasia. His tone was void, but his brow furrowed a touch. You need a push. You both do. God damn it. This was how Lev was. One second you wanted to kick his ass and the next you wanted to hug him. When I took my time responding, he advised, May I offer you some advice? No, I didn't want advice. I didn't want to talk. I was hurt and dismal, and I wanted to be left the fuck alone. A sigh left me, but I said, Sure. Lev looked past me, as though I wasn't even there. He thought a while, and when he began to speak, he looked me in the eye. Life begins with love. With that odd but endearing statement from a man who didn't always feel, he clapped me on the shoulder and left me to my thoughts. And what a fucking mess they were. Ah, ma! The annoyed statement shot out of my mouth as my mother stealthily scooped more rice onto my plate. You need to eat, she said without a hint of remorse. You're a growing boy. I blinked at her, then my nose bunched. I stopped growing like ten years ago. She kept scooping, and I put a hand out to guard my plate. Would you stop? And because she was a Russian mom... Her face transformed into that of a sad puppy, but thankfully, she backed off. One day, you'll be sorry that I'm gone. Taking the pot back to the stove, she kept on with the guilt trip. One day, you will have a wife, and she will make you this same dish, and it will be fine. Her lips turned down. But it won't be mine, and you will notice. I couldn't help but smile at her dramatics. And when that day happens, I stood, taking my almost full plate to the sink. I'll cry a river, cursing the gods for ever having taken you from me. I'll sit in the rain and weep my fucking heart out, sob until I vomit. I kissed her cheek, and she waved me off, fighting a smile. I promise, Mama. I walked down the hall to wash up and crossed the entrance to my sister's room, then stopped, backing up until I stood in the open doorway. Annika sat on the bed, staring out into nothing. When she noticed me, she pasted on a smile that was a mechanical stretch of her lips and nothing more. I, Hey, I returned, looking her over. What I saw was dark circles under her blue eyes, dull copper-red hair, and pale skin. Had she lost weight? You look a little blue. How are you feeling? She pulled her knees up to her chest and wrapped her arms around them protectively. Ah, uh, you know. She sighed lightly, 
and I couldn't take this shit anymore. Stepping inside the room, I closed the door behind me and moved closer. I don't know what's going on with you anymore. Annika chuckled, but there was a hostility to it. That's fitting, as I don't know who I am anymore. All I saw was torment, physical and mental alike. I did not like that. You can talk to me, Ani, about anything, and no judgment. Her face changed, became somewhat darker. Like you talk to me, she shot back. Because you tell me all your problems, right, Vic? Oh, she was mouthy today. She, unfortunately, also had my number. That's different, but it wasn't. We both knew our relationship as brother and sister had always been one-sided. I'm your older brother. I'm not supposed to unload on you. It's my job to keep the bulk on my shoulders so yours remain weightless. All at once, she looked both touched and exasperated. I can heft some weight, you know? Between the two of us, the burden is halved. I'm happy to share the load. I was lucky. She was a good sister. The best. Not your burden to share, kid. And just when she opened her mouth to let out a furious tirade, I think I surprised her when I admitted. But if I were going to talk to anyone about the bullshit that goes on in my rock-hard melon, it would be you, Ani. No doubt. It took her a moment, but when she smiled, it was real. And because it was getting a little too mushy up in here, I jerked my chin toward her and did what big brothers were meant to do. Take a bath. You smell like shit. The look of pure outrage on her face was enough for me. I opened the door and started to laugh when a pillow flew right by my head. Chapter 8 Nastasia the second I walked into the house from my half-assed workout, I balked when I heard music playing in the kitchen. And because it could have been any number of people, I proceeded with caution. But the second I heard her wailing out the lyrics to Living on a Prayer, I huffed out a laugh, wiping the sweat from my brow and strolling into the room, my tone light and breezy. What are you doing here? Cora stood, leaning over my breakfast bar, reading from an enormous textbook. The tenants upstairs are boinking again. Right. And the noise bothers you? I asked with raised brows, because I could barely hear over Bon Jovi blasting from my portable speaker. And like the Cora I knew, she made a sound deep in her throat, then confessed. Not really. Actually, I work much better with chaotic shit going on around me. It's just that the walls are paper thin, and I'm not even kidding. I can hear everything. Everything. Problem is, it makes me horny, like super horny, can't concentrate kinds of horny, so here I am. She shot me a smirk. No risk of finding sex here, not even a little. I'll bet you've got cobwebs tangled in your pubes. Uh, rude. I threw my sweaty towel at her and she caught it but the second she realized what it was, she let out a disgusted noise and flung it away. It landed softly on the floor. Not wrong, though, she muttered, still repulsed, wiping her hands down the length of her jeans. I shook my head at her, walking around to the fridge and bringing out a carton of apple juice. When I drank from the carton, Cora's expression turned miffed. What if I wanted some? So, I took the apple juice in my mouth and made a show of dribbling it back into the carton before shaking it up and handing it to her. Go for it. Cora's brows rose at the challenge. You think I won't do it? I know you won't do it. She snatched the carton from my hand, narrowed her eyes on me and said, It's like you don't know me at all. She wouldn't do it. But she lifted the carton to her lips she wouldn't do it. Then tipped it back. Oh my God, she was doing it. She took a huge gulp and I let out a slow, disbelieving, ew. See? She wiped her mouth with the back of her hand and attempted to smile, 
but her lips were crooked. No pro- I didn't see the gag coming, but when it hit, I barked out a laugh and rushed forward to her as she bent over the sink and gagged once more. Are you okay? She made a face and wheezed out. That was really gross. Don't tell anyone I did that. My heart warmed as I realized Cora looked at my house as a safe haven. It made sense, though. She lived here for a while, and it was good. We rarely fought, but when we did, it was normally over something stupid like, did you eat my muffin, or hey, that's my sweater. As time went on, I had to acknowledge that although I had no sisters by blood, I had three I had chosen. Cora was one of them. Snuffling out a laugh, I poured the remainder of the juice down the sink and asked, Spoken to Alessio? The sour expression she wore told me she hadn't. Her brow furrowed as she drew out the word. No, I call and he doesn't answer. I text and he doesn't respond. Her face screwed up. I was so desperate that I did the whole, Hey, sexy and then sent him another text immediately after that saying, oops, wrong person, sorry. Oh, wow, pulling out the big guns. And he didn't bite? She leaned back against the counter, looking as miserable as I'd ever seen her. Not even a nibble. What a psycho. God, he was stubborn. What was it about these men? Ask them to shoot a guy and they'd barely hesitate. Ask them to admit their feelings, and suddenly, no hablo inglés. If we were going hard, we needed backup. You know, we might have to get Mina to help out on this one. Cora sighed, then moped. Seriously? That's where we're at? We've got to bring a third person into this? She turned and dropped her head onto the counter with a thud. What she said next came out muffled. Why can't I just like a guy who likes me back? One who wants to give me two in the pink and one in the stink. Is that so much to ask? Lord above, she needed Jesus. I stroked her hair and cooed. He will. He's just scared because you're little and full of spunk, and he's all doom and gloom. The two of you together are going to be like a match in a gas tank. I tugged at a silken strand of her blonde locks. Explosive. She lifted her head and pursed her lips. You think so? I know so, I declared, gathering her hair in my hands and pulling it off her shoulders, playing with the thick mane in the way I always had. Let's go talk to Mina. After that, we're going to La Perla. I grinned deviously. And on the way home, a detour, I think. Three hours of shopping and multiple purchases later, a plan had been hatched. And while Mina wasn't exactly happy about the part I asked her to play, she admitted that her brother was being obstinate and needed a gentle shove in order to get him moving. He's going to be mad. Mina fidgeted in the back seat, practically moaning in distress as we pulled up to the house. As if Alessio could ever stay mad at his baby sister, he adored her. She was sunlight on the tombstone where he lay. In many ways, her mere presence had brought him back to life. Alessia Scarfo was a shell of a man until Mina wormed her way into his heart. And there she stayed. He won't be mad, I muttered indifferently, but quietly added, at you. Because he was always mad, and if he was going to be mad at anyone, it was going to be me. It was always me. And I didn't mind. Our strange family connection made us close in a way that meant being mad at each other was a passing emotion. We heated up quickly, but got over it just as fast. And I wasn't just doing this for Cora. I was doing this for him. Because he had been through things, and my eldest brother was a ghost from the past who haunted him. I don't know whether it was guilt or the fact that I secretly thought he was a decent guy, but Alessio deserved the epic love that Cora would provide. He would be changed by it if he'd only be willing to accept it. I'm not sure about this anymore, Cora said cautiously. Mina's right. He's going to be pissed. Was she serious? I blinked at her. I can't believe what I'm hearing, especially from you, Miss Throw Your Panties Off, Turn and Wait. That's different, 
she said. I returned in exasperated. How? And then she twisted to face me, just as maddened, and broke my heart. Because I didn't love them, okay? In the rearview mirror, I watched Mina's face transform with shock. Her brows rose and her mouth rounded with it. After a long moment's silence, Cora slumped back in the passenger seat and closed her eyes, looking a little red in the cheeks. Her misery ate away at me. I mean, how was I supposed to ignore that? No. Determination lit in my veins. This was happening. Cora would get her happily ever after, so help me. Hey! I reached out to put my hand on her shoulder. Cora squeezed her eyes shut. I shook her lightly. Look at me. And when she finally opened her eyes, I said four words that were likely to piss her off. No pain, no gain. And she glared at me. Called it. Look, I began. Men are fickle, okay? And sometimes, even though they might have a shiny, sparkling diamond in front of them, they don't want it until someone else puts in a bid. So... I reached down to the bag by her feet, lifted it, and shoved it into her lap, then grinned. Let the bidding begin. Cora thought about it a moment. She inhaled deeply, then exhaled slowly, undoing her seatbelt and murmuring, He's gonna be so pissed. Oh, boo-hoo. So what? At least then he'll have shown some emotion, for Christ's sake. Cora's head tilted, and a single brow rose. Why does that low-key make sense? There we go. Now, all we had to do was go inside and wait. See? Cora lifted her bare foot onto a dining room seat as Davi Lobo kept his burning gaze high up on her thigh, where the white lace garter teased. Her skirt rode up almost all the way to her hip, revealing the lower curve of her ass and the black satin panties she wore underneath. This one is different from the black one. It's plainer, but... She thought about it. I like it. I don't know. Davi's eyes were trained on her bare leg, and Cora feigned innocence like a pro. What do you think, Davi? Her voice turned breathy. Leather or lace? Immediately, the Portuguese man croaked out a heavily accented... Two. Two? Cora's brows lowered in confusion. I smiled to myself. She didn't speak fluent Davi like I did. He means both. Awesome. He twisted to look back at me, nodding. Both. He lifted one hand. One good. Then the other. Two good. He put his two hands together and grinned. Both. Cora reached out to lovingly cup his cheek. You do wonders for my ego, sweetheart. Mina's phone chimed and she checked the display. He's a few minutes away. She leaned into me and whispered, I hope you know what you're doing. I didn't, but nothing else had worked. Anything was worth a shot. Cora took her time slipping the garter off before placing it back in the bag and lifting out a tiny scrap of material. She stood straight, then placed it over her skirt. Davi didn't blink. And when he realized that tiny scrap of silk was a pair of skimpy French panties, he put a hand to his forehead and groaned softly. Querido Deus. Now, Cora said, picture this. Okay, Davi croaked. But with nothing else on. She motioned to her torso. Nothing else. Nada. I could have laughed at the pained expression on Davi's gorgeous face. I probably would have if we weren't rudely interrupted. The fuck? The blazing fury that came from the open doorway should have alarmed me, but because there was obviously something wrong with me, the satisfaction I felt energized me enough to make me feel like I could kick down a door. Stick to the plan, girls. Stick to the plan. Cora barely spared him a glance. Oh, hi. From where I sat, I didn't even look up from my phone. Look, everyone, it's Oscar the Grouch. Hey, you, we just came from the mall. I thought we'd visit. 
Mina smiled up at her brother lovingly, and it was the biggest form of gaslighting I had ever seen. As though Cora being half undressed wasn't bothering anyone, like Alessio being furious at this scene was uncalled for, and I inwardly crowed with laughter when his fists bawled and his jaw ticked once, twice, then three times. Hell, like a tea kettle at boiling point, he was ready to blow. And when Cora replaced the little black panties with a bright red pair that had a heart-shaped jewel in the center of the waistband and black ribbon dangling from the sides, she rested them over her skirt and asked Davi, Which color do you like better? Davi made a sound in his throat. It was almost a cross between a laugh and cry. From the corner of my eye, I saw Alessio fight to keep himself calm. I didn't miss the way his nostrils flared, nor the vein pop by his temple. Glee filled me. Yeah, it was working. Put him on, I suggested disinterestedly. How can he tell unless he sees them on the model? Alessio's body went taut. Cora looked up and thought, then shrugged. Makes sense. And when she reached under her skirt to pull down the panties she wore, Alessio moved. Holy shit, did he ever. Faster than a bullet, he was across the room, scooping her up over his shoulder. Cora yelped and clung to him, gripping onto his tee and holding on for dear life. Then let out an enraged, hey, put me down, you asshole. But he didn't get to see the way her eyes twinkled. Her skirt flipped and skewed as she wiggled. He growled, panting out raw fury. Alessio lifted a hand and brought it down over her ass. Hard. The solid smack of skin on skin damn near echoed through the room. The way she moaned was pure sex, and I could tell from the way Mina's eyes widened that she was a little embarrassed by it. When next Alessio spoke, he rumbled. Fine. You want to play games? Come on. Let's play. He was so angry that the room around us shrank from the size of it. Wrath spread from every step he took, and as he strode away with his prize, he turned his face into her butt and sunk his teeth into the curve of her ass, biting then sucking harshly. My eyes widened. I'd never seen Alessio so out of control, so undone or primal. I had to admit, it was a treat. Cora gasped loudly, her eyes rolling into the back of her head with obvious pleasure. Just as they disappeared from sight, Alessio chuckled, but let out a dark and humorless, I warned you, sugar, but you didn't listen, and now you're gonna learn there's nothing soft about me. Jesus Christ, that was hot. Would I be a freak to admit the curious part of me? Kind of wanted to watch? Our forgotten Davi looked around first to Mina, then to me. Que? I shrugged. Sorry, bud. I guess he wanted her more. He rose up from his seat, still looking at the path in which Alessio had taken Cora, and when he began to walk away in the opposite direction, muttering hastily in Portuguese, looking a little miffed, I imagined he felt a little pissed at being used. Bye, Davi, Mina called out contritely after him, then looked back at me with a sad frown. I know. Poor guy. I'd make it up to him somehow. After a few minutes of sitting in awkward silence, Mina quietly said, So, do we just wait, or... At that very moment, from behind a closed door somewhere down the hall, Cora moaned so loudly it bordered on a scream. Mina's lip curled in repulsion, and it was fair. Alessio was her brother, after all. My own brows rose, and we both stood fast. Time to go. Yep. She spat the word out like day-old chewing tobacco. And away we went. Six hours later, as I sat watching the television, I heard a car pull up, and when I peeked out the window, I recognized Alessio's black BMW M2. Cora stepped out of the car, her shoes in her hands, her purse tucked under her arm, and she exited the car without a backward glance. It drove away, and I stood. 
A minute passed, and with a slight frown, I opened the door before she even knocked. She was a mess. Disheveled beyond repair. I wondered if Cora even remembered how to knock. My brows lifted. One look told me she had had a day. Her hair was out of place and knotted, mascara flecking off onto her cheeks, the smear of her lipstick heavy around her mouth, lips pink and swollen, and she looked dazed. She staggered inside, and my lips pulled down. She walked robotically all the way to my sofa, and when she crawled onto it slowly, lowering herself to her stomach with a sigh, she reached for a pillow and hugged it tight. Her lips were smushed against it when all she continued to do was blink into nothingness. The anticipation made me antsy. I stood right in front of her and waited. When she offered nothing, I prompted, Well? Cora blinked hazily. Her response came out half muffled from the pillow she was now drooling on. I can't feel my anything. My brows bunched. Is that good, or... She grunted affirmative, and as I looked down at her sorry form, I laughed softly. Damn, girl. Finally, didn't I tell you we'd get it done? You got dicked down. A bark of laughter left her. Still fuzzy in the eyes, she let out a bemused... That's the thing. He never even went there. We just... Her voice sounded far away. Played. She licked her lips, then twisted to frown up at me. That was when she whispered, I've never been played with like that before. Well, hell, now I was curious. How? Like, he wanted to pleasure me so hard I'd die from it? Her tone was reflective. Okay, that was very specific. I sat down on my wooden coffee table, patient and watchful, as a whole range of emotions flitted across her face. And when at long last she settled on melancholy, I wasn't expecting what she said, slow and determined. I am going to make that man my husband. My expression stunned. I did a tiny double take. Pardon me, ma'am. Cora didn't talk marriage. It was quite literally the one thing she was happiest about when she walked out on her family, that she wouldn't be forced into marriage, as she never wanted to be tied to anyone. She called it a death sentence. And here she was, talking about getting herself a husband? Unbelievable. I was stunned, speechless. Somehow, this broken and scarred man had unwittingly mended the guarded and wary part of Cora's heart. The question was, would he allow her to repair the damaged part of his? Chapter 9 Nastasia the second I woke with a pounding headache, I should have guessed something was wrong. My brow creased as I threw open my curtains and squinted out into the gray morning. Fat droplets of rain fell onto my window pane. Maybe that should have tipped me off, too. It made sense for it to rain on days like this one. It would have been hard for the sun to shine through the darkness that plagued me. I was mid-stretch my tank revealing my bare stomach when I heard it. Hello, dear. And I stilled. My eyes widened a touch, but I maintained my cool appearance. My mind, however, thrummed. A deep buzzing sound replaced my every thought. Static feedback, nails on a chalkboard. Oh, God. She's back. I see that even though you're grown, you still have the defiant, immature streak. My fingers twitched. I swallowed hard but turned to look at her, sitting on the edge of my bed with one leg resting over the other, posed primly, looking the picture of poise, dressed in the clothes she was wearing the day she left. And my heart stuttered. The woman turned and I sucked in a short breath. 
I looked like her. A lot more now than I had then. Her small smile held reprimand. Ignoring your mother, really. Walk away. If you don't talk to her, she'll leave you alone. Stuck in mud, I simply stared a while as distress washed over me. No, 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 no. I thought we were past this. Turning away, I shook my head in an attempt to clear it, focused straight ahead at the wall, and then my feet were moving, taking me toward the bathroom. Once inside, I looked around and breathed a sigh of relief when I saw she hadn't joined me. I blew out a long breath, ignoring the way my heart pounded, and picked up my toothbrush with a shaking hand. I went about the motions, brushing my teeth mechanically, as I wondered what today's date was. Tell me, Ripka, where is your darling, handsome Victor? My movements came to a halt as I peered into the mirror to find her standing in my bathroom, looking around curiously. And when she looked back at me, there was a glint in her eyes, her red lips tipped upward, looking every bit the smile. But there was something sinister to it. Ah, yes, you've driven him away. Before I could stop myself, I uttered a rough, I broke up with him. Catching myself, I immediately felt stupid, lowering my face and shaking my head in frustration. God damn it, I was talking to a figment of my imagination. You think that matters? Darling, be honest. If not me, then to yourself. He was never good enough for you. My toothbrush fell into the sink with a clink. My hands, now splayed on my vanity, trembled. That's not true. Isn't it? Victor was kind and funny and sweet. He's a good man. My mother approached slowly, her heeled footsteps clicking softly as she held my gaze and stepped closer to my back. Then why do you push and push and push him away, Nastasia? I opened my mouth to speak, but found I had no good answer for that. The silence between us went on for what felt like days. I have a theory, she said. My lips thinned. Of course she did. And then she turned, pacing the length of the ensuite as she spoke. I know you will, better than you care to admit. After all, a mother knows her child. The absolute gall. My jaw steeled. Like she knew Lev? I quietly seethed, gripping the edge of the vanity hard enough to turn my knuckles white. As if she had heard my thoughts, she stalled, and when her eyes came to rest on me, she smiled in a perplexed way that said she knew it all. And that smile of hers. It was deadly. Do your brothers know you miss me? Do they know that you still have my things? Photographs, cards, and letters. That you often revisit the pest. That you smell my perfume and wear my jewelry. Try on a dress or two. My expression hollow, I loathed the way my heart filled with shame. Do they know you think about me and Vib? That you wish that you could have hugged me one last time? even after all I did to your brother. That you watch me be dragged so heinously from my home, knowing they would put a bullet between my eyes? She waited a moment. Do they know? Of course not. How could I ever admit to such a thing? She looked me up and down. Nestasia, they would be livid, and you disgraced. Mother took small steps toward the bathtub, taking a dignified seat on the porcelain lip. No, you will never tell them, because you know they will never understand. But I do. Do you know why? I shook my head. Her proud smile both warmed and chilled. Because you are just like me. No, I'm not, I whispered. The fear her statement instilled was overwhelming. She waved off my weak reply. Deny it all you want. The facts speak louder than your feeble protests. 
Now, I'll ask again. Where is Victor? We broke up, my voice shook. No. Mother lifted her arm, waving a gentle finger in the air. You broke up with him because deep down you are the product of my womb, and therefore me, because social standing matters to you, and Victor Nikulin was never worthy of my daughter. She was wrong. My brow furrowed. Stop it. No money, no breeding, no prospects. That matters to you, dear. It didn't. It doesn't. She leaned forward slightly, stressing each word. Then why aren't you with him? My chest ached. Because. Because why? She prompted. It was hard to breathe. Because. Her eyes flashed. Say it. Because loving him is killing me. The words shot out of my mouth like slugs from a pistol. I panted with the realization that it was a death I would willingly accept if I only had him. My breathing shook as wetness spilled from my eyes. My heart chattered with the stray thought. Why doesn't he love me? It is killing you. Her nod was solemn. He is poison, a sickness in your veins, a sexually transmitted disease, and you opened your legs, inviting this illness into you. He is a weak kitten, in a bag sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and he is taking you with him. My eyes blurred. I croaked. You don't know him like I do. Mother's eyes darkened. I know he is a fell-mouthed, uncouth, spoiled. Anger lit deep inside of me. Stop it. Arrogant, selfish. That anger quickly turned to rage. Mother, stop. Irresponsible, poor excuse for a man. I turned on the tap and rinsed out my mouth before throwing cold water onto my face. I then fumed. I'm not listening to you. You're toxic. Her motherly tone was an insult. But you are listening, you silly girl. You will hear everything I have to say, as I am inside your head, and I will be heard. I demand it. Go away, go away, go away. Oh, God! I clutched at my pounding head, tangling my fingers in my own hair. I was going insane. My words will echo through your mind until your ears seep red. My body began to rock. I shut my eyes tightly. Please stop. From the corner of my eye, I watched her stand and move to the center of the room. You are beauty and resilience, both soft and unyielding. Proud, pretty little thing. You are Aliakov. And you want him? She sneered at me. I'm sure you find it just as amusing as I that although you have given every part of yourself to that boy, he gives back naught but table scraps. You gift him your heart, and he cuts it clean out. You bleed from the wound, and he watches but does nothing. She looked so disappointed in me. Foolish girl. When will you stop this nonsense? You fell in love with a thug. Her words cut me deeply. My breathing turned heavy. And he doesn't love you in return. The cruel laughter she ended on had something breaking inside me. Reaching out, my fingers folded around the base of the heavy crystal vase that sat on my vanity. Her laughter echoed and my heart pounded painfully in my chest. She laughed and laughed on the outside but inside my head she taunted me with whispers and lies until the statements all overlapped. You're a fool, disgrace, a princess who lies with dogs. Such a disappointment. No wonder he doesn't want you. Your father would turn in his grave over what you have become. I held my breath as she locked onto her target, and her final statement hit its mark. You are my daughter. With that parting shot, the need to hurt her took over, 
My body trembled with raw fury, and when I lifted the vase, turned and bellowed, I said, that's enough! My arm extended, my hand released, and I watched in slow motion as the heavy crystal soared through the air toward the woman who birthed me. Mother smirked as the vase hurtled toward her, and just when it should have connected with her face, she disappeared, and the vase dashed toward an unintended target. The moment it connected with my shower screen, the shrill sound of glass shattering echoed in the small space. The shock of it all had me slapping my hands over my ears to mask the piercing blast. My shoulders lifted as I clenched my eyes shut, and I twisted my body protectively as splinters of glass pinged and tinkled around me. And then silence. My trembling hands gradually fell from my head. I straightened as much as I could, blinking in a daze, peering around at the shattered glass and broken tile. Sorrow filled me slowly, unhurried, like I was a glass under a leaking faucet. Every drop that fell filled me with a little more grief, and the drops continued to fall. My face crumpled. I lifted my hand to my mouth and I cried. I cried long and hard. Because maybe my mother was right. Maybe I was like her. She could have been right about it all, except one thing. She was wrong about him. Victor Nikulin lit up the world with a smile. And he was worth every heartbreak and more. Nastasia, age 18. Before I'd even told him, a cold, eerie feeling settled over me. That feeling told me that although what I'd done wasn't exactly wrong, it wasn't unerringly right either. So when he heard my news and calmly said he would see me later, that cold feeling spread to my heart. An iceberg would have responded warmer than he had. I bit my thumbnail as I sat on the bleachers, ignoring my homework as I waited for Annika to finish up with cheer practice. My heart twinged, causing me to wince from the sting of it. The longer I thought about it, I considered I might have been in a wee bit of trouble here. It was two days till prom, and I couldn't very well go with Vic. Our relationship was a well-guarded secret, and although I had the feeling my brothers had an inkling about Vic and me, they never brought it up. It wasn't that I wasn't thinking when I accepted Bram Allen's promposal. I was. All I could think about was us. It's not like I wanted to go with Bram, but he seemed like a nice enough guy. He wasn't a jock or a nerd or too involved with clubs. He was just a boy. And when we happened to get onto the subject of prom while we worked side by side in English, he told me he was going stag. I told him I would be too, so when he casually suggested we could go together, I thought, why not? The call I made to Vic from the payphone in the hall at lunchtime was shorter than it should have been, but the moment my news hit him, his tone changed. He grew distant, aloof. I wore my regret openly, but he wasn't here to see it. Until his car pulled up, and he was. My heart settled at the sight of him, no matter the scowl he wore or how he stalked toward Bram. And when he walked with determination like he did right now, my stomach twisted. Oh, shit. I shot up, my books forgotten, and I ran. No, 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 I muttered to myself. I ran hard and fast, and just when Vic approached the poor guy and called out, Hey, you. I did the only thing I could think of doing to distract him. He wore what he always did, black jeans, a long-sleeved Henley pushed up to his forearms, and black high-top vans. His handsome face and muscled body drew the attention of girls and guys alike. And when he glowered the way he was then, his lip curled unintentionally, it just made his appeal intensify. His jaw worked as he snapped the gum in his mouth, and when he spotted me coming at him full speed, he stilled a moment, turning to face me with his legs apart 
and a look that shouted anger. But the closer I got, the more his face softened, and when he realized I wasn't stopping, he licked his lips and braced. I jumped, and he caught me with a grunt. The moment my stomach pressed flat against his torso, it felt like home. My legs coiled around his lean waist, and I held onto his shoulders. He slid one strong arm under my ass, supporting my weight, while the other came up to gently caress my nape. I started talking before he even had the chance to speak. Don't do this. Not this time. He's a nice guy, Vic. Mm hmm was all he said as he slowly chewed his gum, clearly unconvinced. I placed my hands on either side of his neck, caressing his warm flesh with gentle fingers. I closed my eyes and pressed my forehead to his, whispering, Please don't be mad at me. Those brawny arms flexed and tightened on me. Close enough to his lips to breathe in his minty breath, I hurried out, I don't even want to go anymore. I won't go, okay? Vic took a deep breath and released it slowly. He sounded more than a little put out when he uttered roughly, If you think I'm going to sit back and watch some little punk dance with my girl all night, pose with his arm around her for some lame-ass photos, and lean in close, hoping to get a taste of those sweet lips... He reached around in front of me to grip my chin and force my head up so our eyes met. His brows lowered some. Then you are out of your damn mind. His gaze flickered to my pouting lips, then back up again. No one touches my girl but me. The intensity of his gaze had shivers stealing down my spine. My voice was feather soft. I know. He seemed pleased at my speedy acquiesce, and when I ran my thumbs along his sharp jawline, his nostrils flared. Vic hefted me higher up his body, adjusting my weight, and then, right there, in full view of everyone, he slid his warm palm around my nape and jerked me forward, my lips meeting his with vigor. He kissed me long and deep, bruisingly rough, for the longest time until I came up, clutching his shoulders, gasping for air. Dazed and confused, I blinked at Vic a moment, unsure if it had really happened or if I just fantasized about it so much that I willed it to be true. Appearing overly pleased with himself, Vic's exhale warmed my skin, and when he leaned in for another taste, it was gentler this time. He pecked my throbbing lips once, twice, three times, lingering on the last. Taking in the feel of his stubble against my chin, I closed my eyes and fell even harder. I wasn't a stupid girl. I knew what this was. It was a display of dominance, of ownership. The feminist inside me raged, but the romantic in me cooed happily to be considered worthy of a display like this. And frankly, I didn't hate it. Vic lifted his hand and gently ran his thumb over my lips. I pecked the pad lovingly and watched his eyes blaze. And suddenly Vic twisted and called out, Hey, Bram. Bram, I corrected. Vic's brow furrowed. Whatever. I hadn't realized the entire football field had stopped to watch us until I heard a cheerleader ask, Annika, isn't that like your brother? Another asked, isn't that Nastasia? My head turned at the question, and when I found Annika frowning at us, I clung to Vic, lowering my face into the crook of his neck, hiding myself away from the judgment of others. Nothing else mattered but the feel of his body against mine. When he moved to face a confused-looking Bram, Vic called out, You're going alone to prom, kid. You hear me? Just you and your hand, so have fun with that. An open palm slid over the globe of one ash cheek and squeezed roughly while he bit his bottom lip, then grinned. Minor full. Vic held on to me until we got into his car. Once there, he pulled me close enough that almost all parts of our bodies touched and smiled into my soft mouth, 
kissing me restlessly, impatiently, until my lips were pink and swollen. Just as originally planned, I went to prom alone. Annika and I spent the afternoon getting our hair and makeup done. Her dress was a cream satin number with thin spaghetti straps and swept along the floor behind her. My dress was long, black, and form-fitting. It had a sweetheart neckline and thick straps. Annika wore her hair up with a few loose strands of hair curled at either side of her pretty face, while I wore mine down, parted in the middle. Neither of us would be getting a corsage this evening. It kind of dulled the experience, but it was what it was. There would be no limousine, only two goons in the black SUV parked outside who were expected to see us to our safety. And once Annika's parents had taken a hundred and one photos of us, we were on our way. Annika's eyes met mine in the back seat. I smiled sadly. She returned it with a light shrug before peering out the window with a soft sigh. In disappointment, we were matched. Perhaps it should have felt different than it did. I thought it would be exciting. Instead, it felt like a chore. No dates, no flowers, no limo. We were sharing half of an experience here, and it was noticeable. I hadn't seen Vic that evening. Truthfully, I hadn't expected to. It was a Saturday night, and my father needed him. Chaos was a growing syndicate, and they needed all hands on deck if they were to develop the sprouting heads into fully formed blossoms. We understood you were only strong as a united firm. The men had obligations to attend to. That usually translated into time away from family, but the wives understood. You did not marry a member of chaos without considering the sacrifices that came with such a role. Perhaps it was sad, but I already knew the way of things. Vic would be there when he could, and that meant I wouldn't always get him when I wanted him. Tonight was one such night. I would be lying if I said I wasn't saddened by it. From our table, I watched Annika dance with her cheer friends, and I smiled, knowing she was happy in her element. Unfortunately, I was so far out of mine that it almost pained me to sit alone at our table. I didn't feel as though I belonged here. I never felt like I belonged anywhere. I was the daughter of Anton Lyakov. I was Sasha's sister. I was Annika's friend. I was the girl with the addled brother, the one whose mother disappeared in the middle of the night. I was a constant plus one, always someone something, eternally the other, never the one. It got boring after a while. It also made me sadder than I cared to admit. If I wished hard enough, perhaps one day someone might put me first. I held that belief close. I had to. I just had to. A few boys asked me to dance. I politely declined. And as I sighed, sitting with my chin resting on my upturned hand, I scraped my nail down the thick fabric of the linen tablecloth in pure boredom, as another tried his hand. Wanna dance? Came from behind me, just barely heard over the music. Without even turning, I responded a gracious but uninterested. No thanks. You'd rather just sit there all night? Oh, come on, buddy. Let it go. Yep, I said, popping the pee. My brow furrowed when the chair in front of me was rudely pulled out. My eyes almost popped out of my head when Vic lowered himself into the seat and said, Here I am thinking, she's gonna be over the moon. He placed a plastic corsage gently on the table. I blinked up at him in wide-eyed wonder. He shook his head slowly and uttered, And to think, I wore this penguin suit for you. Oh my god. He's here. Glee filled me. He's here. But then my fractured mind got the better of me. Why is he here? But before I could think on it, my gaze passed over the tux, and I all but swallowed my tongue. Everything else faded away until it was just him. He looked. He looked.
Lord, I couldn't even comprehend how he looked. The tux looked expensive. While all the other boys wore white shirts and black ties, Vic never did things the usual way. Choosing instead to wear a black tux, a black shirt, and a black tie with his high-top vans. And as I glanced down at myself, it made me wonder if he's coordinated himself so we were matching. He looked amazing. A stray thought crossed me, and there it stayed. He looks like my future husband. Words failed me. Vic filled the empty air around us, taking the corsage out of the box. You kept going on and on about the dress. You were so excited about it. He took my hand and slipped the crimson red roses onto my wrist, turning my hand to secure the ribbon with deft fingers. I don't get it myself, but it turns out that anything that excites you excites me. I mean, I knew you were going to look good because you always do, but damn, baby. His eyes looked me over appreciatively and my heart stammered. It beat completely out of time when he rumbled a flattering, You're a knockout. Ugh, he was too much. I couldn't deal. My voice soft, I asked. What are you doing here? Doesn't matter. I'm here. You had work. I skipped. My gaze narrowed on him. Why? Jesus, Naz. The words came out purely exasperated. I guess my priorities have changed. White noise whooshed in my ears. What did he just say? I struggled to breathe right as I thought on his annoyed statement. The words and their intent were clear. For once in my life, I was a first choice. Vic chose me. My chest ached in a melancholy happiness. I was a priority to someone. Hell, I could have cried, and from the way my nose tingled, I was about to. Nobody had ever put me first. Nobody. It warmed my heart and gave me hope. It had me thinking for a split second that maybe, just maybe, we could figure out a way to make this work. Because a life without Vic was a life lacking and I refused to exist in a world deficient of him. A love that I could never have imagined began to snake and curl protectively around my heart. I was filled with it. So full, it threatened to overflow. A soft smile threatened to break free on my lips. No, he uttered, irritated beyond belief. Putting his hands to the sides of my chair, he dragged it forward until my knees settled between his and our faces were close. He looked me deep in the eyes and said, Let's not worry about the details, okay? I'm in a suit. You're looking like royalty. Seems a shame to waste it, sitting at this table all night. His warm gaze swept over my face, and he reached out to play with a lock of my hair. After a moment, he ordered gently, Dance with me. The way he looked at me then was beyond compare, like I was something precious, a rare jewel to be treasured. You don't dance, I reminded him, reaching up to fix his skewed bow tie. He rolled his eyes. Yeah, well, turns out I'd do just about anything to make you happy, so... He took my hand and folded his fingers around it, standing and taking me with him as he began to walk toward the dance floor. Let's dance. On the dance floor, we were surrounded by seniors, the music booming, but I saw none of it, heard nothing, because when Vic cloaked me in his arms, I found nothing else mattered. It was as it always had been, him and me. A tug of my hand had me stumbling into him and taking my chin between his fingers. He drew me up to meet his lips for a gentle, loving peck. As our lips continued to touch, he wrapped his arms around me, holding me close. But when he pulled back to look at me, he frowned down into my face. What is it? I asked carefully. 
He shook his head slowly as if to clear it and began to stroke my hair. Feeling utterly cherished, I put a light hand to his chest, rested my head on his shoulder, and closed my eyes, taking in this beautiful moment. I didn't think anything could top it. That was until Vic put his lips to my forehead and spoke against my skin. I will never take you for granted. He ended on the tender squeeze, and I smiled into the wall of his chest, feeling lighter than I had in my entire life. The whispered words were a vow, a promise, and I swore to return it tenfold. Chapter 10 Nastasia Present Sleep was very important to me. If I didn't get enough of it, I wasn't the easiest person to be around. And as I woke in two-hour intervals throughout the night, the woman sitting on the edge of my bed, smiling serenely at my dozing form, was the stuff of nightmares. My heart hadn't stopped racing since she first made an appearance two days ago. And now, as I waltzed into the small cafe I frequented, wearing black yoga pants and oversized sweater and casual sneakers, my hair in a messy ponytail and my face covered with oversized sunglasses, I hoped no one would notice just how much of a mess I was. I was tired, I was restless, I was irritated. The trifecta of bitchiness. So when I saw him sitting at a table by himself... I stilled midstep and my annoyance grew. Seriously? Why, God? How dare he look so good when I could barely find matching shoes this morning? He brought his espresso up to his lips as he read from the newspaper he held in his hands. I didn't know why that got to me. Maybe because he looked so effortlessly relaxed and my fragmented mind was being split in a flurry of puzzle pieces none of which fit back into their original spaces. My body rigid, my feet started moving, and they didn't stop until I stood in front of him with a cold expression that could have set off the next big freeze. Before he even looked up at me, I hissed quietly, This is my spot. Vic simply peered up at me with a furrowed brow. No, it isn't. Uh, excuse me? Yes, it is. This is my spot, my cafe. You go get your own. And his grin had my heart racing with anger. Firstly, I brought you here. So if we're getting technical, you wouldn't even know about this place if it weren't for me. My neck flushed. All right, I'd forgotten about that. Feeling stupid, I huffed out a short breath, threw up my hands and said, Fine, I'll leave. As I turned to walk away, Vic's hand shot out and gently but firmly circled my wrist. I twisted back to find his gaze had darkened some, and he uttered, Stay. It wasn't a plea, nor a demand. I might have been delusional, but to my ears it sounded like a wish. My rigid stance loosened mildly. Only one word out of his mouth, but I felt the caress of it all over. I peered down at that hand. It held me firmly as his obsidian gaze locked me in. I heard you've been spending time at Laredo's. I know you're smarter than to try to get the attention of a particular Frenchman, so I won't warn you against it. Those eyes sliced over the length of me. You know better, don't you, baby? Every fiber of my being screamed to sit and stay but the insecure part of me told me to leave before we hurt each other. Against my better judgment, I sat opposite him. And because I often had trouble keeping my mouth shut, I said smugly, Sounds like you might be jealous. The hand on my wrist flexed, and Vic held me down with his glacial gaze. Wanna test that theory? My chest squeezed. My ego was a petty bitch and hooted loudly, all for it. My heart thought nothing would be more romantic. But my brain, on the other hand, knew what Vic plus jealousy was capable of. And it wasn't pretty, 
Don't get me wrong. I was never the target of his anger when he got like that. The men standing in his warpath, however, usually ended up with a split lip, a broken nose, or a concussion. Or all three. And after it was all done and dusted, Vic would then take me home, take my mouth, and then take me roughly against the nearest surface, all while maintaining eye contact. Ugh, it was so fucking hot. The memory had my knees snapping together under the table, trying in vain to ignore the thrumming warmth that suddenly lit in my core. Hmm, maybe we should test that theory after all. No, but not a good idea. My inner self pouted and called me a prude. Not so smug anymore, I cleared my throat and asked, What do you want from me, Vic? Refusing to let go, his thumb gently caressed the sensitive spot at my inner wrist. And without hesitation, he responded one word that shattered my resolve. Everything. The way he said it, with zero hesitation, had my heart aching. I wanted that too. If only the stakes were even. If only he had as much to lose as I did. My heart was on the line. I wasn't sure if Vic even knew how to access his. Placing my hand on the cool surface of the table, he released me. As if he only just noticed something, his brows lowered. You look tired. I was. So tired. The bottoms of my feet hurt, too. What am I doing here? Thanks, I scoffed, because what an ass. But his brow furrowed. Take off your glasses. Oh, crap. I don't want to. Naz. A warning. I could do two things here. I could take off my damn glasses and show the dark bags under my eyes, or I could leave. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to be close to him. So I slowly removed my glasses and peered down at the table. What the fuck? Alarmed, he shuffles closer to me. Like it was nothing at all, he put a gentle finger to my chin and propped my head up looking further alarmed when he took in the state of me. My voice turned whisper soft, and I didn't miss the way it trembled. I haven't been sleeping well. There must have been something about the way I said it, because immediately he stilled. His tone was gentle, but he didn't hesitate to ask, Is she back? I played dumb, looking anywhere but directly at him. Who? A weary sigh left him. He released my face and I felt the loss immediately. I knew it was getting close to that time, but... He drifted off. All I could do was shrug. It's been years, Naz. I knew that. Why is she back? Why now? I blamed what I said on exhaustion. Refusing to look at him, I tapped a light fingernail onto the tabletop and shared miserably. I think it's because I'm lonely. Desolation. It was the only word I could use to describe Vic's expression. Funnily enough, my appearance matched his own. And as we sat across from each other so close together, yet feeling so distant, my chest ached with the realization of what I had just admitted to. And my mother's laughter echoed throughout my head. Fool. I was a fool. This man was lying to me, hiding things from me. Why the hell hadn't he told me he moved? Why was it a secret? Why? I was so confused. Standing so fast, my head spun my heel stung wildly as I picked up my sunglasses with shaking hands and slipped them back onto my face. I just realized I've got somewhere to be. Naz, wait. He stood, calling out after me as I made a hasty retreat. The smile I wore was nothing but a mechanical stretching of my face. No warmth, no emotion. 
See you at work. But not if I could help it. I wasn't safe anywhere. No matter where I turned or where I tried to hide, there she was. I went into my closet, and she stared back at me in the mirror. If I fled down the stairs, she was there waiting for me, blocking the front door. I asked her to go away, begged her to leave me alone. But nothing worked. And now, as I sat sobbing with my back inched into a bare corner of my room, knowing she couldn't sneak up behind me, I kept my blurry vision on her as she sat smiling at me. But the decay had begun. Her face was no longer as pretty as it once was. Her eyes had dulled, a white haze within them. The color of her flesh was now a bluish gray. Bits of her hair had fallen out. And still, she smiled. The torn hole in her cheek revealed her rotting teeth, yet she smiled. I sobbed and rocked and pleaded for mercy. Her smile remained unchanged, the very face of evil. Why are you doing this to me? My quavering whisper seemed loud in the dark. I was your favorite. Mother's voice had deepened some, taking on an ethereal echo behind it. I'm here because you missed me, dearest. I shook my head rapidly closing my eyes, repeating over and over again. I don't miss you. I don't miss you. I don't miss you. I don't miss you anymore. Time seemed to work differently when she taunted me. I wasn't sure what hour it was, only that it was dark when I heard my front door open, then close. My eyes flittered over to the open doorway of my bedroom a mother's movement mirrored my own. The shadow in the doorway loomed and I sank in on myself, my breathing turning choppy. What if there were more of them? The shadow began to move, came closer, and my breathing hitched when it stood directly in front of me and crouched. But then I heard him and the gentleness in his clearly concerned tone was more than I could bear. I called. You didn't answer. I texted. You didn't respond. I got worried. I couldn't see very well, but I knew Vic was taking in my pathetic form. Jesus, baby. Then his hand came out to cut my cheek. What is she doing to you? She's torturing me. With one swift motion, I was hefted up into his arms, and when he walked me toward the bed, closer to the rotting corpse that sat there, my breathing hitched as I let out a frightened, not there. I shifted in his hold, shaking harder than I ever had before, and clutched at him with fisted hands, refusing to let go of his shoulders. I pushed my face into the side of his neck and let out a whispered, Not there, not there, not there. Vic's arms were pillars of safety, and he would not let anything bad touch me. All right, not there. I got you. You're coming with me. He held me a moment, thinking of where to go from here, and when he began to move, I relaxed a little, knowing he had me. But when he removed one hand, a light turned on from somewhere around us, and he stopped moving. He stopped moving for a long time, and when I lifted my watery gaze to find his rigid body taking in the destruction of my bathroom, all I could do was look at him and whisper a sorry sounding, It was an accident. Vic's jaw ticked but when his eyes met mine, they held some form of understanding there. It's okay. It's not that bad. I can fix this. He sighed with unease and set me down on the vanity, but my arms cinched around him. I was unable to let go, scared of what might happen if I did. Gently but firmly, he removed my arms from around him, but I clutched at his forearms with rigid fingers digging into his flesh. Hey, 
he said, crouching down so his eyes lined up with my own. I'm not going anywhere. The certainty in his tone had me nodding, but more tears fell, and when he detached my fingers from his arms, he held my hands tightly within his own. Let me clean this up, and then we'll clean you up, okay? I nodded once more, but my vision hollowed out until all I saw was the light coming off the reflective surface of the chrome shower door frame. Vic worked at moving the glass around into a pile. He threw it all in the shower, and I shivered from my spot on the vanity. My mind was a mess. I wasn't sure this was even happening until he crouched down to touch a spot on the floor, then another, and when he twisted back to look at me, he asked cautiously, Baby, did you walk through this? My voice sounded hoarse. I can't remember. And then he was right there, lifting one foot, then the other, taking in the broken skin on the pad of my heel. When did this happen? I felt like I was stuck in a vacuum. His voice sounded so far away. A few days ago. And you didn't call me. Was he angry at me? He sounded angry. My voice was small. I figured I lost that privilege. His face darkened. Opening a drawer to the left, he took out a pair of tweezers, rested my foot on his knee, and picked at the small, already closed wound. You're my family, Naz. You don't get more privilege than that. A small pinch had my foot aching. He plucked something from my heel, lifted the tweezers, and set a small shard of blood-coated glass onto the countertop. Then another and when he was done, he scrutinized the area. I think that's all of it. His heavy brow lowered as he settled his concerned stare on me. Then he muttered it quiet. What am I gonna do with you? If he figured it out, I hoped he'd let me know. Because as defective as I felt right then, I was ready to dig myself a hole and await death. Taking a small washcloth, he ran it under warm water, wrang it out, then proceeded to wipe away the sweat and tears dried onto my cheeks. I closed my eyes as he cleansed my eyelids, my nose, my lips, my neck. And when he looked satisfied with his handiwork, he threw the cloth into the sink and stood tall, peering at me with mild disquiet. I didn't know what to say. I felt hollow, like a tree that animals had made a home inside. However, demons rested in this hollow tree, their only job to tear me down from the inside out. Come here, my protector uttered, sweeping me up into his arms. I was too weak to protest, not that I was sure I would if I could. Anxiety filled me as we entered my bedroom, I closed my eyes, not willing to look toward the bed. My heartbeat quickened, then slowed, as Vic took me out of my room and said, Hold on tight. It's a lengthy fall down. Slowly but carefully, he walked me down the stairs and into the spare bedroom by the kitchen. He lowered my bottom onto the bed, then went about sliding open the door of the closet, retrieving a pillow and spare blankets, before setting up a pallet beside the bed frame. Confusion swept through me. What are you doing? My voice didn't sound like my own. He punched the pillow a few times, allowing a straightforward, scaring away a ghost. And suddenly, I was coming back to myself, returning from the darkness. You don't have to do that. He spared me a glance before kicking off his shoes. I know. I felt bad. I'm sure you have better things to do than babysit me. I ended on a laugh, but it was more embarrassed than humor-filled. The thing was, when Vic decided he was going to do something, he did it. 
There was no arguing about it. This man, the hero in my very own fairy tale, had come for me. He thought to slay my dragons, to rescue me. But I knew deep in my bones that there was only one thing that could save me, and it was the one thing Vic had never offered. His heart. Lifting the covers, he took my hand with patience and waited until my head hit the pillow before he pulled the comforter up to my neck. For a solid moment, he simply watched me, and when my lids grew heavy, he used the backs of his fingers to stroke my cheek tenderly before moving away. And so he settled in on his crude pallet, lying on his back with a folded arm under his head, and uttered a rough, You are, and always will be, my first and only priority. My heart ached, because when he said things like that, it was easy to believe he loved me. Luckily, I knew better. With a full but heavy heart, my eyes drifted closed, and I floated away into a dreamless sleep. Vic. I woke to the smell of coffee, a head on my chest, slender arms wrapped around me, and a leg firmly wedged between my own. And as I took it all in, I smiled to myself, because nothing had ever felt better. Blinking down at the woman who felt the need to struggle in silence, I searched her sleeping face and breathed easy when I found zero sign of anguish. Gently extracting her limbs from my own, I felt like the biggest asshole when my cock throbbed painfully. It wasn't something I could help, though. Nass just had that effect on me. She always did. Knowing what plagued her, I felt comfortable to leave her to sleep on her own. Daylight was safer than the darkness, and in a few days, this would all be over. Nass snuggled into our shared pillow. She must have slipped out of bed in the middle of the night and joined me on the floor. An intense, protective streak hit me hard. I couldn't help myself. Leaning in, I pressed my lips to her temple silently hoping it would convey everything I felt for her and more. No one was more important to me than Nastasia Lyakov. With one last look at her, I fought a yawn as I left the room and made my way to the kitchen just as Mina approached the back door, holding a plate. The shock on her face at seeing me half asleep in Nassa's kitchen had me grinning. You never had to guess what Mina was thinking. You could see it all right there, written in her expression. The second I opened the door, she walked inside cautiously and drew out the sentence. What are you doing here? Heavy emphasis on you. Squinting into the sunlight streaming in through the windows, I went to retrieve a couple of mugs and filled them with coffee. Nass needed me. Mina's lips puckered as she took the proffered mug and sat on a stool at the breakfast bar. What? She doesn't have a vibrator? I rolled my eyes, but softened it with a smile. Ugh, not like that. She's going through some shit. Like what? She asked quietly. I wasn't sure it was my place to say, but Mina may have been going through something similar with Lev, so I proceeded with caution. Do you know what an anniversary reaction is? Mina shook her head, appearing a little confused. You remember when she told you about what was happening to Lev as a child? About how no one would ever have known about it if Nass hadn't snuck into his bed and taken a beating meant for him? Her expression turned ice cold. I'm not likely to forget any time soon. I explained it as best as I could. Well... Every year when it gets closer to the date of when all that shit went down, Nass gets tightly strung. Out of sheer curiosity, I asked, Does that happen to Lev? Mina shrugged. Not that I've noticed. Yeah. Lev wasn't the type to wear his emotions openly. He was good at hiding himself. She, uh, has nightmares. Can't sleep. Becomes exhausted and edgy, irritable. 
I was not about to tell Mina that Nass sometimes saw the rotting corpse of her mother. That wasn't something she needed to know. She struggles. Mina's face softened, and you're looking after her. I sipped at my coffee, leaning my hip against the counter. No place I'd rather be. Quite suddenly, Mina let out a perplexed, Why aren't you guys together? I asked myself that question at least ten times a day. I was lost without her, asking the wrong person short stuff. And then she repeated, And you're here looking after her. What did she want from me? If that made me a putz, I guess I was a putz. No greater honor than to stand behind a woman and guard her back. If she'd let me, I'd remain by her side forever and always, till death do us part. A comfortable quiet passed, until finally Mina spoke gently. I'm glad she has you, Vic. And because I wasn't always good with talking about my feelings, I jerked my chin toward the plate she brought in. What you got there? She uncovered the loaf. Ada's walnut banana bread. A sound of pure delight escaped me. <sighs> well, shit. Stop wasting my time and serve it up, wifey. Mina looked at me a moment, and I didn't know what she saw in my face, but it was probably more than I intended. She stood, and a sad smile graced her lips. Her hand curled around my own, sparing me a quick squeeze as she passed me, and the misery I buried settled itself deep in my gut. Chapter 11 Nastasia I knocked for the third time and waited. Again, no one answered, but when I checked the side of the house, both of their cars were in the driveway. I could have used my key, but they were trying for a baby, and I didn't want to be traumatized by the sight of my brother's bare ass while he tried to implant a magic bean into Mina's belly. If they weren't here, and their cars hadn't moved, there was only one other place they could be. Sasha's. Did I want to take the short hike over to my eldest brother's? Not really, no. But regardless of how broody his ass had been lately, I did love him. So I supposed it was only sisterly to stop by and give him a little shit. I was kind of giddy over the fact that I'd slept the night before. Actually slept. It was the second night Vic slept over. The first night, I was admittedly a mess. However, last night, I wasn't so fearful. It was as though I'd been expecting him. Like I knew he'd come. And knowing he would be there calmed my nerves, giving me the strength to ignore the decomposing corpse who fought desperately for a place in my psyche. It was around nine o'clock when I saw the stream of light sweep past my front window. I heard the jingle of keys, and I didn't even want to think about how natural it felt for him to use them, as though he belonged here with me. I suppose there was a reason I never asked for them back. He entered my house, and when he found me sitting on the floor in the living room, he approached guardedly. Once I lifted my face to greet him, his cautious gaze swept over my features and I smiled feebly. Gingerly stalking over, he stood close enough that my shoulder brushed his knee, and when he placed his palm on my crown, I leaned into his touch relaxing my weight against his strong leg. Without a word between us, he took my hand and helped me up, gently tugging me along as he brought me up to my room. I stood in the open doorway, unspeaking, with a pounding heart and mild anxiety. But ultimately, the longer I spent out of my room, the more likely it would become a trigger for me. And so I grew a pair and took a single step inside. The second I did, I felt heavy, pressed down with the weight of a ghost. But still, I endured. We dressed for bed in silence, and although Vic brought the spare blankets upstairs, I found I didn't want him away from me. Not tonight. I climbed under the covers and sat up, looking unsure of myself. Vic noticed. Pretense forgotten, he waited patiently at my bedside for the invitation he knew was coming, and when I lifted the covers, he looked relieved. Taking in a deep breath, 
then exhaling slowly, climbing in behind me wearing nothing but black boxers. He wrapped his arm around my waist, pressing his steely chest into my back. He stroked the bare skin of my stomach soothingly. I closed my eyes, taking in his warmth, craving the shelter he provided. With a gentle kiss to my shoulder, he sighed into the pillow, and we drifted off to sleep. I couldn't remember a time I slept better. Hence my good mood. Now, with a sly smile, I readjusted the box I was holding under my arm and made the walk over to Sasha's. It didn't take long. That was one of the most convenient things about living on the same block of land with my brothers. We had always been close, even as kids. The fact that we all agreed to live in such close proximity to one another told you everything you needed to know about how well we got along. Well, most days. And because Sasha never brought women home, it was safe to use my key here. I unlocked the door and let myself in, shuffling the box I held from arm to arm. I followed the sounds of conversation coming from the back of the house, and when I strolled into the kitchen, I peeped Ada preparing dinner. I prowled over, looking over her shoulder before resting my chin on it and letting out a pathetic sounding, Ada, I'm hungry. A long wheeze of a chuckle left her, and she lifted a hand to stroke my hair. I closed my eyes and breathed in her sweet perfume. I've got a batch of blueberry muffins cooling, but I can whip you up something else if you like. Her white, coiffed hair tickled my nose. I wrapped an arm around her middle and cuddled her a moment. I felt the words vibrate through her back and into my chest. Are you staying for dinner, baby? Ada was more than just a cook, more than the property's caretaker. Having worked for the Lyakovs for more than 25 years, she was family. I loved her dearly. We all did. But to me, she acted as a stand-in to the mother I lost. Many times during my teenage years, poor Ada had borne the brunt of the flurry of hormones wreaking havoc on my body. Having no other women to help me through it, she sat me down one day and talked to me about it. She took my hands in hers and held it tightly. Your body is making some changes, honey. Those changes are making you into a woman. The problem is, you have a mind of a girl and it's finding it hard to deal with these big womanly emotions you're feeling. And baby, I'm so sorry for that. No one said becoming a woman was easy. It was so simply put, but I would never forget it. The kindness she showed me while managing to explain the whole puberty thing in a way I could understand was beautiful. Ada really was a wonderful person. I wasn't invited. I muttered, feigning hurt. Ada laughed before leaning back to look at me. Remind me when that has ever stopped you. I grinned and she half-heartedly shooed me away. Help yourself to a muffin. I took three. And don't think I don't see what you're doing, young lady. Dinner is at six sharp and if you ruin your appetite, I'll be very disappointed. The moment I walked into the backyard, juggling muffins and the box I'd been carrying, I spotted Lev sitting at the outdoor setting with Sasha while Lydia ran circles around Mina, who was blowing bubbles much to the enjoyment of the almost four-year-old. I did the obligatory thing and greeted my brothers first, leaning down to their proffered cheeks and pecking them lightly before placing everything on the table and heading out to my niece at a full-blown run. Once she spotted me, she did that gorgeous little gasp laugh she always did when she was excited and shrieked, running in the opposite direction. Where are you going? I damn near snorted when she tripped and rolled, but righted herself and kept on running. Shit, she was quick. Mina called out, holding back a laugh. Faster, Liddy, faster. I was huffing and puffing by the time I caught up to her, and when I scooped her up in my arms, the ear-piercing squeal she let out almost burst my eardrums. I growled and snorted like a monster, kissing her chubby cheek a thousand times before putting my nose to her dark brown curls as she wiggled in my arms, trying her hardest to escape and have me chase her again. Her scent was baby powder and strawberries. It had been since the second she was born. It was something that was forever etched in the deepest pits of my brain. I honestly didn't think I could love anyone as much as my little chubby dumpling Lydia. Sitting her high up on my hips, she continued to wriggle until I said, I got you something. 
You want a present? Liddy stilled immediately and peered up at me with wide eyes the color of gooey caramel framed by the longest lashes you ever did see. Her squeaky little voice was enough to make me ovulate. A present for me? Lev frowned. Nastasia, must you spoil her? What a question. I shot him a puzzled look. Uh, yeah, I must. I walked Liddy to the table, then set her down by the edge, taking the box and handing it to her. It was too big to fit in her hands, so I held it while she took a good look at the pictures. The moment she saw what it was, her mouth rounded in a comically round O, and she gasped none too quietly, looking around the table to see if everyone else was seeing what she was seeing. My smile was gargantuan. Nothing made me feel the way I felt when I spoiled my niece. Fairies? she whispered, and her eyes sparkled. She looked up at me, and her squeaky voice inquired, Do you live in this one? Her stubby little finger pointed at the box. I nodded at the image of the toadstool fairy house. They sure do. And if you're really quiet and watch very closely, you might even see one. But you have to be quiet, or you'll scare them away. Liddy breathed in deeply, her expression full of awe, like she had just discovered the meaning of life. Oh my, a quiet toy? Mina's face was reverent. She placed her hands together, the image of the Madonna herself, then spoke a soft, God bless you, Naz. I winked at Mina and just couldn't help myself. I hurled Liddy back into my arms and held her tight, melting as she giggled. This time she put her chubby arm rolls around me and hugged me back. Resting her head on my shoulder, there really was no greater feeling in the world than being trusted by a child in this capacity. I dared someone to hurt my little fluffy donut. God help the person who tried. They'd have to answer to me, and I didn't give a shit if you were five years old or fifty. I would cut a bitch. The back door opened, and believing it was Ada, I didn't turn to see who it was. But then he spoke. What the hell? Y'all are having a party? I guess my invite was lost in the mail. Lev uttered, Your family, Victor, your invitation is implied. Not one of you rang the doorbell, you realize that, don't you? Sasha scowled. I think it's time I change the locks. I spun just in time to see Vic approach, and when he did, he said, Hey, baby. Call it habit. Hi, was my breathy response, because he looked like sacks in gray sweats, worn low on his hips, and a black tee that hugged every muscular ridge of his torso in an obscene way. He stopped a foot away and watched me with sly eyes, as if searching for any sign of my falling apart. When he was satisfied that I was okay, he reached out and took my niece out of my arms. Without falter, Liddy went to him, and when he held her fast and looked down at her with love in his eyes, he said, Hey, baby. A second time, and my stomach dropped right out of my asshole. Oh, God. Oh, God. God, my brain gasped with realization. He wasn't talking to me. My neck heated with mortification. Was there a hole nearby that I could crawl into? Perhaps a cliff to punt myself off of? You moron. He winked at me and very obviously held in a laugh, like he knew exactly what happened. Too embarrassed to speak, I bit the tip of my tongue and held my breath for a full minute to stop the deranged shriek that threatened to escape me. Vic moved to sit at the table with Lydia in his lap, and she was happy to sit there, peering up at him with a sweet, toothy smile. I joined the rest of them, parking myself at the opposite end of the table, far, far away from the man who turned me into a simpleton with nothing more than a greeting. While Sasha got into conversation with Vic, I picked up one of my muffins and nibbled at it. Lev reached for one and I smacked his hand, shooting him a glare. He glared right back, and after a short standoff, I reluctantly handed him one. He peeled off the wrapper and shoved the entire thing in his mouth. As he chewed slowly, trying not to choke, I took another bite and garbled out and amused. Oink, oink. Crumbs flew out of my mouth as I spoke, and I covered my lips, chuckling. 
Lev narrowed his eyes at me but softened the admonishment with a twitch of his lips. Mina heard me and rushed to her husband's defense. She stood behind him and hugged him close, cradling his head awkwardly to her small bosom. Don't listen to her, sweetie. I like the way you eat. Go ahead and finish your muffin. Lev's hand came up to caress her shoulder, and they really did make me sick sometimes. It was unnatural to be as cute as they were. My gaze was slowly being drawn to the tall, built man, currently pretending to eat my niece's round fist, and it took everything I had to feign boredom, when really my ovaries were throbbing. At this point, distraction was a good call. I took an empty muffin wrapper and threw it at the couple across from me. Lev caught it without trying, and Mina poked her tongue out at me. I flipped her the bird, and Lev lightly smacked my hand with a frown. I don't like that, Naz. Mina laughed damn near hysterical at the death stare I was lobbing at my brother. Her laugh turned into a scared giggle when I leaned forward and got into my brother's face. My eye twitched. You don't like that? No, he insisted. I don't. Okay. All right. My hand came out slowly. With my thumb holding my middle finger, he stared at my fingers as they came closer and closer. He flinched mildly when I flicked his nose. What about that? Did you like that? Mina snorted and the hands at Lev's shoulder shook. But Lev wasn't amused. He glowered at me, rubbing his nose. Not at all. And yet, I grinned, it didn't stop me from doing it, did it? Lev's lips thinned. No, I suppose it didn't. I slapped a hand to his knee good-naturedly. Pick the battles you want to win, moi brat. Surprisingly good advice, uttered Sasha from the other side of the table. My nose bunched at the surprise in his tone. I do have a brain, you know. Then it stands to wonder why you rarely use it, was the smartest response I got from my eldest brother. Lev snuffled while Mina barked out a laugh so hard she wheezed. Vic coughed to cover his mirth, turning away so I couldn't see his face. My eyes narrowed dangerously. A slight smile lit Sasha's mouth. I didn't want to find it funny, but it was. And when my lip twitched, his brow rose in victory. Kakashka, was all I managed to say, because he really was a piece of shit sometimes. The mood was light and breezy until it wasn't. Sasha's phone rang, and when he saw who was calling, he answered right away. Hello? Then, yes, I'm home. He sat up straighter. Look, not that it's any of your business, but he came to me. He glared down at his phone. Fuck. Sasha cleared his throat. We're about to have company. Sasha stood, bracing, and the vibe around us changed dramatically. A few minutes passed, and my heart stuttered as Philippe Niège, my ex fiance strode into the backyard. I sat up taller at his unexpected entrance. His dark blonde hair was no longer set in unruly surfer waves that you wished to run your hands through, but cut short in a business do. His green eyes always seemed to smile, but they were hard as stone at present. His nose was crooked, but it hadn't always been. Oh, no. Vic helped with that. From the looks of things, Philippe had a bone to pick, and it was with my brother. How could you? His French accent was heavy. He stared unblinkingly at Sasha. I thought we were friends. The tension was thick enough to carve with a knife. My brother responded a mild, We are. Philippe shot back. Bullshit. Friends don't play on family, Sasha. What the hell? I turned to face my brother and asked, What is he talking about? But Sasha didn't bother to look at me. He merely said to the angry Frenchman, Listen to me, Philippe. He came to me. He seemed desperate. I just gave him what he needed. No harm, no foul. The face Philippe made was one of a man who couldn't believe what he was hearing. He is a 21-year-old gambling addict, you inconsiderate prick. Why didn't you call me? His tone rose. 
I would have called you. Frost lined Sasha's words. If he wanted you to know, he would have come to you. Looking back and forth between them, I was so confused. Philippe rounded on him, and Vic stepped in his way, handing Lydia to Mina. Cool it, Frenchie. Liddy, let's go inside and see if Ada's got a yummy snack for us, Mina told the little girl with a feigned smile. But when her anxious eyes shot to Lev, he simply gave her a curt nod. Philippe waited until the little girl was out of sight before he snarled at Vic. Get the fuck out of my way, you second-rate mall cop. From the way Vic looked at him, his slow but vicious smile stretching his lips, I could tell he badly wanted to add another scar to the man's face as he'd done the first. Holy hell, this was escalating quickly. I had to step in. This man had once meant something to me, which was why he and Vic would never get along. They would take any excuse to lash into each other. I stepped into the middle of them, put my hand on Philippe's chest. Stop it! When neither of them moved, I pushed at Philippe and said, That's enough! Philippe looked over my head, rage seeping out of every pore, smirking at Vic. You always need a woman to protect you. If only that were the truth. But no. Rather, I was protecting him from Vic, because Vic would tear him apart. I witnessed it once before. It was utterly terrifying. Hey, I cupped Philippe's face in my hands and pulled at his cheeks. Philippe. Finally, he looked down, and when his eyes regained focus, I said gently, Look at me. Philippe lost some of his steam. His quiet words were spoken just for my ears. Allô, mon ange. Hi, I smiled softly. And when his rough hand came to rest over mine, his fingers tightened on my own, and I returned the squeeze. Now that things were a touch calmer, I stepped away and looked around at the men around me, ready to pounce at a moment's notice, and asked, What the hell is going on here? No one spoke for a while, until Philippe let out a hostile, What's going on is that the person who I considered a friend went behind my back. I did not go behind your back. Sasha exhaled very clearly frustrated. He came to me and decided to loan my younger brother a hundred and fifty large. My chest ached. I slowly turned to look at Sasha, my expression stoic. From somewhere behind me, Lev asked, Is this true? Philippe went on, and his gaze on my eldest brother was unwavering. Oh, it's true, all right. Imagine giving an addict that amount of money. You may as well have put a bullet in his brain. How was he meant to pay that back, let alone the exorbitant interest, huh? Sasha? My brow lowered, the disappointment I felt palpable. My brother simply watched Philippe closely. He's a grown man. Philippe thundered. He's a child. When Sasha had nothing to say to that, Philippe reached into the back of his pants and took out two five-inch stacks of crisp hundreds, throwing them onto the table. This is a hundred and sixty grand for the inconvenience, and you'll not get a cent more from me. Understand, asshole? Easy, muttered Vic dangerously, taking a step closer in warning. Sasha sighed then, and for the first time in forever, he actually looked contrite. Philippe. But Philippe simply shook his head as he cut him off. No, you had your chance to talk to me. He took a step backward with a passing glance to my brother. You will get no other. His voice rough, he stated. We are done. And I could tell he meant it. Wait. My heart broke for him as I watched him go. Philippe! I turned to face my cold, unfeeling brother. Sash, you're just going to let him go? I blinked in disbelief. Apologize to him. For what? was Sasha's empty reply. My heart beat a little faster. Are you kidding me? Sasha picked up the money on the table, peering down at the heavy stacks in his hands. His blunt statement made me wonder if my brother really was the monster he made himself out to be. 
It's just business. And my gut sank. Because after what I just witnessed, there was every possibility he was. Chapter 12 Nastasia Troubled by what occurred the day before, I found myself at my uncle's door the very next morning. Nicholas let me in, and the moment Laredo took in my tired expression, he stood and opened his arms to me. I didn't want to be that girl, but damn, I needed the comfort. And so I stepped into his waiting arms and allowed myself to be held. Last night, Vic found me in my room, sitting up in my bed waiting, and he undressed easily. I pulled up the covers, and under he slipped. He held me all night, and my mother kept her distance. She usually did when Vic was around. Perhaps it was because he consumed me in every which way. When Vic was close, it was impossible to think of anything other than the man himself. He overrode my thoughts. A usually annoying peculiarity that just happened to come in handy the past few days. As per the current routine, I woke alone, but I woke rested. Is he here? I asked my uncle quietly, and I didn't need to elaborate. He pulled back to look down at me, and when he shook his head, I closed my eyes and uttered, I didn't know. I blinked up at him. He has to know that, right? Uncle Laredo's brows pulled down. Of course he does, sweet girl. Philippe doesn't blame anyone for what happened more than he blames himself. He shot me a sad smile. It's been a rough year for him. Well, that sure as shit didn't make me feel any better. Where is he? I don't know. I stared incredulous. If you knew, would you tell me? My uncle smiled gently at my ability to see through his bullshit. He wishes to be alone, to take some time to help his brother. I've allowed it. Laredo cupped my cheek. I protect my boys, sweetheart. My stomach twisted, because although he may not have meant it as a stab, it definitely felt like one towards Sasha. Worse than that, my brother deserved it. Fair enough. I half rolled my eyes. What about the other one? My uncle's smile lifted. Now he is in his room. You're welcome to wake him up. With a quick kiss to his cheek, I moved down the long hall, and when I got to his room, I opened the door just a sliver. The room was pitch black and smelled of his aftershave. I called out quietly, Alessio? After all, he was a grown man, and he could have been doing grown man things in that room. I didn't want to catch him unaware. Less? No response. Was he even in here? I pushed the door a little, allowing some of the light from the hall to penetrate. Under the silken navy covers, the shape of him was clear, and when I was sure he was decent, I tiptoed into the room, stood by his bed, and smiled down at his scarred, sleeping face. He looked so peaceful. Oh well. Spreading my wings, I threw my arms out at my sides and flew. My body connected with his. At the moment of impact, he doubled over in pain, pushing me off, and let out a long, wheezed, Oh, fuck my nuts! While I rolled onto the free side of his bed, I rested my cheek on my upturned hand and said sweetly, Good morning. Oh, my. If looks could kill. I laughed in complete silence. Alessio glared at me with tired eyes before throwing his head back onto the pillow and groaning. You bitch. He cupped himself through the sheets. Ah, my dick. Okay, so I did feel bad. Not enough to not taunt him, though. I'll bet Cora would rub it better. Nice. He growled in warning, and I lifted both my hands in the air in apology. As he half panted, I watched his eyes narrow on me. What are you doing here? It's too fucking early. A scoff ripped out of my throat. It's 11 a.m., sir. Get your tight butt out of bed and take me out for coffee. What? He uttered, and his entire body stilled. His eyes darted around and his lip curled. Cautiously, he inquired. Like a date? Ew. I tasted sick in my mouth and visibly recoiled. We're cousins, dude. 
Alessio seemed a little offended at my disgust. Twice removed, through adoption, not by blood. I couldn't help the strained chuckle that escaped me as I drew out the question. Wait, are you offended? Do you want me to want to date you? Jesus, no. He glowered at me, and I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it, but his cheeks turned pink. What kind of friend would I be if I didn't mess with him a little? I can pretend, if you want me to. I went on, my body shaking with merriment. Hold your hand and all. God. Alessio ran a hand down his face. You're so tiring, woman. He sounded so drained, so weary, that I decided to give him a break. I sat up against the headboard and pushed down the need to fuck with him some more. Look, I'm sorry, okay? It's just that everyone has some type of shit going on at the moment. Lev and Mina are busy doing... Each other? He offered, and I nodded. And Sasha is... I paused. An asshole? Alessio provided. Well, yeah. That was exactly why I hung out with Alessio. I was under no illusions about the person he was. He was cold and hard, and he could be downright cruel. But still, he understood me. Cora is studying, Annika is around, but I don't feel right piling my crap onto her, and Vic... My heart squeezed. Our current sleeping situation hadn't mended the invisible wall between us. Every so often something funny would happen, or I would get frustrated about work or my brothers or life in general. Someone would piss me off and I'd need to vent, or I'd experience something that I wanted to share. And there was only one person I wanted to share those things with. I had lost count of the number of times I held my phone in my hand, writing out a text, or had my finger hovering above his name, just wanting to share myself with him like I had since we were teenagers. The unfortunate fact was he wasn't mine to call anymore. It was rough. Suddenly, after 13 years, I didn't know where I fit in, and it was a new experience. Alessio looked at me a long minute. I felt his eyes on me, looking hard, searching for something. I didn't know whether he found what he was looking for, but he sighed, then finally said, All right, get up. We'll get coffee and... His lip curled as he said the dreaded word, Talk. He slipped out of bed wearing nothing but gray boxer briefs, and as he dragged on his jeans, I stealthily took out my phone. He sprayed himself with deodorant before pulling on a navy and long-sleeved tee. When he bent over to put on his shoes, I quickly snapped a pic of his butt and sent it to Cora. He stepped into the joining bathroom and began to brush his teeth as I got a text back. Cora. Um, is that who I think it is? Me. It is. Cora. Why are you torturing me? I thought you loved me. Crying face. Cora. Also, fap, 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 fap. I laughed out loud and Alessio's head peeked out of the bathroom. His mouth frothy and white with foaming toothpaste, he made a curious face but had the sense not to ask. Me, gotta go. We're getting coffee. Talk later. Cora, talk me up, bitch. X. Me, always. X. When we walked down the hall side by side, Alessio stopped into his father's office to tell him where we were headed, and when Uncle Laredo looked between us, a tender smile graced his lips. I like that. This is nice. You should spend some time together. With family. With the promise of bringing him a coffee upon our return, we got into Alessio's black BMW M2, and he drove us to a nearby cafe. Once seated, I told him what I wanted, and he went to the counter to place the order. He returned with his cappuccino and my hazelnut latte, then went back to the counter a moment. When he placed a slice of chocolate cake in front of me, I glanced up at him surprised. His shoulder jerked lightly. You look like you could use a little sweetness right now. A sluggish smile stretched my lips. If that wasn't the nicest thing Alessio had ever said to me. I'm starting to get what Cora sees in you. Naz. He moaned in irritation. Please don't start. I'm not in the mood. I know I give you a lot of shit. That's just what family does, Alessio. 
I brought a crumb of cake up to my lips. But I was being serious. I rolled my eyes as if saying it out loud pained me. You're a good guy. I saw the moment he recognized my sincerity. He looked taken aback. When he cleared his throat and let out an unsure sounding, uh, thanks, I guess. I found myself feeling something more than impartiality for this broken and scarred man. You're welcome. A small bout of silence passed before Alessio shuffled on his chair and lifted his coffee to his lips, sipping. I heard what happened yesterday. Yeah, he would have. That's pretty fucked up, even for a cold bastard like me. I nodded down at my cake. It was, and I didn't know how to make it better. He put down his cup. I'm surprised everyone left in one piece. They almost didn't, I revealed. I thought Vic was going to rip Philippe's head off and piss on it. Alessio frowned. Nothing new there. They've been at each other's throats for months. Years, really, but... I went over what he said and how he said it. I heard something in that statement. What do you mean, four months? They don't get along. It's got to be difficult for them, you know, at the club. Uh, what now? At the club? Both of my brows rose and I sputtered, Excuse me? Alessio blew out a breath, looking mildly frustrated. Aphrodite's kiss. Your ex fiance and your main squeeze working together? He shook his head at me, puzzled. Any of this ringing a bell, princess? A chill went through me and my entire body turned numb. No? No, it sure as hell was not. I spoke very slowly. Vic's been working at Aphrodite's kiss? My question brought on an instant change in his face. Alessio blinked at me, falling back in his seat. It took him a minute to say, You didn't know. Ding, 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 give the man a prize. My mouth dry, I all but croaked. How long? Alessio, knowing he said too much, just shrugged. I don't know. Alessio. It was a plea, plain and simple. His shoulders fell and he dipped his head, rubbing a hand over his jaw. Six or seven months. Okay, all right. Don't freak out, Naz. Be cool. But I did not feel cool. I felt barely composed. And... What does he do there? Alessio reached up to scratch at his neck, and the move told me he was uncomfortable telling me what he was about to. Odd jobs, mostly security. He's a good door bitch. He spoke soberly, and suddenly what Philippe said to Vic the day before ran through my head on the loop. Get the fuck out of my way, you second-rate mall cop. My gut twisted. I felt like I was imploding on myself, and I was pretty sure I knew the answer to the question I was about to ask. What are his hours? Naz. Alessio attempted to be Switzerland. Neutral. I don't think I should be talking to you about this. Maybe you should talk to Vic. My brain snapped like a rubber band. I grated out. Don't you think I would, if I could? He's impossible. Every time I try to talk to him, he fights me on purpose. So one of two things happens. Either fight or fuck. I just want answers. Alessio took in a deep breath and spoke on an exhale. He works Friday through Monday, 2.30 till 5. I was so confused. The bewildered word that left me sounded strained, even to my ears. Why? Think that's pretty obvious, Naz. Alessio answered with a cold laugh. He needs the money. That was crazy. He had money. As Vic's girl, I was privy to most everything, his finances being one of those things. I'd seen the accounts myself. Hell, at the later stage of our relationship, I'd even do his banking for him, paying his bills while he slept with his head in my lap, a frown permanently etched on his face. Vic did well for himself. At least he had when we were together. Sure, he wasn't Scrooge McDuck diving into pits full of gold coins, 
but he had savings enough that I wasn't worried about him paying his rent or missing payments on his car. A terrible feeling twisted the pit of my stomach. It sat heavy, like a rock, until it overshadowed every other emotion striving to be heard. My internal dialogue must have shown some, because when Alessio asked, How much do you earn, Naz? My head snapped up. I don't. I shook my head confused by the question. What? How much do you earn? He asked again. I wasn't 100% sure, but I thought it was close to the figure I gave. Around seven and a half a month? Okay. Alessio got out his phone and got into the calculator. That's 90 grand a year. Yeah, that sounded about right. Then he asked, Do you know how much the average bartender earns in Jersey? No, I didn't. But he told me. Anywhere between 13 and $17 an hour, all right? What? No way. That sounded awfully low. He went on. I don't know about you guys, but we pay around the 16 mark. And if you got a bartender earning 16 bucks an hour for 15 hours a week, do you know what their paycheck looks like? My stomach sank. I had no clue. That's $240 a week. So a little over a grand a month. About 12 and a half a year. Now these are all just figures here, plus tips, less taxes, and life expenses. Do you think a person can live off that alone? What about a single parent who needs to feed and clothe their kids? How about someone with health issues? Or the sole supporter of their family? I was beginning to get the point. My tongue felt like sandpaper in my mouth. My reply full of regret. No. Alessio began to nod in agreement. Now I'm not saying Vic earns so little because I know he doesn't. But every now and again, it's good to take a look at what your employees are earning versus what the lucky sons of bitches like us earn. Because it's crumbs, babe. I can tell you right now that Vic ain't earning 90 grand a year to sling drinks and roster bar bitches on. You get me? I did. And none of it sat well with me. Alessio was not a stupid man. So when he said, I don't know what his circumstances are, but if he says he needs the money... I'm inclined to believe him. It broke me, because I didn't know. The timeline matched up. Aniko was right, and my insides burned with the realization. Vic wasn't cheating on me. He'd been working, and I punished him for it by dumping his ass. I felt ill. My breath left me in a whoosh. I closed my eyes, breathed deep, and whispered, Oh, no. What have I done? Instead of asking him about it, I assumed and judged and misread everything. All of that, and he still looked after me, sleeping beside me, lending me his strength when I had none. A sudden thought hit me. Am I the villain in our story? My eyes opened, and I blinked away the sting behind my lids. I rocked lightly and wrung my hands together, just needing to move. My voice was quiet. I think I've made a huge mistake, Les. When I looked up at him, the expression he wore was one of concern. Can I help? No. I huffed out an acidic laugh before running my cold hands down my face, resting them on my warm cheeks. Shame tore through me in red-hot waves. No one can. My inner turmoil ate away at my sanity, and long after Alessio had taken us back to his house and I drove myself home, I sat alone in the dark and tried in vain to put the pieces of this puzzle together. But I couldn't. I just couldn't. None of it made sense. Feeling a little lost and rather alone, I needed clarity, so I went to Sasha's, let myself in, and waltzed down to his office. He sat there, looking down at a document in his hand. I knocked lightly, and his brow furrowed as he lifted his head. He looked tired. And yes, I realized that whatever shitty way he was feeling was entirely his own fault. But he was still my brother. I lifted my finger in a light wave. Nastasia? 
The small smile that lifted his mouth was almost sad. I wasn't expecting you. Are you ever? I nearly scoffed. No. His smile spread. I suppose not. What followed was silence, and a lot of it. I wished to unload. I wanted to tell him a hundred things about Philippe, about Vic, but one look at his weary face told me that today was not the day. And I was ever a merciful sister. He spoke without emotion. Are you just going to stand there all day, or are you going to yell at me like you planned to? A deep sadness flowed through me. Was that what he thought of me? Was I really such a witch? My brow lowered as I walked into the room, dropped my gaze, and let out an almost offended, I wasn't going to yell at you. No. Sasha chuckled roughly, but there was no humor in it. None. His sigh sounded defeated. I think you may be the only one. Oh, hell. Nope, I did not like it, not even a little. And suddenly my legs were moving. I don't know why I did it. We were not the type of family. But I felt that I needed it almost as much as he did. My feet carried me around to him, to the back of his chair, and he watched me with caution. When I stood directly behind him, I put my hands to his large shoulders and bent down, sliding my arms around him. He did not react. And yes, it felt awkward. But I thought to combat the yucky feeling by closing my eyes and breathing in the oddly comforting woodsy scent of him. I embraced my brother tightly, burying my nose into the dip of his shoulder, then uttered quietly, Everything's gonna be okay, Sash. I finished on a squeeze. It felt like forever. And just as I thought to release him, his hand came up to rest on my forearm. It was careful and light, as though he did not know what to do with the affection. Lord, something about that made the sadness inside me swell. My brother may not have been a terribly good man, but he did the best he could with the life he was born into. He went from father figure to mob boss to club owner within a few hectic years. It had to have been difficult for him, like asking a predator to stop preying on the weak when it was all he ever knew. It was almost cruel. After all, you wouldn't ask a lion to turn vegan. And Lord, he tried. He tried so hard. Sasha's hand gently squeezed my arm, and he cleared his throat before he spoke. You need something? No. I pulled away, but let my hands linger on his shoulders. Ask the question. He turned to face me, his bored blink and casual wave telling me to spill it. Ask him. I was just wondering. Just ask. Say it. Say, how much does Vic earn? Yes, Sasha prompted impatiently. And although the question remained poised at the tip of my tongue, my stomach twisted with regret as I cleared my throat, shook my head, and instead said, I was wondering if you wanted to split dinner with me. I feel like Chinese, but don't want to eat alone. He watched me guardedly as though he knew that wasn't what I was going to say originally. So for good measure, I added, Plus, I thought you could use the company. Coward. My brother's careful, slightly delayed response had me smiling softly. Sure, I'd like that. As it turned out, I could have used the company myself. Even if that company was Sasha. Chapter 13 Nastasia I was going to fuck a bitch up. As I kept peering up at the offending couple, my lips thinned, and I thought back on what I had done so badly in my short life that I was being punished like this. I was a decent person. I didn't lean one way or another, good or bad, but I minded my business when necessary and only got involved when required. Always spared a smile for children and the elderly. I ate well. I didn't drink in excess. 
I hadn't touched drugs since my 20s. Yeah, I had an attitude, but I was loyal, kind-hearted, and generous to those closest to me. Brought up Russian Orthodox, I no longer followed any specific religion, but never begrudged or ridiculed someone for their beliefs. I donated clothes and money to charity, sponsored a child in a third-world country, and tried to do my part to be kinder to the environment. Sure, I could have been nicer to people, but had you met some? They sucked. If I could wrap up my life in a neat little bow, I wasn't a bad person. I hadn't committed any real wrongs, and my family loved me. So why did life insist on being a rabid bitch to me? My blood boiled as I seethed inwardly, my face the picture of calm. The music blared, and I glanced over at the stage as Bleeding Hearts' owned Diamond Dozen danced in their little sexy outfits. Annika slid past me, reaching over to grab a bottle of Patron Grand Platinum, pouring the shots effortlessly. Tonight, she was dressed as a slutty Red Riding Hood. Our newest bar bitch, Francesca, moved around us in a flawless dance, taking orders as she went. The cowgirl costume she wore was so tiny, the curve of her ass showed every time she reached up to retrieve liquor bottles off the top shelf. I knew some women had a problem with how we were dressed, but my view was that it was only oppressive if you felt oppressed, and none of the girls here did. In fact, most of us felt empowered by the fact that we could make a man do just about anything we asked simply by flashing a dude an inch of skin. Like a well-oiled machine, we worked seamlessly, and we got shit done. It was a Friday night, and we'd be open until 2 a.m. It was busier than usual, but that wasn't a bad thing. Our tips alone would be completely worth the excess ass grabs. The apprehension in me had eased some, but knowing what I knew now, I understood that Vic would not be climbing into my bed this night. He would have to work till dawn, and that brought on mild angst within myself that I would just have to figure out on my own. I couldn't be shielded by his arms forever. The bar flap lifted, and Bertie, the bar manager, sashayed on in, taking an order without pause. Her brown skin shimmered in the low light, her cheekbones lighting up with every flash on stage. Her eyes drifted to where my laser vision was pointed. She poured a couple of whiskey neats, took the customer's money, then yelled over the music. Rain and in, girl! My teeth were locked tight and my eye was twitching. I was trying, but it was hard. As though he could feel me burning holes into the skull of the woman seated beside him, laughing openly and touching his forearm, his brow nodded and he twisted his body, his gaze resting right on me. The moment his eyes met mine, I lowered them, but it didn't matter. I was sure he'd seen me. And yeah, maybe tonight wouldn't have sucked so much if Fawn, one of the newest members of the Bleeding Hearts family, hadn't casually stopped by the bar with her tray, an excited look on her face, and an innocently happy, isn't Vic just the sweetest? Behind the bar, four sets of eyes turned on her, and the intensity in our matching gazes must have had an impact, because quite suddenly, Fawn's smile fell. Now, Francesca had only been with us a couple of months. She was loud and opinionated, but there was something about her that resonated with me. It hadn't taken long for her to guess that Vic and I had a complicated history. So when she asked point-blank if Vic was on the menu, the glower I had given in response was all she needed to put her hands up in a placating gesture, along with a muttered, Got it. Off limits. Yeah, Chessie was a smart woman. Fawn, regrettably, was as naive as they came. She still wore the smile of a woman who hadn't yet had her heart broken. She still had an innocence about her that hadn't been shattered, and worst of all, she was button-nose cute and dressed like a sexy little doe. That little nose turned up as she squinted endearingly. Oh, is there a no fraternizing policy here? My God, she was Bambi levels of sweet. Something like that. I offered. Chessie then added, Listen, sweetheart, you don't shit where you eat. Find a guy outside of work and bang him till your ears bleed. But keep your workspace clear. Fawn looked like she had just swallowed her tongue when Bertie laughed. Listen to those girls, baby, they know a thing or two about it. And when Fawn's innocent gaze landed on Annika, she nodded sympathetically. Workplace relationships are messy, 
We don't want messy. Fawn looked devastated, and I felt both shitty and victorious. But my stomach clenched violently when she smiled, then shrugged. I guess I'll just have to settle with a little flirting. Before I could object, she was halfway across the room, sashaying toward him. I kept a close eye on her, but when I saw Vic wasn't engaging, I calmed mildly and let it go. I shouldn't have. The next night, before opening, I strolled backstage to find Bertie when I heard them talking and stilled, eavesdropping just behind the curtain. No way! Girl, I seen it. I don't believe you. You don't have to. I'm just warning you as all. That woman is scary. She don't look it to me. That's because you haven't seen her fly across a bar and platforms and try to knock some poor bitch out for talking to her man. She paused. Trust me, Vic's not worth the misery Nastasia will pile on you. My eyes narrowed as I listened in. Well, that little doe was flirting with him last night and she didn't do shit, so maybe she's over him. My heart beat faster. A thoughtful sound came. I don't know, maybe. Another woman piped in, and this voice I recognized. The heavy jersey accent was a dead giveaway. Who gives a fuck if she gets mad? I don't care if he's got a woman or a wife or any of that shit. If I say he's available, he is, and it's up to him to prove me wrong. I could damn well hear the smirk in her voice. I never have a problem with competition, seeing as I always win. Oh yeah, that's nice. Real nice. A round of scoffs went through the room, and when Lush let out an annoyed sounding, What? You don't believe me? I'll prove it to you. Hell, let's start a kitty going. I want to get paid. My jaw tightened almost painfully when I heard one girl call out, I'll take that bet. Me too. Girl, I am only participating in the hopes of seeing you get your smug ass beat. And Lush simply replied, Please, bitch, I was raised on the streets. She ain't nothing I can't handle. You think that prim and proper princess could take me on? The words dripped venom. I'd like to see her try. Another one of the girls tried to talk sense into her. Honey, don't do it. You're going to end up signing your own death warrant. Oh, please. God, Lush was cocky. Y'all make it sound like she actually got pull. When we all know as long as we keep Sasha happy, he going to keep us around. It's just good business. A bitter laugh sounded. Then another dancer chimed in. You know what else is good business, babies? A slight pause. Then, minding your own. Sounds of approval went through the air. I waited another 30 seconds before I strode into the dressing area, and when the women spotted me, some of their faces paled while others widened. And because I wasn't a complete asshole, I smiled and looked around at everyone, but lush as I complimented. Wow, you guys look hot. They preened and smiled and all talked at once, clearly loving the attention. So when Lush uttered, Bitch, I know I look good. While giving me the stink eye, I looked her deep in the eye and smiled in a way that didn't reach my gaze. I'm sorry, I told her, appearing contrite. I don't remember your name. And if looks could kill, she would have flayed me then. I try to remember everyone, but we've had such a big turnover these last few months that names seem inconsequential. Lush knew what I was doing. It was clear that as much as she didn't like me, I did not like her. Wait! I snapped my fingers. They call you... I pretended to struggle. Big or thick or something, right? Her eyes narrowed on me and she spoke through gritted teeth. Lush. I feigned ignorance. Right, yes, lush, that's it. I tilted my head in thought. It's weird, though. When I looked over your resume, her eyes widened and she swallowed hard, her gaze begging me to stop playing. I could have sworn your name was Martha? The laughter that erupted around me was deafening, and I watched Lush die a silent death. Yeah, bitch, I can play too. Satisfied that the disposable dancer now knew I wasn't someone you fucked with, I watched her cheeks flame and kept my stoic gaze on her. You know, when you work in close proximity to people, you really shouldn't go out of your way to piss them off. What had she said? Oh, yes. 
I repeated her words mockingly. But what do I know? My eyes darkened dangerously. It's not like I've got any actual pull. The dancer next to Lush reached out and shook her shoulder as she laughed, and Lush glowered at her, letting out a caustic, Don't touch me, bitch. Another round of hooting laughter sounded, and I took my leave. Just before I left, I heard one of the girls call out to Lush, I told you, didn't I tell her? I told her not to fuck with that woman. Then another, Girl, you're on her radar now. And finally, You're walking on thin ice, Martha. More laughter sounded, and I left it at that, knowing the girls would rib her till it hurt. Sasha taught me how to fire a gun when I was 14. Lev bought me a switchblade and showed me the most efficient way to do the most damage with as little force. Vic trained me self-defense and boxing so I could take care of myself when he couldn't. I was no shrinking violet, and I sure as shit wasn't scared of this skank. I might not have been brought up on the streets, but I was raised by wolves, and our pack thrived on the taste of blood. She was lucky I had only nipped in caution rather than rip her pretty little throat out. Now, as I watched Fawn practically bounce on the spot in excitement as she spoke with Vic, it was about all I could handle. When she put both her hands on his arm and leaned in, laughing at something he said, something clicked inside my head. I was a normally sane woman. Rounding the bar, I threw the flap open hard and heard Annika say, Naz, where are you going? Chessie chuckled and let out a sing-songed, Uh-oh, Fawn's in trouble. I barely heard Birdie over the music. Nastasia, you be kind. She doesn't know any better. Sure, she didn't know any better. But she would. Yeah, I was a decent person. But there was one exception to the rule. I did my best to quell the beast that always seemed to take over whenever Vic was within arm's distance of another woman, and approached with a serene smile on my face. The young woman in the doe outfit smiled widely as I approached. She held her tray to her chest, and the way it made her tits pop was impressive. Hey, I said good-naturedly, trying not to scowl at how cute the deer-like ears looked on her. How do you think you're doing tonight? Fawn responded with a light bounce. I think I'm doing all right. She looked up at Vic, and the want in her eyes was not missed by anyone. Her lashes fluttered. Am I doing okay, Vic? No matter what he wanted you to believe, Victor Nikulin was not a moron. He knew exactly why I was standing there, what had drawn me near. He knew me well enough to know that my eye was twitching and why and because Vic was smarter than he made out, he did not poke the bear. Dipping his chin, he hid a sly smile, then lifted his face, which now wore a well-practiced passive expression. You're doing okay, kid. Kid. Beautiful. My mind blew a chef's kiss. I bit the inside of my cheeks to hide my smile of satisfaction. The way her face fell told me she didn't need that additional cruel taunt. She got the point. She got it real quick. Is he bothering you, Fawn? And because I was feeling extra spicy, I spun on Vic and narrowed my eyes dangerously in warning. You're not getting paid to flirt with the waitstaff, Victor. He leaned his hip against the wall and crossed his arms over his chest, his muscly biceps flexing deliciously. The way he looked at me, his hooded gaze lowering appreciatively to my cleavage, had me feeling bold. The black teddy, thigh-high stockings combo was suddenly a new favorite. It was definitely going into the regular rotation. When he licked his bottom lip slowly, my mouth dried. He looked me over lazily as if he had all the time in the world. And if I were being honest, for as long as he wanted to look me over the way he was, I would make the time. Ness. One word, one syllable, one caution. The way he breathed my name had me stumbling over myself. Lord, why did his voice always sound like sex? My stomach twisted harshly as a sudden flashback. Vic pumping into me from behind, one strong arm wrapped around my waist, 
hauling me back into his thick cock as the other arm came up between my breasts, his hand gently wrapped around my throat, his teeth biting down on my shoulder. Had me lightheaded. I didn't want an audience, so I waited until Fawn scurried away with a quiet apology, before I said, She's young. Maybe Vic didn't get my meaning. She is, he agreed, looking over in her direction, and the longer he stared, the harder my heart began to beat. She's also cute. Or maybe he did. Jealousy tore my insides apart, and although I felt like my world was falling down around me, I did what I always did when I felt this way. I readjusted my crown and pretended I was fine, when all I ever wanted was to take my place on the throne beside his. Chapter 14 Vic Fucking hell. This could not be happening. I worked my ass off. I worked around everyone and everything to deliver while still maintaining some of what was mine, and I couldn't get ahead. It wasn't enough. Hell, I don't know why I was surprised. It was never going to be enough so long as the work I did was by the book. My hand came up to my brow. I rubbed absently at it, my knee bouncing rapidly under the table. What does this mean? The stern, unsympathetic woman seemed perturbed by the question. I have explained this to you, Mr. Nikulin. She shot a mild, unbothered stare to my mother and father, and it took everything I had not to reach across the table and demand she pay for the disrespect. Instead, I clenched my jaw tightly and listened carefully. Yes, you have made payments— but the amount we have stipulated versus what you have offered is not sufficient. Was she fucking stupid? Did she not hear me? It was my turn to glare at her. I asked slowly, once more in death-like calm, What does this mean? Her red lips pursed. She placed her hands carefully on the desk, one folded over the other in poise, and said, it means you have until the end of next month. The end of next month? She couldn't be serious. That's... I did the math in my head. Forty-two days away. Her expression remained unchanged, and I shuffled on my seat before I leaned in, looked her dead in the eyes, and rumbled. You're telling me I have forty-something days to get the money. Without hesitation, she responded. Yes. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Why did I get the feeling she was enjoying this? Jesus Christ, how the fuck was I supposed to get the money in that time? I'd have better luck winning the lottery. With a light sigh, I nodded, then stood. No problem. We'll have it. And as I held out my hand to help my mother up, she uttered, Victor, I don't think we... No. Not now, not in front of her. I cut her off with a firm. It's fine, Ma. My father walked in stoic silence until we were about halfway home, and then he cracked under the pressure. <laughs> Yoy. He crumbled, and he covered his face with shaking hands as he muttered a heavy sounding, Oh, bullshit, moy. And it broke my fucking heart. I reached out and placed my hand on his shoulder. It's okay. My father shook his head and murmured weakly. Not okay. Nothing is okay. This is very bad, Victor. His voice trembled as he closed his eyes and prayed in silence. My entire life, my father was my rock. He may have done some questionable things, but he was a good man who cared for his family and simply wanted the best for them. Now, listening to the fear radiate off of him, nothing hurt quite so much. Pops, stop. I did my best to reassure him. Everything will be okay. I noticed my mother was awfully quiet, and as I peered into my rearview mirror, my chest ached when I saw her blinking away tears. Oh, fuck no. 
Hey, I called back to her. Her lashes glistened as she met my eyes, and I uttered, This is nothing, a hiccup. But my mom did not look convinced. On all that was holy, I vowed, I'm going to take care of this. Everything will be fine. We continued to drive on in silence. And when I pulled up into the driveway of my childhood home, I let them out. That was when Mom noticed I wasn't following and said, Where do you go? Come inside. I'll make you something for it. No shit. I had the best mom. She deserved better. I owed her. I owed them both. I can't. I said quietly, then explained, I gotta see a guy about a job. And when Mom looked to my pops, I could see they wanted to protest, but they couldn't. We needed this. Vit ostrosnium, was my father's gentle caution. Be careful. I will. And because I knew my mother, which meant I knew her worry would consume her, I called out of the window, Hey, Ma! You know, I was thinking, it's been a while since you made Miedovic. Immediately, her face lit up. You want me to make? No, I didn't even like it that much. The cake was sickly sweet, but it was time-consuming, and it would help her focus on something other than the burden. Yeah. A small smile tilted her lips, and she promised, I do it right now, and you can have some before you sleep. Perfect. I watched her walk away before calling after her. Thanks, Ma. My father stood by the passenger side of my car with his hands in his pockets. His lips pursed, and his expression turned despondent as he let out a low, You are a good man, my son. Was I? I wasn't so sure. I'll see you later, Pops. I put the car into reverse, and as I backed out of the drive, I warned, don't eat all my cake. My father chuckled, and I grinned in return, because neither of us cared for it. By the time I got there, I was half mad with apprehension. I needed to fix this. I needed to do it quick. And I only knew of one man who might be able to point me in the right direction. So when I pulled up, stepped out of my car, and approached the front door... I raised my hand to knock and stilled when it swung open. Ada greeted my frowning face with a serene smile. I saw you through the window, Mr. Vic. Please come in. I entered, and she added, He's in his office. Thanks, Ada. I strode down the hall toward Sasha's office and knocked. He sounded distracted when he gave his permission to enter, and I went in. Without a word, I sat in the guest seat directly across from him and waited for his attention. He looked at me, and his brow rose at the sight of me. I guess I wasn't hiding my emotions all too well. Victor, you look like shit. Nice. My brow bunched, and I uttered a light. Fuck you. Sasha's lip twitched before he asked. What's up? Well, shit. There was no easy way to ask this. He would expect an explanation when the only one I had to give was nobody's business. Look, I didn't want it to come to this, but I know you still have contacts amongst the firms, and... I delayed a moment. I need a job. Sasha's brow lowered as I went on. Fast, messy, high-paying. In case he didn't get what I was saying, I ran a hand down my face and added a strained... You got a hookup? Sasha remained quiet a long while, and when he spoke, he said all the things I hoped he wouldn't. How much do you need, brother? I'll go to the bank first thing and sort you out. But I was already shaking my head, and when he asked, What kind of trouble are you in, Vic? I let out a caustic laugh. The urge to bark out a few choice expletives was there on the tip of my tongue. But I took a deep breath and quelled the impulse, looking around his office before I exhaled slowly and said, I need money, but I'm not taking yours. Just as he opened his mouth to argue, I cut him off with a wave of my hand. 
Non-negotiable. If you can help me out by giving me a name, I would appreciate it. But this is a mess I need to take care of myself and man to man. I hope you can respect that. For a moment, he looked to be at war with himself. But after some thought, he opened his drawer, reached into it, and pulled out a business card. With a light sigh, he turned the card over, took his pen, and began to write on it as he spoke. There is one outfit. Newish. Reckless. The kind of psychos who run big and hard, settle scores, and shoot before they speak. They have a reputation for being wild because, well, they are. He continued to jot down what I needed. The guy in charge is Rome. Rome. Never heard of him. Sasha held the card out to me between two fingers, and just when I stretched for it, he pulled out of reach. There are other ways. No, there weren't. I tried. I really did. This was my last shot. My stare must have conveyed my stance, and when he realized I wasn't going to budge, he offered the card once more. Once it was in my grasp, I turned it over and saw Sasha had written the name Rome and a phone number on it. Nothing more. Who are these guys? And when Sasha replied, the disciples, my head snapped up. Excuse the fuck out of me? Eyes wide, I wasn't sure I heard him correctly. The same guys who set fire to that house? I didn't need to elaborate. It was a huge story, made the news for months. Someone had to have seen something. Cops were looking for witnesses, but no one was willing to identify the men who went around wearing their intricate skull masks and the skull-painted cronies. Their weapon choices were barbaric. These guys were fucking animals. Same guys, was all he offered. Right. I didn't know how I felt about working with the same fiends who barbecued a priest in his home in the middle of the night, but for all I knew, he deserved it. So, I guess that only left one question. They pay well? The only thing Sasha said to that was, talk to Rome. Okay. With that, I stood and moved to exit, only pausing at the door to twist back and say, I'd appreciate if this didn't get out. Sasha's golden eyes searched me. I didn't know what he was looking for, but when he found it, his lips thinned and he muttered, You can talk to me. You know that, right? Sure. I don't know why I lied. I guess sometimes it was easier than the truth. Sasha gave me another once-over before turning back to his computer. Watch your back out there, brother he warned, and I don't know why, but I felt he might have underplayed the danger I was putting myself in. But what other options did I have? Screw it. For the right price, I'd dive headfirst into a shark's mouth. Chapter 15 Nastasia We all had secrets. I had some, but Vic had more. I thought I knew most all of his. Like how he told people he didn't like horror movies because they were predictable and they bored him, when in reality he jumped and squirmed at every scare. Or how he hummed quietly to himself when he woke in the early morning. I wasn't sure anybody knew how desperately he wanted a German shepherd. Even his body had its mysteries. I might have been the only person in the world who knew of the single tawny freckle that resided on his left hip. I had pressed my lips to that spot more times than dawn had risen. I worshipped him, a lonely apostle pledging herself to a divine dark god. All I wanted in return? The devotion of a man who may not have had the capacity to give it. Thus was my problem. It left me asking the question of whether I wanted a man who so openly denied his feelings, denied me. I had never given part of myself to anyone expecting the same in return, but the older I got, my stance changed, and resentment built up until it made my usually sweet nature bitter. 
From my bed, I leaned over and peeked inside the bathroom where Mina sat on the vanity with her legs crossed, watching Vic work. And she was helping. You missed a spot, I heard him sigh. Listen, wifey, I don't mind you sitting in and watching me with a hawk's eye, but... The frustration rolled off him in waves, making me smirk. If you don't stop telling me how wrong I'm doing this shit, I'm gonna put a goddamn spatula in your hand and make you do it while I sit and watch. You feel me? Well, you know what they say. Anything men can do, she muttered. Women can do bleeding. I choked on a laugh. Fuck me, was his exasperated reply. Mina sighed to herself, then said, If I don't tell you how wrong you're doing it, she paused a moment, then added a self-assured, then how will you know? When he growled, my shoulders shook in silent laughter, and Mina clucked, Now, now, no need to get touchy. You shouldn't have assigned me your supervisor. And Vic cut in with an irritated, I didn't. If you didn't want my help. At his long, groaned, Jesus Christ. I saw Mina's lips twitch and found my own stretching right along with them. I had to admit, it was fun to rile him up. It was so fun, in fact, that I decided to join in on the game. From my bed, I called out in impatient, How much longer? And when Mina gasped out a light laugh, I got that piercing feeling in my solar plexus the one that said I might have pushed too far. Uh-oh. Vic slowly emerged from my bathroom holding a spatula in one hand and a bucket in the other. His sweat's grout-stained, his glare was lethal. You want to get in here and do it yourself, princess? I blinked innocently. The guy on the video got it done in, like, an hour. I swear, his jaw ticked, and I could almost see him contemplate how much a judge would give him if his defense was, but you should have heard her tone. He closed his eyes, breathed deeply, and might have counted to ten. When he opened his eyes once more, he explained mechanically, The guy on the video has a magical thing called editing software that allows days of work to be comprised in one short video, so the schleps at home don't get discouraged. Should I have egged him on? No. Was it fun, though? Oh, God, yes. The funnest. Also, I might have had a death wish. You could try a little harder, is all. Vic's eyes narrowed on me, and I smiled sweetly. He stalked back into the bathroom, and the next thing I knew, Mina flew out, then stumbled as if he had picked her up and thrown her. And when her face bunched and she let out a heated... Ugh, rude. I was pretty sure that was exactly what he had done. The bathroom door was closed, leaving only a sliver open. And then music was playing on the inside. And Mina made a face. Too far. Too far. I confirmed with a grim nod. She shuffled over and threw herself down on the bed beside me. She blinked up at the ceiling and whispered, He's doing a good job. My response was equally hushed. He really is. He is nothing. Not good enough. Poor excuse for a man. The whispered words echoed through my mind. I shook my head as if to clear it. I hadn't seen my mother visually in days. I took that as a good sign. She still, however, liked to taunt me from within. But the whispers were declining in volume. It wasn't easy, but I was marching on. I refocused, and because Mina seemed somewhat far away, I nudged her shoulder with my foot. She looked at me with tired eyes, and I frowned. You okay? Her misery grew. I want a baby. She ran a feeble hand down her face and revealed quietly. I want it so bad. And we're trying, you know. We're trying every chance we get. I tried not to gag at the image of my brother trying. But nothing's happening. Her lips pulled down in time with her brow as she looked up at me and wondered out loud, What's wrong with me? Oh, 
my sweet sister girl. My expression of shared wretchedness was not feigned. Oh God, Mina, don't do that to yourself, babe. Nothing is wrong with you, I promised. Sometimes it takes a while. I just thought we'd be pregnant by now. Her forearm flopped over her eyes and her voice gentled. I had hoped anyway. I had hoped the same. It was cruel, this waiting game. Hey, sometimes everything just needs to match up at the right time. Like, shit. I rolled my eyes. The planets need to align in just the right way, or you didn't sacrifice your goat at the right time. She snuffled out a small laugh, and I asked carefully, Did you sacrifice your goat at the right time? Her lips twitched. I don't know. I think it was a Saturday. I tutted. Well, there's your problem. It's a Friday job. Mina's chuckle had me grinning like an idiot. It felt good to make her laugh in the face of despair. The front door opened, then closed, and I blinked. Running footsteps sounded, and Mina lifted her head, peeking up at the door with a frown. And when Cora panted out, Holy shit! She held a hand to her chest and huffed. Why are you so bougie? Can't you just live in a single-story house like everyone else? Her brow creased as she gripped her side and winced, fighting through the pain of her cramp. Those stairs are torture. Weird, but okay then. Cora trudged over to the bed, knocking me with her knee. Move over. I shifted to the right, and Cora dove into the place I had previously occupied, and without a second's thought, she started to monologue at Mina. Your brother has to be the most frustrating man on the planet. I mean, what is it going to take? Like, hello, Earth to Alessio. Nice, loyal, freaky-ass chick wanting to get down with your sullen ass, but no. She shook her head. And I swear to God, the more he pushes me away, the more I want to dick down. She emphasized the last two words with two solid claps. Mina's face screwed up. Ew. Mine shot straight to the bathroom door. Cora, no. But Cora did not listen. She didn't even pause. I mean, I get it. He's this whole broody, damaged, anti-hero kind of dude. And I am down for that. I mean, I didn't even know it was a thing of mine. But those scars. Her brows rose slowly. They make me tingle, girls. Cora, I tried to warn her. Alas, Cora did her. And she did it in the most Cora way possible. Like, sir, I've got a back entrance and a front entrance, and I don't care which one you come in through as long as you paint my walls white when you leave. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. Corinna was all Mina managed to cry. The laughter that left me was a wheeze if I ever heard one. I could not even, not even a little. When I heard the bathroom door squeak, I covered my suddenly hot cheeks with my hands and waited. I know I didn't hear what I just heard. Vic uttered collectedly, but his eyes lit in laughter, and I watched Cora's soul leave her body. Eyes wide, she stuttered. What, what are you doing here? She then turned to me with a frown. What is he doing here? I tried to tell you. I chuckled out with a shrug. But Vic leaned against the bathroom doorway, undoubtedly fascinated. Is that how chicks really talk about us guys? Because I gotta say, I thought it was all feelings and bullshit. But this? His grin was cunning. This, I like. No, I crowed, but my cheeks burned. Mina shook her head and insisted, I don't talk like that. But Cora turned on me. Yeah, right. Just a couple of weeks back, she said something. Uh, what was it again? My eyes snapped to her and begged. Her eyes narrowed on me in treachery. Oh, yeah, she was so horny that she wanted you to rearrange her guts, stroke her hair, and call her pretty? Are you freaking kidding me? 
Oh, no, she didn't. Please tell me she didn't. My stomach ached. Oh, no. Ness, Mina said in prude-like disbelief. Embarrassment ate me whole. My palms began to sweat. I closed my eyes, contemplating whether if I laid still enough, they would think I was dead and just go away. Vic, I didn't. But Cora spoke over me, letting out a sing-songed, She's so totally dead. And when he began to chuckle, it was too much. I turned to Cora and scowled. You're an asshole. She shrugged. No change of me, bitch. Vic's laughter continued, and when it died, he uttered a lusty, Now that's something I'd make time for. The way he said it made memory after memory light up in my mind, a never-ending slideshow of sex, and my brow furrowed in humiliation. You guys suck. Not as much as you want to suck, Vic. Before Cora had a chance to finish what she was going to say, I flew across the bed and on top of her. She squeaked in surprise as I straddled her, and when I threw my hands over her mouth with a dangerous gaze, her laughter came out muffled. Mina, lying by the edge of the bed, did not spare us a glance and did not give a single shit when she said mechanically, No, guys, stop. Don't fight. Wide-eyed, I pressed down on Cora's mouth and hissed, Shut it. Her eyes danced, and being the gross person she was, her tongue darted out and licked my hands. My face screwed up, and I rolled off her with a cry of disgust. Cora smacked her lips and blew me a kiss. Vic made a sound deep in his throat. You lose some of your clothes, and this is basically the plot of the porn I watched last night. For the love of God. I slowly lifted my head and glared at him. Get back to work. Vic put up his hands and walked backward into the bathroom. Meanwhile, Cora bit out. You couldn't have said he was here? I tried, but you just kept yapping, I told her, wiping my saliva-covered palm on my pants. Hey, Cora, Vic's here. Her brows bunched. Two seconds. That's all it took. You're a putz. I shook my head at her. She sounded mildly offended when she spouted, Nuh-uh, you are. From the edge of the mattress, Mina murmured, You both are. And Mina promptly rolled off the bed with a thud when I accidentally, on purpose, pushed her off. It was hectic, so when Sasha approached the bar and yelled over the music, What is she doing here? I looked over at Cora, sitting calmly at the bar with her textbooks open, studying. I thought it was pretty obvious. Cramming? Sasha's brows lowered. Why is she studying at the bar? He was not impressed. She's ruining the vibe. I don't know, I said, forcing a wide smile, slinging drinks and taking orders. As you can see, I'm a little busy here. From beside me, Annika stilled when she saw my brother. A sweet smile graced her pretty full lips. Hi, Sash. And when Sasha looked her over a short moment, he did something I'd never seen him do. He turned and walked away, ignoring her. Annika's shoulders slumped, and I wondered what the heck that was all about, a split second before being pulled back into work. I hadn't noticed the strain until recently, but now that I had, there was something very strange going on between the two of them. Whenever they were together, the pressure in the air seemed to change, grew thicker somehow. The next time I passed her, I asked, Are you two fighting or something? Annika blinked guilelessly and played dumb. Who? I shot her a look, one that said I wasn't stupid. You and Sasha, that's who. Her eyes darkened a notch, and the scoffed response surprised me even more so when she cussed. No, we're not fighting. Sasha doesn't do that. He is gracious and polite and uber respectful. In order for us to fight, he'd have to give a fuck first. The bitterness in her tone made me still. And quite suddenly, I thought back to what she said that night at the White Rabbit. Trust me, it's finished. He tried, he fought, 
and all I did was reject him over and over. And this guy? He isn't the type to forgive and forget. I looked to my brother, who was currently having a heated discussion with Cora, and as he attempted to relocate the stubborn broad into his office, I caught the way his eyes slid over Annika and stayed there. No way! My gut tightened with realization. Annika? I asked cautiously, pouring a whiskey. The guy... She paused beside me a moment. The guy you were talking about? The one who doesn't give second chances? Immediately, she began to walk away. It's busy tonight, huh? I caught her arm gently and reeled her back in. And the way she looked around, panicked, it screamed that she was backed into a corner. My brain malfunctioned a moment, and when I finally gained the ability to speak, I uttered in astonishment, It's Sasha. The guy. It's him, isn't it? Annika's blue eyes darted around, looking everywhere but at me. After a second, she forced an eye roll. No, that would be crazy. She tried to hold it in, but her eyes revealed her misery. I mean, what kind of person would that make me? Jumping from one brother to another? Her breathing got heavy and her lips trembled as she endeavored to joke. I'd have to file myself under tea for trash, right? Oh my God, it was Sasha. I was 100% convinced Sasha was the guy. I attempted to say something. My mouth opened and I tried to speak, but nothing came out. I didn't know what to do with this information. Part of me knew she was going through something and wanted to tell her it wasn't a big deal. But the other part of me knew that it was. She was right, of course. Annika lost her virginity to Lev. She spent the majority of her life doing what she could to appeal to him to make him notice her. When Lev found Mina, Annika loathed her for the mere fact that Lev didn't. She purposefully got between them, tried to assert her dominance over Lev in a way that was partly crazed. And now she had a thing for Sasha? Since when? A harsh thought sliced through me. Since Lev was no longer available? The assumption made my stomach twist. Okay, that wasn't nice. I had no right to judge. But understandably, I had questions. Why Sasha? Why now? But as she stood in front of me with her shoulders slumped, her chin dipped, and her expression bleak, I tried in vain to cover up my mixed emotions and released her with a small smile and a casual, Hey, we can talk about this later. Annika's expression turned grim, and when her eyes met mine, I saw the pain that consumed her. No, Nas. She uttered dispassionately, stepping away from me. Her brows marred with the strong pull of her frown, and shaking her head, she muttered, We can't. My heart pinged at the notion that she couldn't come to me, but my friend was hurting. Perhaps now was not the time, but when she was ready, we would talk about this. We had to. Chapter 16 Vic I was a veteran at this. While boys my age were out playing sports or picking up chicks at the mall, I was in a warehouse downtown with my brothers. No matter how young we were, we could never have been considered kids. We didn't have toys, no PlayStation or such. What we did have were glocks, drugs, and attitudes that oftentimes got us into trouble because chaos boys were raised with an arrogance and understanding that, yeah, we were better than most. Times had changed, though. It had been a long time since we'd gone legit, but some things never changed, and the way this guy was looking at me right now made me want to round the table, take out my piece, and put it to his temple. In that moment, with the cockiness he wore so openly... I wanted to pull the trigger and watch the light fade from his eyes. Unfortunately for me, Rome was my meal ticket, and I had a feeling he already knew that. 
There was something off about this guy, but I couldn't figure out what it was. He wore a suit well, but it looked as though it chaffed him. His stylish appearance said one thing, but the defensive stance of his said another. His confidence was off the charts, but his obsidian eyes were almost unhinged. His movements were slow and precise, as though he knew I was watching for any sign of weakness. Maybe I just didn't like him because he was Romanian. I'd never met a Rome I liked. Built like a tank, he was tall and muscular, even more so than I was. His features were sharp and biting. The casual way he leaned back in his chair, as though I was no threat to him, had my pride aching for a fight. He ran a hand through his dark, longish hair and looked at me a while. He was searching me, but as was my nature, I revealed nothing. We sat in silence for as long as we wished, and when he decided to speak, the first thing he rumbled out was, How dirty are you willing to get? With that one query... I learned everything I needed to know about the disciples. They were messy. I didn't have qualms with using my strength against other men, but I would not put my hands on a woman. Not ever. My response was terse. Filthy. This man, who did not look as though he smiled a lot, grinned then. But again, there was something unnatural about it. My kind of guy... The grin he wore fell away almost immediately, and when he opened the top drawer of his desk, pulled out a tin, and began to roll a joint, he spoke through the process. You're unattached. I need the muscle. This might just work out. I know you're chaos-born, and your pops was pretty high up the ladder. He spoke clinically, without emotion. I know you were well on your way to climbing that ladder yourself before Sasha decided to pull the plug, and maybe that suited him. He licked the edge of the paper and began to roll. But I don't think that suited you, did it, Victor? I said nothing, because it was a moot discussion. Whether or not I was happy in that life did not matter. This was where I was right now, and I did not look back. A forward was the way out of this mess. Rome finished rolling one joint, then started on another, sparing me the shortest of glances as he did. I think you want back in, and I know why. This life... He spread the greenery onto the paper, and his lip lifted slightly. It's a good life, ain't it? People like you, people like me, without crime, without corruption, extortion, without men fearing us, what are we? His brow lowered and his jaw tightened. Nothing. We didn't choose this way of life, but... He cocked his brow. I ain't mad it found me. My own brow lowered. I refused to concede, but I felt that. Rome looked to be around my age, similar background, comparable beginnings, but that was where the comparison ended. One look at him screamed wealth. His clothes were expensive. The artwork surrounding us was lavish, and the heavy, hand-carved mahogany desk looked priceless. I mean, here we were, sitting in a huge building off Madison Avenue. Shit. I didn't even want to think about how much the rent was. And if he'd bought it? Hell, the guy had dough to burn. Jealousy crept up, laid heavy on my mind. And yes, in that moment, I could see his point. What had living a legit life gotten me? Nothing, stalling on a road to nowhere. And maybe Sasha had done what was best for him and his, but he didn't stop to think about what it meant for me and mine, and we suffered. My father had no working experience outside of chaos. Not exactly sure how one could write that kind of experience out on a resume, if you know what I mean. Our investments were small and tapped out a while ago, my mother, who never had the need for employment, was now working a small seamstress business from home, and it ate my father raw. To see his woman stepping up and laboring over a sewing machine till late at night was all he could bear. The seemingly inconsequential amount she earned was putting food on our table, but would never be enough to pay the bills, and they were growing in number. Accounts in the red, 
I was now the sole provider for my family, and while I attempted to draw a line in the sand, I already dipped into my savings far enough to make me worry. And although Annika offered to pay her share, I would rather cut my hands off than take a dime from my sister. We couldn't live like this anymore. This life, the one Rome spoke about, was easy for me. And he might have been right. I craved it. To live that high again. To be above the law. To have money and the fear of men. It fed the dark part of me. I wanted nothing more than to relive the days of old, where I would escape a bloodbath, come home to my woman, kiss those sweet lips, and fuck her nice and slow until the adrenaline coursing through me was appeased. That was the life. It was a life I missed more than I should have. After all, the past was the past. Sasha and Lev had the club. I had nothing. Nastasia deserved more than nothing. She deserved a man, a whole man, not half of one who relied on the kindness of his boys, begging them to throw him a freaking bone in order to live a decent life. Don't get me wrong, they were close to my heart, all of them, but that was their life, not mine. Bitterness swept through me, taking away with it another small piece of the light that was fading fast. My body was becoming a shell, my soul barely glowing in the depths of my despair. My life was in shambles. I didn't know how much more I could take. My woman had left me, my friends were oblivious to my struggles, and my family expected more from me than I had to give. Falling apart at the seams, my mental health was failing me, but I kept quiet. The thread, however, pulled tight threatening to snap at any given moment. I think we could help each other. Rome's rough lilt cut through my thoughts, and he glanced at me then. But I need a commitment from you. I'll do what I can to give you as much work as possible, but from now on, his eyes darkened a notch. I'm your daddy, Vic. My stomach twisted, and my chest tightened along with the cut of my jaw, Fuck me, he was a piece of shit. This thing, this display of dominance, was nothing more than a dick-measuring contest. I fought a roll of my eyes and sat up taller, refusing to blink at the man who thought he owned me now. And Rome's cheek ticked. For all intents and purposes, you are one of us, and I don't take that lightly. The only reason I'm giving you an in is because Chaos was a brutal firm. They did gorgeous work, tore down the city and rebuilt it on a red square. Fucking beautiful. As for you, your reputation precedes you, and... He snuffled out an acidic laugh. We are of like stock, you and me. Our anger is our biggest weapon. He leaned back in his chair taking a joint and lighting it. He put it to his lips and inhaled deeply, speaking through a smoky exhale. I'll admit, I'm curious. I want to see you in action. I might have been a little surprised when he licked his lips and uttered, You start tonight. Tonight? I have work tonight, I returned, and the slight change in his demeanor immediately told me I fucked up. Rome stared at me. He stared long and hard until he put down the joint and uttered bored-like, Yeah, you do. Long fingers tapped faintly on the edge of his desk, and he muttered dangerously, For me. I don't know what kind of trade you think I'm running here, but... He looked over at me through thick lashes and a glare. When I say you have work, you come running. Whatever else you have going on in your life is not my fucking business. I don't care if your girl is upset. I don't care if your grandmother's sick. I don't want to know about drama outside of what we do, because... He paused a moment. I don't give a fuck. Not a single fuck. And if I had a fuck to spare... He looked me up and down, and his lip curled. I would not waste it on you. Honestly... He said nothing I hadn't been expecting, and obviously I touched on a live wire with my attitude. I wasn't an idiot. 
Even though he was every bit the gentleman, this man's fists had seen more action than a whore on Sundays. Rome would not have made it to the position of crime lord without having shed his fair share of blood, and by the looks of him, he'd painted the streets red. My every instinct told me to fight back, but for once, my priorities had me holding my tongue. No problem. Seeming appeased by my response, he offered me a freshly rolled joint. I waved him off. No thanks. Rome's face wore such a harsh displeasure that, for a second, had my stomach twisting. I had unwittingly insulted him. He held it out a second time, and although I hesitated, I reached out to take it, and he said coarsely, When your boss offers you a taste of happiness, you take it. He packed away his tin and muttered under his breath, After tonight, you'll need it. I thought it was all swagger. It wasn't. Chapter 17 Nastasia My stomach nodded sometime around nine and hadn't untangled since. Victor hadn't shown for work. Sasha was pissed. Annika was quiet. Me? I was concerned. And while Sasha had a few unique descriptors to utter about the situation, he turned his anger on Annika. Where is he? He bit out, and Annika shrank in on herself. I don't know. It didn't sound like a lie, but there was an underlying deception in there somewhere. Annika knew more than what she was telling. I knew this for a certainty when she refused to look at him. My brother's eyes blazed. Why isn't he answering his phone, Annika? Lev frowned at Sasha, his brow lowering. Easy. At the same time, Mina's expression soured as she bit out. How about you watch your tone? But rare as it was, Sasha let his irritation take over. He stepped close, forcing a wide-eyed Annika to take a step back, and when she bumped into the bar, he spoke low. If something happens to him, and you held your tongue. He let the threat fade out, but his meaning was clear. Hearing that, my brows bunched. What is that supposed to mean? I twisted to face Annika and repeated myself, my pitch higher than before. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Annika stood by in silence, her arms wrapped protectively around herself, and Sasha's lip curled as his gaze washed over her. So be it. My brother turned and stalked away but the moment he was out of sight, Annika let out a shaking breath, and her face crumbled. I went to my friend immediately. I placed a consoling hand to her upper arm and bent to look her in the eye. It's okay. It's not okay. She looked around, panicked, and her breathing hitched. It's not okay, Nastasia. Oh no, my gut sank. What was going on? Was Vic in some kind of trouble? Ani? I reached down and took her hands in mine, squeezing gently. I need you to talk to me, babe. Is Vic all right? I don't know. She breathed out, and I felt her hands tremble. Eyes wide, she lowered her face and spoke seemingly to herself. He should have called by now. He was supposed to call. Where did he go? I asked as calmly as possible, even though my insides were a mess. Her eyes far away, she muttered, He wouldn't tell me the details, just that he had to go? She blinked up at me as if seeing me for the first time, her fear apparent. Why didn't I ask more questions? Why did I let him go? And because those questions were valid and equally frightening, I chose to ignore them completely and instead spare a small smile for my friend while lying through my teeth. You know, he probably just lost track of time or something. Annika's grip on my hand tightened as though holding onto the lifeline I offered. So I went on. I'm not worried. He's been looking after us since we were kids. He can take care of himself. 
but as I pasted on a smile, my gut sank deeply. Yeah, she uttered with creased brows, her voice quaking. He can. I forced that wide smile and released one of her hands to cup her cheek. He just lost track of time. She nodded quickly, anxiously. Right. He'll turn up, I assured her. He will, she uttered quietly through a frown. And a little past 3 a.m., he did. I sat on the edge of my bed, my knee bouncing wildly, holding my cell in one hand while biting the thumbnail of my free hand. Eyes wide, I tried once more, dialing the number only to have the pre-recorded woman say, The number you are trying to reach is not available. Please try again later. Once more. Over and over. Again and again I tried, but there was no getting through. I don't know how long I sat there in the lamplight, but the sound of a car approaching had my head lifting. A flash of lights flooded my windows and I stood. Rushing over on bare feet, I peered down from the window to frown at the unknown silver sedan. That frown deepened when I watched him climb out, shut the door quietly, and approach my front door holding his ribs. My heart picked up in pace. Holding onto the railing with sweaty palms, I flew down the stairs, taking two steps at a time. And before he even had a chance to use the keys dangling from his fingers, I swung the door open, blinked up at his moonlit form, and cried, Jesus Christ, do you even know how worried everyone has been? How worried I've been? What are you doing here? Darkness hit him well, but that didn't stop me from observing the shadows on his face deepening. And as he let out a strained sigh, his shoulders slumped. His rough response lit up my every nerve ending. I don't know. I just started driving. And the next thing I knew, here I was. Oh, Lord. That was a good answer. A really good one, actually. But the circumstances being what they were meant I had to ignore the butterflies fluttering around in my stomach and deal with him. My wild eyes softened as the man in front of me leaned against the open door frame, let out a short gasp, and winced. His face screwed up in pain a long moment, and the need to tend to him was too great for me to fight. I reached out and let my fingers curl around that of his free hand, gently pulling him in, and when his feet began to move, I asked and incensed, Where were you? His silence seemed louder than an actual response. By the time I half-dragged him into the dim kitchen, I had already pulled out my phone and dialed. Holding it between my neck and shoulder, I made the short walk over to the light switch. She answered before I had a chance to flick it on. Annika's shaky voice sounded in my ear. It was clear she had gone from frightened to petrified. Still nothing. I, I don't know what to do, Naz. What do I do? He's here. What? I heard her shuffle to sit up. Where was he? I don't know, but he's here. He's fine. But when I spun to look at him with the lights on... The inside of my stomach curdled and I gasped a quiet, Shit! Shit! Thinking fast, I blinked at the sight of his bloody and bruised face and rushed out. I, uh, stubbed my toe. It's okay. H he's okay. Are you sure? She asked timidly. I closed my eyes, no longer able to look at the deep gash at his brow or the trail of blood drying at his chin. Yeah. And then Annika was irate. I am going to kick his ass. You tell him that. You tell him Annika said she's going to kick your ass. Tell him, now. Lips thin, I turned my sympathetic eyes on him and relayed her message. Annika is going to kick your ass. His fingers glanced over his cheek and my stomach ached as he flinched. Sure. Annika blew out a trembling breath. I am so relieved. Her tinkling laughter cut through her fear. 
God, I'm shaking. I'm so relieved. Yeah, I muttered as my eyes trailed the damage to his already harsh face. Me too. I cleared my throat. You can sleep easy now. I've got him. Vic stood, walked over to my kitchen sink and leaned over it. He blocked one nostril and blew hard out of his nose. My stomach turned as gooey chunks of coagulated blood landed in the sink with a light ping. Annika chuckled in relief. Yeah, thanks for letting me know. I didn't bother with niceties. I hung up, taking my cell and holding it loosely, letting it fall by my side as my heart ached at the sight of him. With his hands resting on the edge, his tall form towered over the sink, and he rumbled out, I couldn't go home like this. Home? My brow quirked. With your mom and dad. With Annika. That's where you've been living, right? I paused. Back home? The way his eyes narrowed had me shaking my head, knowing I had my answer. When it was clear he was not in a revealing mood, I blew out a breath, then ran a hand down my face before my eyes swept the length of him, surveying the damage. No, I don't suppose you could. I thought maybe. He stopped a second before continuing. I thought you might still have some of my shit here. I did. Oh, I planned on letting go, but that did not go as intended. And after dumping a trash bag of his clothes into my garbage can, I found myself retrieving it hours later, in tears, utterly ashamed that I couldn't even part with something so inconsequential as a pair of his workout sweats and a simple black tea. But they smelled of him. And some nights when I really missed him, I would slide that tea over my pillowcase and breathe it in until I fell into a restless sleep. I might have something in my closet. In the top left-hand corner, behind the cream-colored box, hidden away where no one could possibly find it. I couldn't even hide my disappointment as I focused on his messed-up face. That needs to be cleaned up, and you need to shower, so go on up, and I'll be there in a minute. Vic was not oblivious. His watchful eyes had to see the apprehension rushing through me, but he granted me this boon by pushing off the sink, holding his ribs, and leaving me with my thoughts. Between Vic's inability to talk to me and Annika's odd behavior, I was stuck somewhere in the middle, being constantly pushed away by both as though I couldn't relate. Had they forgotten I'd been through some shit myself? Between my mother's secret but frequent abuse of Lev and losing my dad to a heart attack when I was only 20, one brother acting as a mob boss while the other's peculiarities drew the attention of those who could never understand the depths of his beautiful soul, I had experienced my fair share of hardships and heartbreaks. I wasn't fragile, but when they treated me like I was made of glass, it made me feel meager, weak, pathetic, useless. I wished they would let me be there for them as they had been there for me. By the time I retrieved the first aid kit from above my refrigerator and hefted the box upstairs, the door to the bathroom was left slightly ajar, steam billowing out from the crack as Vic showered away whatever badness he had somehow involved himself in. Placing the box on the edge of my bed, I entered my closet and found the stash of clothes he had left behind. I carried the entire stack, gently bringing it up to my nose and breathing in his spicy male scent before reluctantly lowering it to its place by the white rectangular box. And while he washed away his shitty night, I waited. At this point, waiting on Vic was second nature. A strangely familiar position. Foolish girl. The words were barely there, but I heard them so clearly as if she yelled them directly into my ear. 
The spray of the shower ceased, and a short while later he stalked out of my bathroom, wearing nothing but a tan-colored towel wrapped around his waist, his body covered in dew. I swallowed hard at the portrait he made, but when my soft gaze swept over the large reddish-purple mark at his ribs, an exasperated sigh left me. You're a mess. Vic grimaced as he attempted to lower his split brow. I didn't think before I came. I shouldn't be dumping this shit on you. Not after. I didn't give him a chance to finish. She's gone. Then I dipped my chin and corrected. She's going. Every day I hear her less and less. I'm fine. I swear. He had been there for me. To deny me a chance to return the gesture would be an insult. From my place on the bed, I shuffled back and crossed my legs, clearing my throat as I gently offered. You can sleep here tonight. The walk to my bed was short, but he moved slowly, and although he attempted to hide it, there was a hobble to his steps, and my chest ached. He was in pain. With deft fingers, he dug into the pile of clothes, lifting, then examining each piece of clothing until he reached something that wasn't clothing, something I had forgotten about. He picked it up and examined it closely. What's this? My own brow creased as I leaned in to get a look at the item, and when I focused on it, my eyes widened and my cheek flushed as I attempted to snatch it out of his hand. Nothing. But Vic held it out of reach, further inspecting the item. Wait. He held the little plastic ball in his hands, and his tone held a small amount of disbelief. I remember this. I thought about grabbing it and running, but it was too late. His deft fingers had already cracked the ball in two, revealing a small plastic heart-shaped ring. His stoic face harmonized his rough voice. Venice Beach, the pier. When he tilted his head in thought, he muttered, What year was that? 2010? 2008, I amended. Yeah. He breathed in awe. Jesus, now that's a flashback. His lip twitched, but his brow pulled down. I buy you platinum and diamonds, and this is what you keep. Embarrassment gave way to a deeper emotion. Grief. I couldn't look at him then. I kept everything. I confessed on a whisper, trying desperately to blink through the sting of unshed tears. From the smallest trinkets to movie tickets— Lord, I even kept an empty condom wrapper from our family trip to my family's cabin in Pisco Lake. I dried flowers and bagged the petals. I kept notes and stole hotel room card keys. I had a jar of seashells from that very trip to Venice Beach. My photo albums were overly full, and I had no intention of halting my collecting, because every memory was as precious as the next. His fingers slowly curled around the small plastic ball, holding it tightly in his grasp, and he remained quiet a short while. I know you don't want me here. Not true. And I'm sorry for coming. Don't you dare. Don't cheapen this for me. My gut clenched tightly, and when he looked at me, there was a boldness in his heavy gaze. The bruise at his temple looked painful, and the cut at his brow seemed to wink at me as he uttered a low, do you want me to leave? My arms lined with goosebumps. I shook my head softly and spoke even softer. Stay. I've had a rough night. I could tell. He picked up his sweats and pulled them up from under his towel. Just as the towel fell, my eyes snapped to the happy trail that began just below his belly button and descended to his low-riding sweats. You need to stop looking at me like that. If you don't want any action tonight, Kiska. Kitten. No, he could not call me that. Looking all fine and shit, it simply wasn't fair. 
I'm wired and rearing for a fight. His stormy gaze drifted down to the low cut of my tank top. His tone full of innuendo, his eyes raked over the rest of me. And nobody fights me better than you do, baby. Ugh, my pussy was already pulsing. Shit, I was gonna regret this. In fact, I already was. The words came out reluctant. You should probably rest tonight. Vic closed his eyes, but thankfully did not argue. For if he had, I'd have given in. Instead, he picked up the towel and returned it to the bathroom. When he came back, he took the place beside me and said unenthusiastically, Okay, let's get this shit over with. Looking tired, I shot him a sad smile as I dabbed antiseptic onto his cuts, only stopping when he pulled back or cursed. It was funny to me, and I couldn't stop myself from grinning. Vic noticed, and his mouth pulled down. What are you smiling at? I pressed my lips together, trying to hide my laughter, and gently cleaned his brow. I never understood how you can take a beating the way you can, but moan and bitch when it came time to bandage your wounds. From the way his face sharpened, I could tell he took this as an offense. I don't moan, he uttered frankly. Or bitch. I didn't bother to hide it then. I chuckled. You absolutely do. He glared at me when I added, You're a big baby. As I pressed on a couple of wound closure strips, he closed his eyes and said, That's rich. From the woman who cried when I had to remove a splinter from her palm. My smile was full of sass. I am very in touch with my feelings. Thank you very much. And because I had a strong feeling about what he might have been doing tonight, I added, Besides, I didn't volunteer for that. Vic's shoulders went rigid, but he spoke evenly. What makes you think I volunteered for this? Oh, come on now. Because if you hadn't, and you left looking like that, one final strip, and I was done. I leaned back and looked him dead in the eye. My brothers would have already dumped the body of the guy stupid enough to put his hands on you. Vic's face darkened, and it was so intense I almost forgot to breathe. I was a sucker for this man's pout, so I softened it the only way I knew how. Leaning in, I touched my warm lips to his for a single second before pulling back and smiling dotingly. There. All better. The silence was thick around us, his face showing zero reaction. I went about repacking the first aid box, but just as I lifted it, I heard his coarse admission. I miss you so fucking much. I stood there holding the box as he lowered his head, shook it lightly, and professed a barely audible. I thought we were okay. Knowing I made you miserable when I was so damn happy. Knowing you weren't feeling what I was feeling. He whispered roughly. It cuts me deep. Totally blindsided. He looked at me then and shrugged. You never said a thing. The sadness I felt was halved as he bore part of the weight. I swallowed through the sudden thickness in my throat. I wasn't miserable. Not all the time. Just when you keep secrets. But you weren't happy. And when I didn't deny it, he uttered a desolate. Same thing. My heart broke when he blinked down at his lap and said, I keep thinking about what I could have done, what I can do, to fix this burned bridge between us. It wasn't burned, not completely. The frame was still smoldering, we still had time to meet in the middle. You could talk to me. He scoffed and it grated. 
Not one to be deterred, I tried again. You could tell me why you're living at home? You could explain why you're driving that shitbox outside when you have a Lexus? Maybe tell me why Annika is so sad all the time, why she's depressed? I should have used more tact than shooting the question at him. Why are you working at Aphrodite's Kiss? His head snapped up, wrath in his gaze, and I dropped the box, taking the three steps to kneel in front of him, begging him for answers. With shining eyes, I probed, my voice quiet and quaking. Why can't you talk to me? He bit his lip and lowered his eyes, taking away what little connection we still had. And my gut twisted. Okay, fine, you stubborn ass. I stood as gracefully as possible and laid it out firm. This is what I can't get past, Vic. We were a team, 13 years strong. And if you can't talk to me, then there's nothing left to talk about. It felt like a cleanse. It felt final. But just as I turned to retrieve the box, his hand circled my wrist and held firm. I twisted back to look at him. Wearing an expression I could only describe as pure agony, he tugged, and I stumbled forward, falling sideways into his lap. Before I had a chance to process, his strong arms were wrapped around me, holding me tightly to him. And when he lowered his forehead to my collarbone, I felt as though he was trying to speak using his actions, as words had failed him so many times before. His warm breath at my neck, his arms flexing in a way that told me he was only seconds from losing control. It caused severe damage to my heart and my head alike. I reflexively snaked my arm around his shoulders, taking in his warmth and desperation, wrapping myself in the intense cocoon of emotion he dared not display. To be held by Vic was nothing but natural. To hold him in return was sublime. My hands moved of their own accord, first stroking his nape, then the back of his head, moving on to his unyielding shoulders. I carefully observed the way he shuddered at my ministrations, and the power that surged through me right then was unparalleled. Vic did not often need affection, but when he did, I gave it freely. He only took as he needed, a little at a time, and when he gifted me the opportunity to care for him, I gripped it tightly, holding it with both hands. It felt heavenly to be needed by him, even for a moment. His lips skimmed the sensitive flesh at my collar, not quite kissing, just gliding, whisper-soft against my skin. And I took a stuttering breath in, my eyes fluttered closed. Right then, if he made a move, I would have succumbed. I would have given myself to him, held him in my body, and offered myself up as a sacrifice on the altar of his pain. Then, without a single care for his injuries, he stood, taking me with him, and I melted into his arms. My eyes held his as he lowered me carefully into the center of my bed, and I held my breath. There was something in the way he stood, peering down at me as if attempting to commit the image to memory. And when he slid in beside me in an almost feline manner, my body ached in anticipation. As he shuffled in close, I stopped breathing. With his body flush against mine, he whispered into the dark, Put your arms around me. In the lifetime I had known him, in over twenty-five years, I had never heard Vic make such a vulnerable request. I did not need to be asked twice. One arm snaked around his shoulders, while the other cradled the back of his head, and when he nuzzled that little cleavage I had, there was nothing sexy about it. No, in that moment he merely sought comfort and I provided. As my fingertips gently stroked his damp hair, he closed his eyes and rested with his head on my chest, knowing he was safe with me. I just need to be close to you. 
The tentative words rumbled against the curve of my breast were a spark, igniting the flame of the fire I had threatened to douse over and over again. Don't give up on me. I couldn't speak. But of all the puzzling thoughts that ran through my head then, I chose to focus on the only one that meant something. And as I looked down at him tenderly, a tired smile glanced my lips. Regardless of our time apart, irrespective of our current disconnect, Vic was here. That counted for something, didn't it? He came home. He came home to me. Chapter 18 Nastasia The sound of my front door opening, followed by a clinical, Nastasia, Lydia would like you to come and join us for breakfast, had me lifting my head and squinting into the darkness. When I crawled over the body beside me to check the clock, I took in the time and quietly mock cried. Dude, it was only 9 a.m. Mina is making pancakes. Lev said as he climbed the stairs. They're a strange color and aren't very good, but please refrain from telling her so. As I straddled the warm body and stretched my arms up over my head, I snuffled out a laugh, knowing Lev would only mention such a thing if he had made the mistake of doing it himself. Poor guy often learned the hard way. Are you decent? He asked just outside my bedroom door. I had already said yes, but when he opened and walked in, he peered to the spot under me and stilled. Am I interrupting? What? My brow bunched in confusion. No. Almost immediately, my brother's body language loosened and went back to normal as he strode in and muttered, Good. Nice to see you, Victor. My eyes widened comically, and it all came flooding back. I take it from the state of your face that you had a good reason to blow off work last night. My stomach pitched. I stared flatly at my headboard as a large pair of hands moved to my hips, fingers flexing in a gentle caress. Something like that, was all he rumbled. And when my eyes snapped to his, wide and alarmed, he smirked through the cut on his lip and winked. Winked. Oh, God. I muttered as my brow dipped, rolling off him. When I glared at him, his lip twitched. You could have said something. I bit out as he rolled onto his side, resting his head on a fist, grinning at me. I stalked into my closet to retrieve my kimono and wrapped it around me, tying it tightly around my waist. On the defensive, I looked up at Lev and swore. We didn't have sex, okay? Lev's brow pulled down. I don't remember asking. Hadn't he? Oh, no, he hadn't. Embarrassed, I ignored the flush of my cheeks and stomped into my bathroom, came back holding a pile of his clothes and threw them at the cocky man in my bed. The leg of his jeans dangled over his head. You need to leave. I said it in a way that should have slighted, but Vic was not offended. Instead, he quietly pushed away his dirty clothes, stretched lazily, then spoke through a yawn. Yeah, I should probably go home and let Annika tear me a new asshole. Listen to this guy, talking about his sweet sister like she was an inconvenience. I suddenly had the urge to stick up for her. You deserve it. She was very upset, Lev confirmed with a tilt of his head. And from the way Sasha gave it to her, I added without a thought, she is well within her rights to take it out on you. Vic sat up, then blinked, and very, very slowly he said, Sasha yelled at her. Uh-oh. Should I not have said that? I probably shouldn't have said that. She refused to tell him where you were, Lev offered. He did not like that. Vic's mouth thinned into a single line. That's cause she didn't know. Yes, she told him as much, uttered Lev bored like. It was clear he didn't believe her. I don't know who Vic was pissed at, Sasha, Annika, or himself. For that reason, I posed a roundabout. 
This is what happens when you go AWOL. The people who care about you worry. We try to call you. Then quietly, I tried to call you. My phone's busted. Vic frowned as he thought about what I said before he rolled out of bed, gathered his things, and muttered, I gotta go. Vic dug through the pile of clothes and pulled on a black tee. It had turned stiff in the places where blood dripped from his face, but it wasn't overly noticeable. He stuck on his shoes, picked up his stuff, and left without a backward glance. And my brow lowered. When I heard the front door open, then shut, I frowned. The moment the engine started, I rushed over to the window, pulled back the curtain, and watched him drive away, with a rounded mouth that released an incredulous, not even a thank you, nice. Nastasia, Lev said as I continued to gape into the distance. Put something on. Breakfast will be getting cold. A sigh escaped me as I turned, walked into my closet, and dressed in jeans and a sweater as Lev waited at the foot of the stairs. Sliding into my fluffy slippers, my brother held the door for me as I made my way outside. A sudden thought had my brow marring. The walk, although brief, gave me time to ask, Lev, do you think I'm smart? No hesitation. I do. But I could tell he hadn't grasped what I meant. It was hard to explain to somebody like Lev, but I tried. Not smart, but smart, like intelligent, you know? Lev wore his confusion openly. I quietly muttered, never mind. There was a fleeting pause before my brother said, Perhaps if you tell me the answer you seek, I can help you reach it. I thought about how best to describe it. It's just that I look at you, and I know you're smart. I see what Sasha has done with bleeding hearts, and even though he's an ass, I know he's smart. But me, I don't know what people think when they see me, but I don't think it's, hey, that girl knows a thing or two. Why is that? He asked, curious. I felt momentarily numb. Everyone is their shit together. Everyone but me? You work hard, you make time for your family, and you always have a plan. Mina is younger than me, and even she has a plan. I couldn't even think about having a baby, but she's so excited to expand your family. I tried not to sound jealous. Sometimes, it's hard to watch people be so happy, be so put together. Sometimes it's hard to weigh yourself up against others. If you asked me two years ago where I'd be now, I definitely wouldn't have said, standing still. But that's where I am. Stuck in place like a fly on sticky paper. I wasn't explaining myself very well. So when Lev did not respond, I murmured, forget it. And when Lev spoke, it was off topic. I am an intelligent man. Confusion swept over my features. Uh, my IQ is nearly unmatched. Okay, I uttered, unsure of where this was going. Give me a sum, any sum I'll find the answer, and I'll find it correctly. I smiled through furrowed brows. Don't take this the wrong way, brother mine, but I thought we were talking about me. Would you agree that I'm intelligent? This was a losing battle. I blew out, yes, I would. He put a gentle hand to my arm to stop me in my tracks. And when I stilled and he looked down at me with those golden eyes that rarely saw all of what was happening around him, he spoke eloquently. And yet, in moments of madness when my mind is overwhelmed with emotion, you have to scrape me off the floor, feed me, and put me to bed on hundreds of occasions. He let that sink in. My chest tightened as he went on. You have seen me at my worst, unable to control my rage, beating and bloody. He paused. Now I'll ask you, after all that, do you still think I'm intelligent? My voice was whisper soft. Of course. As are you, whether you have your shit together or not. My brother didn't always know how to express himself. 
but when he did, it was perfect. Everyone is fighting something on the inside. We all have a dark spot that flares when times are tough. I found the important thing is to pick your battles wisely, because winning each of them is impossible. And every time you lose, because you will from time to time, take a moment and breathe. His hand slipped into mine, and it squeezed. Remember, you're not alone. I was stupidly close to crying. God, he was something all right. My lip trembled through my smile. See? Smart. Lev did not smile, but his eyes softened, and as we walked on in silence, he opened the door and let me pass. I made my way to the kitchen, and when it all came into view, my eyes widened at the mess of flour and batter all over the counter. Mina twisted back to look at us. Finally, this batch is almost done. Lydia sat on a stool with her legs swinging, and as Morella cut a pancake up into pieces, I snuck up on the little mouse and kissed her swiftly on the cheek, ripping a squeal from my niece along with some gasping giggles. Liddy likes my pancakes, Mina muttered with a glare aimed at her husband. My niece made a happy sound as her chubby legs swung about. They smell... Interesting. Great, I offered enthusiastically because Mina was learning to cook and not every one of her recipes was a winner. I'm sorry we were delayed. Vic walked around the counter to kiss Mina atop her head. I hadn't planned on Vic being there. A clatter sounded when the spatula in Mina's hand fell. She turned slowly, keeping her eyes on me, but asked Lev, Is that right? And where exactly was Vic? My eyes snapped shut, and I winced as Lev picked at an oddly orange pancake while revealing unemotionally, Sleeping in Nastasia's bed. Sure he was. Mina smiled, but it was almost robotic. And when she retrieved her spatula, she pointed at me long and hard. You better start talking, Miss Lady. A sigh left me as I reached onto my niece's plate and stole a bite of pancake. The moment it hit my tongue, I reflexively spat it back out, mumbling, Oh, God. Because pancakes usually did not taste of uncooked mushroom. Thankfully, Mina was concentrating on her current batch of mush cakes, but when Lev handed me a mug of coffee, I took it with quiet thanks. And then I talked. It was a little past eleven when I pulled up, and the moment I was out of my car, I stilled, as a heated argument began when the front door shot open. You can't work looking like that, man. This was Alessio. Come on, no one gives a shit what I look like. I'm there to keep the riffraff out. I'm meant to look intimidating. That came from Vic, and he had yet to see me. Alessio debated. I care what you look like. You're representing me, jerk off, and I'm not having you stand in front of my club with people thinking you're the riffraff. You look like a gangbanger. The scarred man noticed me then, jerking his chin my way with a curt, Hey. Vic saw me then. The way he put his hands to his hips and lowered his head was not exactly welcoming. He did, however, spurn me briskly. What are you doing here? This bitch. Excuse me? The second I said it, Vic's brows lowered dangerously. I am not in the mood, sir. I am here because I'm here. That's all you get. Leaning to the left, I looked around Vic to Alessio. Want to grab lunch? With a touch of regret, he lightly shook his head. Busy today, toots. How about Nicholas or Davi? I asked a little desperately. Hell, I didn't like the guy, but at this point I'd take anyone's company. Roman? What about me? My head snapped up to the open doorway where Philippe stood leaning against it, and when my eyes met his, they softened. Hey. Vic clicked his tongue. Get out of here, Frenchie. If anyone needs a baguette, we'll call. They would never get along, not with our history. I loved Vic. I loved him so much that at one point I was so consumed by it that it frightened me. I never wanted to be that woman, the one who loved a man more than he loved her. I was young and stupid. 
21 years old, thinking I had all the answers, scared to death of Vic and the intense, desperate feelings he inspired in me. In a move I will forever regret, a move that broke something inside of me that I will never be able to repair. I left him. And then there was Philippe, sweet, kind Philippe. He was there when I so desperately needed the distraction. He was there in a way that dulled the pain. I had never had what he provided. Peace of mind, contentment. And although it shamed me for a while, I mistook that contentment for love. He was a breath of fresh air at a time when I felt as though I was suffocating. I never had to guess what he was thinking, never had to guess where I stood with him. He was open and so forward with his feelings that when he proposed after only six weeks, everything stood still. Convinced I would never find a man who would treat me better, I accepted, though my stomach ached. It didn't take long for me to realize I had made a mistake. It took even less time for me to see that I would never love Philippe the way he loved me. How could I do that to him? In short, I couldn't. It would have been hypocritical of me to ask this man to spend a life with me knowing my mind drifted to another, knowing my heart was already claimed by a man who may not have deserved it, but owned me nonetheless. I called it off, and in a cowardly way at that, I packed my shit, left a note on his pillow, and made my leave while he was at work. Two months, but it felt so much longer. Two months without Vic felt like an eternity. And when I turned up at his door, with my bags in hand, I was ashamed to say we picked up almost exactly where we left off. Unspeaking of the events of the previous months, refusing to acknowledge our time apart. Unsurprisingly, Philippe did not talk to me for years after. I didn't blame him. I did him dirty, and we both knew it. Things were better now, but the underlying tension between us had never faded. Without wanting to appear vain, it was clear that Philippe still held a candle for me, and no matter how many times I blew it out, he lit the wick over and over, letting it burn. But his friendship was so important to me that I ignored the shadows the flickering flame cast in his eyes. Philippe looked down from the steps, and when his gaze took in the damage to Vic's face, he uttered, Well, someone made some real improvements to your face, my commie friend. Vic's jaw ticked, but to have the chance to talk with my friend about everything that happened was too good an opportunity to deny. And when Philippe's dark gaze rested on me, daring me to accept. I shrugged and asked, Is Italian okay? Philippe straightened, and his eyes smiled. Perfect. Well, all right, then. I smiled widely. Let's go. I'll drive. Philippe passed Vic slowly. They eyed each other with open abhorrence. Philippe's arm nudged Vic's, and Vic laughed caustically. It was a dick-measuring contest, if I'd ever seen one, and currently neither one of them was winning. Finally, Philippe walked over to my car, and just when I thought we were in the clear, Vic strode toward us and started talking. I'll be by later to pick up the shit I left at your place last night, Kiska. My stare was blank and remained that way when he went on, glaring at Philippe. You could gather it up before I get there. You might want to check the bathroom, where I showered. His gaze darkened. Or your bed, where I slept. My face dipped. I should have known he'd go there, especially with the man standing to the passenger side of my car. Each word was designed to be a slap to Philippe's face, and from the way Philippe's eyes narrowed, I could see they might have met their mark. Score one point to Vic. I tend to leave stuff on the nightstand. Vic's voice turned lethal. He looked at the other man up and down, insinuating. You know, easy to reach. Wow. Just wow. I thought you two weren't together anymore, queried Philippe, looking between us with clear confusion. We aren't, I said not very convincingly. 
and at the very same time, Vic smirked. When has that ever stopped us? Don't be so naive, buddy. I should have been mad. Why wasn't I? Maybe because jealousy on Vic felt like the highest of compliments. A silence followed, and the longer it went on, the space around us changed, grew thicker, sucking the positive right out of the atmosphere. But I refused to let it show. Philippe's eyes fell to me, and a forced smile stretched my lips. Shall we? A moment's hesitation, then... Of course, we have catching up to do. I spared a glance at Vic. I want to hear everything. Philippe didn't. Then you shall. How refreshing, I said, then turned my head to look the man with the bruised face and busted eyebrow dead in the eye as I unlocked my car and opened the door. A man without secrets. Partway into the trivial conversation that lunch usually offered, we lapsed into a short silence. It was nice, comfortable, and that was where it ended. Philippe was my friend. I never put too much stock in my tumultuous relationship with him. Not until he broke through the silence and queried gently. I never stood a chance, did I? My eyes lowered and I picked up my food. Not at all hungry anymore. Because he was right, he never stood a chance. No one did. Not when in competition with Vic. Chapter 19 Nastasia On your left, babe, Chessie uttered, and I blinked back into focus from wherever my mind had taken me a moment ago. Sorry, I muttered before pasting on a wide smile and morphing back into the lace teddy-wearing vixen I was. When I approached a man in his thirties with fuck-me eyes and a tailored shirt, I knew he had money to spend, and I called over the music. What can I get you, handsome? It was almost eleven, and Bleeding Hearts was at capacity. With a long line outside, I knew it would be a busy night, and after witnessing the struggle of the last year, where Sasha had been only months away from losing this place— I would never take our success for granted and complain about being ran off my feet. Tonight, I took orders with a lusty smile, feeling somewhat lighter than I had been yesterday. Moving around Annika, I reached over Chessie to get my hands on the bottle of Hibiki whiskey. I carefully poured over the sphere of ice, making sure not to spill a single drop, because this shit was expensive. And when I handed it to tailored shirt guy, he placed the hundred in my hand, looked me in the eye and said, Keep the change. Aw, a $9 tip. What a guy. My face remained passive as I fought the eye roll, trying to make itself known. The man looked uncertain a second, and when my lips tipped up lightly, he looked relieved. I leaned over the bar, gripped his shirt, pulled him close, and pressed a long kiss to his cheek. I pulled away, and his lusty eyes told me I'd done my job right. When I turned my back to him and began to sashay away, I heard him call out desperately, What's your name? And I smirked. And that was how it was done. No doubt he'd spend a cool thou trying to get me to talk to him over the course of the night. It was a business transaction that suited me well. The more money they spent, the drunker they got. The drunker they got, the better the tips would be. Of course, Vic would attend to the inebriated men, approaching and doing the obligatory thing by telling them he thought they had enough, and it was time to move on. They wouldn't, but the security footage would show this was done and done often. In short, it covered our asses from disgruntled patrons who wanted their money back or claimed we were negligent in any way. I loved my job. I was proud of what we achieved. It was a group effort, and Bleeding Hearts was the hottest burlesque joint in New York. Of course, others had tried to replicate what we had, but they all fell short. We had the best dancers, prettiest faces, and most importantly, our girls were loyal to us. You're a cruel woman. Came from the shadows at the side of the bar, and although my stomach dipped, I hid it under a knowing smile that said he was right. There he was, sitting in the dark, his face lit up with every strobing light, and one look at that neatly trimmed stubble had my core clenching. 
I felt it gliding along my back as the memory of him kissing his way up my spine flickered through my head. His body filled up the small space. Those wide shoulders stretched the charcoal gray long-sleeved Henley, which, of course, was pushed up, revealing his tattooed forearms. Now, forearm porn? Really? I internally sulked. Why was he torturing me? He couldn't know what he was doing to me. Could he? His eyes crinkled in the corners with his smile and those dimples. Fuck. He looked like Hades himself. Dark and tempting, like sex was just a part of who he was. A quality he couldn't get rid of even if he tried. I swallowed down the flurry of emotions rushing through my body, a whirlwind of sadness and excitement. Being in his presence always did strange things to me. It was almost as if I lost myself and became his. Just doing my job, I said with remarkable composure. When he licked his full bottom lip, looked around in a bored manner and leaned forward, my gaze went down to the ink on his neck. I had seen him bare more times than I could count. I could tell you where every scar was, describe the way his ab muscles bulged unsymmetrically. I had kissed every square inch of this physique. As much as I was his, Victor Nikulin was mine. The bruises on his face did nothing to mask his appeal. In fact, they added to his magnetism, pulling the attention of most every woman who came close enough to notice him. And once they noticed him, it was hard to focus on anything else. How was your lunch with Frenchie? The question was asked low, dangerous-like. Oh no, we are not going there. Nuh-uh. He knew he ruined it before it even began. I wanted to say something witty and sarcastic, and I tried. I... But nothing came out. Panic took over, and my mouth gaped a moment. He peered down at my lips, his brow rising slightly. Oh, crap. Flustered, I spun and walked away with my cheeks burning. My mind did a slow clap. Well done. And amused, Hey, where's the fire? Came from behind me. Thankfully, my mouth-to-brain connections sparked to life. I twisted back without slowing my step and uttered a cool, In your pants. Yes, nice recovery. Vic made a show of looking me up and down in my teddy. My nipples beaded painfully behind the lace, making me all the more aware of my yearning. You know me, was all he said as he leaned back into the shadows, grinning in a way that told me we both won. My smirk was purely internal, and I know it was pathetic, but the small exchange made my night. It was funny how a person could go from the highest high to the lowest low in such a short amount of time. I should have known she would be the cause. And when she approached him, my eyes remained fastened on them tightly, my back up locked in a defensive stance. Vic baby, Lush muttered through her pouting, overfilled lips. Her lashes fluttered prettily. Can you help me? Vic replied. I can try. Someone bothering you. She stood close to him, way too close. And the moment she laughed, I rolled my eyes. No, silly. Her hand touched his shoulder. I've got an itch I can't reach. Her voice lowered suggestively. I thought maybe you'd scratch it. Oh, dear. I was this close to pounding this bitch into the ground. So when Vic's voice lowered to an equally suggestive tone, and he responded a sly, Why don't you show me where this itch is, and maybe we can figure something out? I gently put the glass I was holding down and began to walk. Lifting the lip of the bar, I strode out of my workspace, a spark of anger growing inside me. Lush turned, lifting her tiny skirt to reveal the curve of her butt. She looked back over her shoulder and pouted. Right there. My heart began to race. Yeah, this was not going to happen. Vic and Lush over my dead body. Her eyes trailed down to her butt and stayed there a long moment. 
I kept walking. He reached down, took hold, and pulled. She gasped as though he entered her, and I wanted to vomit. With a sly smile, he handed her the white tag and uttered a nonchalant. There. Satisfied. But Lush curled her fingers around the white tag, twisted to face him, and put on a completely unbelievable shy girl routine, dipping her chin and shaking her head submissively. Not even close, she murmured, and my heels brought me near enough to do what I wanted. I reached out, wrapped my fingers into her hair, and tugged. Hard. Lush squealed, reaching up in an attempt to pry my hands off her. Vic blinked, and then he was off his chair with a disbelieving, Naz, what the fuck? But I was raging, and because of this, I spoke directly into her ear. You are either a deaf motherfucker, or you are just plain stupid. I have yet to decide. Another hard tug, and Lush was brought to her knees with a shriek that had people turning to look at us. Let go of me, you heifer! Vic reached for my hands, his fingers stumbling over mine. Jesus, Naz, let go. Unblinking, my fingers tightened in her hair as I bent down and uttered, I warned you, you didn't listen. Now, I'm gonna fuck you up, bitch. Help, she cried, and Lev came rushing over from the opposite side of the club. Nastasia, she tried to talk sense into me with a calm hand to my arm. Let her go. No, I spoke through gritted teeth. Naz. Vic growled. People are getting their phones out. Let her the fuck go. And because I was hurting, I grated out. Screw you. But he was deft with his fingers, and the second my hand came loose, I cried out. No! Reaching for the panting bitch once more. Lush shuffled backward with fear in her eyes and cried out, You psycho bitch! Oh, honey, you have no idea. I went to rush her, but was turned upside down when I was promptly thrown over a hard shoulder. That shoulder dug into my stomach so hard it hurt. I bit out, let me go, Vic growled. You need to calm the fuck down. As he strode down the hall, opened a door, and walked inside the dark space. The familiar smell of cleaning supplies told me we were in the janitor's closet. The moment he closed the door behind us, a light turned on, and I was set on my feet. My knees shook, and when his eyes flashed on me, he barked. So what? How does this work? You're allowed to go to lunch with your ex fiance the man you left me for. And I'm not even allowed to talk to another woman. Is that it? My heart beat so fast it felt like a hummingbird in my chest. Talk, Vic demanded. But I didn't have the words, only raw emotion. I was sick of this. I hated this. Why did it have to be like this? Heartsick, I lied. I lied so hard. You know what, Vic? I don't care, okay? I don't care anymore. You see who you want to see. Talk to whoever the hell you want to. My heart stuttered as I said the words. Fuck whoever you want to fuck. I don't care. But I did. Oh, God, I did. And it broke me on the inside. Vic's lip curled. You don't care. No, I tried to say as adamantly as I could, but my voice shook. He paused. A whole minute of silence went by, the space around us being filled with only my rough panting, until he asked coolly, Then why are you crying? What? Was I? I swiped at my cheek. Oh, shit, I was. Tears fell from my eyes. They did nothing to break through the anger we aimed at one another, a smoking gun of animosity. He stalked toward me. Is that it? I walked backward until I hit the cold wall. Still, he advanced, his face contorted with rage. We done? No, we weren't done. We were hurting. And because of that, I spoke through gritted teeth, and my voice croaked. Screw you. Screw me? When he came close enough for me to breathe in the heady scent of his cologne, I swallowed hard, and his eyes went to my throat as he pressed the length of his body into mine, 
reaching up to grip my chin. No, baby. Screw you. Lightning fast, I was spun around and pulled back into him, his growing erection pressed into my ass, and I wept quietly, needing him so badly, needing to feel connected to him. He felt what I was feeling. I knew it, because when he nudged my knees apart and reached between my legs to palm my mound, I threw my head back against his shoulder with hitching breaths, and he sighed lightly, rubbing my pussy through my lace panties. You don't get to talk to me like that. You remember the rules, Kiska. I did, and my core pulsed. If you're angry, you don't get to take it out on me, unless... I refused to give him the satisfaction, but when his hand glided up my back to my nape, and he gripped me hard, holding me in his grasp, my breathing stuttered and I found the words. My voice was little over a whisper. Unless we're both naked. His chuckle was dark, cruel. That's right. The hand at my mound pressed harder. You need this, don't you? His voice lowered. You need me. I did. I really did. When his fingers tangled in my hair, I moaned out, What are you waiting for? Fuck me already. Reaching under my teddy, he pulled, and the three small snap buttons between my legs broke apart. He hooked his thumbs into the sides of my panties and pulled. They fell to my ankles in a pool of lace, and I stepped out of them on shaking legs. Can you feel it? I could. There was a thrum in the air, a thickness, an intensity. He pawed my ass cheek, gripping it hard enough to make me wince. His breath warmed my cheek as the sound of his zipper lowering reverberated in the janitor's closet. Fuck, this is gonna be good. A knock sounded at the door. It was Sasha. Naz, get out here. You and I are going to talk. I yelled out, go away. At the same time, Vic boomed. Not a good time, Sash. But my brother knocked again, sounding pissed. I'm not asking again. At that moment, Vic's finger circled his thick cock, and he pushed me flat against the wall. The hot head of his length glanced my searing flesh, and then he pushed, entering me from behind. My moan was loud, embarrassingly so, and when I clenched around him, Vic ground out. Fuck. A pause. Maybe we should talk about this later, Sasha uttered, clearly unimpressed. But Vic gripped my hips, pushed his front into my back, and began thrusting. Fuck off, Sash. The feel of him, filling me up, stretching me, had my mouth parting as I panted out. Don't be a pussy. His growl had me grinning darkly, and when he drove into me rough and fast, the only sounds in the room were of our bodies slapping against each other, mingled with heavy breathing. He fucked me so hard I saw stars, and I chuckled coarsely. Is that all you got? Don't push me, baby. Vic snarled at my ear, and I gasped quietly. When one arm circled my waist firmly, holding me in place, he used the other to push down on my lower back, making my ass stick out. And when next he pushed into me, the change in angle hit all the right spots. Oh, God, I moaned. Vic laughed knowingly at the shell of my ear as he huffed out. Found it. He found it, all right. And as he drove into me hard enough to have my face hitting the cold brick, my pussy squeezed around him, and his voice tight, he ground out. Oh, fuck. I'm right there, baby. So was I. And when he took my hips in his hands and pulled me back into him, piercing me over and over again with his thick cock, I came closer and closer to finding rapture. Harder and harder, he thrust up into me until it was almost painful. It was funny what a little pain could do. Like a switch flicking, I went from ready to there, and throwing my head back, I cried out, Yes! Not a second later, my walls were torn down, and beneath them, heaven was revealed. My pussy tightened for the longest time before I let go, and when my core clenched spasmodically, 
My soul left my body. The moment I came, Vic's thrusts were pulled out of time, and his hips jerked fitfully as he held his breath a moment, then groaned. Fuck yes, baby. Do it. Milk me. He pushed the length of him into me, not willing to retreat, taking in my release as if it were his own. His groin pressed at my ass, and he ground against me, pulling a second wave of pleasure from me. My body shook as he drove impossibly deep, and when my core clenched, ringing out the last of my orgasm, Vic pressed his forehead to the crown of my head and spoke quietly through gritted teeth. Fuck, I'm gonna blow. Yes, there was nothing better than feeling him lose himself inside me. My stomach clenched as the arm at my waist flexed, and he stilled a moment, before I peeked over my shoulder to see he gritted his teeth and winced. He stopped breathing, and for a second so did I. And then I felt it. His cock, hard as a rock, began to jerk in me, and he panted erratically, his torso tensing then releasing as he fought the bliss my body brought him. He breathed heavily, then groaned lightly as the last of the spasms hit. And when his body went slack, we stayed as we were, connected and panting into the small, dimly lit room. It took approximately three minutes before it hit me like a brick to the face. As ecstasy left me, shame took its place. I felt the exact moment Vic noticed the change in me, and his arms loosened their hold. With a disappointed sigh, he pulled out of my body, letting our combined releases drip down between my thighs. Before I even had a chance to gather my thoughts, Vic bent down a moment, took my hand, and placed my panties into my open palm, curling my fingers around them. And when he spoke next, his tone was heavy with frustration. I don't get you. One second you're hot, and next you're cold. I didn't turn. No, like a coward I kept myself facing the wall, kept my back to him. The sound of his zipper lifting had my sad eyes shutting tightly. You need to stop and assess. He buckled his belt. Decide what you want from me. And at last he sighed wearily. Because I'm tired, Naz. So was I. It was bone-deep weariness, the kind where you can barely keep your eyes open, like living life in a vacuum. He closed the space between us and I felt him hesitate when he put a gentle hand to my hair and stroked lovingly as much as it healed, it burned. The melancholy in his words flayed me. I know I haven't been myself, and I'm sorry for that. I got regrets as much as the next person, but it doesn't alter the facts. His pause was slight. You are my girl. Always have been. Always will be. Nothing's ever going to change that. Quietly, he took the few steps away from me, opened the door, and left me to my thoughts. On shaky legs, I stepped back into my panties, pulled them up, Reeded the buttons between my legs, then promptly made my way out of the closet and down the hall. Walking into Sasha's office, he took one look at me and stood, appearing somewhat like a disappointed parent. Finally, he uttered, then asked, You want to explain to me why you almost scalped Lush? Martha, I uttered roughly, walking over to the locker and retrieving my purse. Her name? is Martha. I don't give a fuck what her name is, Naz. Sash pinched the bridge of his nose. She's already talking about her. He scoffed at the word. Injuries? Like she might consider litigation. So sit down and talk to me. No, I wouldn't be doing that. When I turned and sauntered away, my brother called out, Where are you going, Nastasia? But I was barely hanging on by a thread, and when I walked the long hall and past the bar, Annika mouthed, are you okay? Disregarding everyone and everything, 
I strode out the back to the parking lot, where I got into my car and drove home. And that was where I stayed for three whole days. On the fourth morning, I woke up and stupidly picked a battle I might not have been able to win. Chapter 20 Nastasia Maybe I should have been more guarded and vigilant, but I'd had it. It was officially enough. I used to be a different person, one who knew what she wanted, so I thought about what that girl would have done about her situation. Thought about how she would have fought, how she might have stepped on a few toes to get what she wanted, and that girl? She would have gotten what she came for. It made me sick that I'd become half the woman I used to be. I was a mob princess, for crying out loud. I knew how to use a gun. I had beaten both men and women bloody. My bedroom game was hot. I was a freaking fox. And I couldn't keep my man? Yeah, I don't think so. That was not going to fly. So I did what I had to do. And that was why I waited until he left the house before I snuck out of Annika's room and stole into the basement into his quarters, where I began to snoop. If Vic wasn't willing to tell me what was going on, I was going to have to find out myself. My gaze swept over the bookcases and shelves. I opened drawers and went through his closet, recollections assaulting me from left and right. Every item of clothing had a memory attached to it, his scent heavily embedded in each article, every movie on the shelf we'd watched together. The manga I pulled off the bookcase was creased from the number of times he had read them. I sat at his desk, on that very chair, and responded to his emails as he slept off a rough night. I lost count of the number of times I sat in that bed while he rested his head in my lap, me running my fingers through his hair as he pressed soft kisses to wherever his lips could reach. We'd spent countless days and nights in that bed, and not only for sex— but talking and laughing and touching, just being close to each other, simply being together. And as I stood in the center of his dwelling with my hands on my hips, my eyes flittered around with a frown on my face. My heart sank. I spent the better part of an hour looking for a clue and found nothing. With a light sigh, I made my way over to the desk and sat on the computer chair, using my toes to spin me around as I leaned back, and considered where I might find answers. My brow creased in thought as my eyes slid over to the laptop, the laptop I knew the password to. Without reservation, I quit spinning, moved close, and lifted the lid of the laptop. When it came to life, I typed the password and lifted my finger to hit return, but stopped just as my finger came to rest on the button. This was a huge invasion of privacy, it was psycho levels of overstepping. My mouth pulled down as I thought about that. I thought hard. A minute went by, and I pulled in a deep breath, exhaling slowly as I made my decision. After all, no one accused me of being sane. I hit the power key and watched the screen light up again. I took in a shaky breath, typed in the only password I knew of once more, and waited. I was in and as I moved the mouse hovering over the colorful icons, my first stop was the internet browser. The second I hit it, it shot up from its sleeping position, and when I took in what I was looking at, my face bunched in confusion, and I spoke quietly to myself. What? 
Once I read everything on that page, I moved to the next, and that only made my confusion grow. I went through each tab one by one, and 20 minutes later, I unexpectedly had more questions than what I arrived with. But the last tab had me pausing. It was a bank statement. Vic's bank statement. And when I looked at the balance, my brows lifted in shock. That was the moment his voice cut through the stillness. Find what you were looking for? My heart stopped beating, then started again with a bang. I jolted and put a hand to my chest in fright. Damn it. I must have been so engrossed with my task that I didn't hear him approach. When I twisted back to face him, I saw him watching me with darkness in his eyes and a rigid jaw. Oh, yeah. He was pissed. But because I was me and he was him, I responded through my confusion in a way that said I wasn't at all sorry. Well, I might have if you organized your tabs a little better. I was really pushing it when I added and annoyed. And what's with your filing system? He approached slowly, like a lion waiting to pounce on a gazelle, and my mouth went dry. I watched him close the distance between us, and when he sat himself at the edge of the desk, blocking me in, I blinked up at him and let out a hushed, Not everything needs to stay in your downloads folder. His thick brow lowered, and he moved languidly, folding his arms over his chest, his intense gaze rattled my head. Crap, I was in trouble. But curiosity had me asking a quiet, almost uncertain, You want to go to college? A slight pause, then his jaw flexed. I do. My stomach dropped. Why hadn't I known that? Why hadn't he told me? I jerked my chin toward the open bank statement. Is that what the money is for? Vic's rigid stance began to loosen some, but his brow remained as severe as his stare. It's not that much. In all the time I'd known him, Vic was not a big saver. Sure, he had money, but never the amount I'd seen on the screen just minutes before. Was he joking? My eyes widened and I fought a laugh, then scoffed. It's not nothing. Yeah, well... College is expensive, was the rough reply I got. And when he shuffled on the spot, I could see this was not something he wanted to disclose. I did not like this feeling. This cold feeling of having been a part of my not knowing? It was a noose around my neck, worn tightly enough to be uncomfortable, but not enough to suffocate, just enough to torture. With that response, I pondered what else he neglected to tell me. It broke my heart to be left out of the know. My only thought was to remedy that, to close the gap in the connection we'd almost completely lost. I fought through the overwhelming feeling of loss and asked quietly, What do you want to study? He stared straight ahead. I hadn't expected an answer. Business management. That noose tightened a notch. Business management? Yeah. He dipped his chin and did not spare me a glance. You tend to need it if you want to run your own business. Ow! My stomach twisted painfully. My brain imploded and the question was asked quietly in astonishment. You want to start your own business? He looked at me then. Glacial eyes met my own and they lingered. But no response was offered. I tried to dispel the mixture of emotions running through me, but all of them, nothing hit me harder than a sudden feeling of disconnect. You never talked about it. I thought you were happy with us, with bleeding hearts, with me. There's nothing wrong with wanting more in life. He rumbled, and it would have hurt less if he'd just taken his fist and slugged me right in the chest. He wanted more. More than me. My mind went around in circles, but one particular question had my heart aching. Do you regret declining your football scholarship? Please say no. Please say no. Say no. No. He said the word confidently, and my wild stomach settled. 
I would have had to move away, and I didn't like the thought of being away from you. He cut himself off, then added quietly, I didn't want to move. Okay. My heart pulsed heavily as he stopped himself from saying the words I desperately needed to hear. I took his cue, refused to look at him, and revealed gently, I would have followed you anywhere. A heavy silence washed over us. It locked us in place, and when I chanced a look at him, his heavy brows were marred, but his eyes had softened some. I didn't know what was going through his head, but when he spoke, his words puzzled me. I begged Sasha to let me in, on bleeding hearts. He crossed one ankle over the other and reiterated, Begged. My chest tightened. I breathed out. What? His brows rose and he attempted a smile, but it came off sad as he confessed. I got a shitty apartment, ten minutes away. Small, dingy, toilet didn't flush right. But I didn't care. I went home to eat, and some days, I didn't have enough cash for gas. Whether I was at college in another state, or working for your brother, I would have been in the same boat. I mean, none of it mattered. Because I had something good. You know? My stomach flip-flopped. I had you. His voice changed, got lower, deeper, and held a sentiment I couldn't name. I stayed. For you. The breath I'd been holding left me in a quiet whoosh. He'd never admitted it, but... I always hoped. Did he mean it? My throat tight, I fought the rush of emotions that hit me and changed the subject, clearing my throat before the warm question was asked. What business are you thinking of opening? That smile stretched, but he kept it to himself. My lips parted in disbelief. You're not going to tell me. Me? Still, he remained silent, and I found myself talking. I think I get it. His dark gaze landed on me and I peered down at my lap. If you asked me ten years ago where I thought I'd be right now, I would not have said working the bar at bleeding hearts. My brow furrowed. I just thought I'd be somewhere else by this time in my life, you know? I had a vision of being settled and making a home with somebody. With you? A bitter laugh left me. Instead, I'm Alexis Rose, the naive, lonely little heiress with too much money and not enough sense. Vic frowned mildly. He looked to be at war with himself before he uttered, Nothing wrong with taking your time, baby. I looked up to find his eyes soft, his voice tender. You'll get where you're going. You're just taking the scenic route. Just taking the scenic route? Jesus. This was it. This was the reason I loved Vic the way I did. Without rhyme or reason, with a whole heart and aching soul. He always knew what to say. It was a gift of his. He somehow provided the right words at the exact moment I needed them. I was broken out of my thoughts when he added, And you're not Alexis Rose. My lips twitched. No? Nah. You're Moira. His smile widened as he peeked back at me. Stylish, confident, and a little nutty. A chuckle left me. I shook my head at his corniness. I love that show. Immediately, he returned a smiling. Me too. And quite suddenly, I was morose. After the feeling of wholesome happiness fled, I let out a low, I wish you'd talk to me. Vic's expression turned hollow. When he peered at the wall, into nothingness, he asked, You sticking around? I knew he meant right then, for dinner, but the question felt so much deeper than that. Was I? Yes, I nodded, and when I stood, my hand stretched out, and I cupped his bristled cheek. I'm sticking around. His eyes closed slowly, and he ran the coarse stubble over my palm. 
and holy shit, I enjoyed that immensely. I couldn't resist and lightly scraped his cheek with my nails a moment before letting my hand fall. I turned to walk away when his arm shot out and he grasped my wrist, holding me in place. About the other night. Oh, good God, let's not. I twisted to look at him and blinked innocently. Was there a problem? And when his gaze trailed the length of my body, all the way down to my toes, his full lips seemed to pout a little as he shook his head sluggishly and uttered, No problem. He kept his heavy gaze on me as though he couldn't figure me out, and I offered him a single nod. Good. Later on, as we were seated around the dining table, I lifted my plate as Dorotea piled on cotletti patties made up of ground meat with minced onion, then coated in breadcrumbs and shallow fried. Annika added some mashed potatoes and salad, and I grinned happily. It had been so long since I'd eaten like this. It reminded me of home before our household faced the devastation my mother wrought. It was funny that I still had good memories of my mother when I'd seen the absolute worst of her. But I suppose that was how a child's mind coped with some really heavy shit. The idea that she still managed to get inside my head made me feel at my weakest. But there she was, mostly when I least expected her to penetrate my mind, like the sword of Damocles dangling over my head. My family had never truly recovered. We never even spoke her name. So when I peered over at Dorotea and watched her go about her motherly ministrations, clucking about, feeding her family as though it was the most important job there was, it simultaneously made my heart swell and tighten. This family was more than just convenient friends. They were a beacon of hope when I had none. I was treated like an equal member, which was probably why they had no issues speaking freely in front of me. Yuri glanced across the table at Annika and asked, No clothes. Annika peered down at herself a moment before shaking her head. Old ones I haven't worn in a while? She picked at her food. The others are too big at the moment. That wasn't surprising. The amount of weight she'd lost was damn near alarming. Annika's aunt, Ksenia, looked at her with a measuring eye. Eat my flower. When Annika stiffened, Ksenia went on, and what she said sounded oddly specific. No man will want you looking like a wilted rose, and we wouldn't want that, would we? Vic glared at his aunt. She doesn't need a man. She needs to focus on herself. Annika smiled in gratitude, and Vic winked at her. Ksenia peered at him then. Perhaps you should focus on yourself as well, Victor. Her mouth tightened into a thin line. After all, with all the time you spent out of this house, you'd think you'd have more to show for it. Whoa. The easy ambiance at the table changed instantly. Uh, rude. When I chanced a glance, I found Yuri and Dorotea looking at each other, but neither said a word. Did any of these people know how hard Vic worked? Did they have any idea how much time he sacrificed to earn some cash and look after himself? He was out there getting beaten bloody, and she had the nerve to criticize. No, ma'am. Not on my watch. I think Vic's doing just fine, I muttered, sitting tall, staring unblinking at Ksenia. Nurse. Vic uttered in caution, but his aunt's brow rose. She seemed amused at my comment. Really, Nastasia? Did I stutter? My eyes narrowed on her. Yes. I do. So you believe a man at his age, living at home, with no prospects or savings, is doing just fine, yes? She queried curiously. The hairs on my neck stood. She sounded just like my mother. Ness, stop. Vic uttered sharply. But I barely heard him at all. You know what? No. What kind of person would I be if I sat there and said nothing? Not one worthy of him. I thought to stick up for him. I had no idea what chaos I was about to unravel when I scoffed. I'd hardly call 70 grand no savings. The entire table went silent. And when Yuri placed his fork down, the soft clink sounded awfully loud as he twisted to face his son. 
The hush seemed to thicken by the second, and when Vic lifted his head heavenward, I didn't know what I'd done. But I felt it wasn't good. It was one of those moments where you knew something was said, possibly too much, but you couldn't figure out what. Another pass of the table. They were staring, all of them, but not a single gaze rested on me. All eyes were on Vic, and they were not happy. There was a mixture of emotions. His mother was clearly confused. Annika appeared stunned. Ksenia looked pissed. But it was his father's expression that made my heart skip a beat. He looked betrayed. Oh, no. My heart beat out of time, and as the arguing began, I sank deeper into my chair, knowing that whatever pandemonium was about to unleash was my fault. Yeah, I really screwed up.